Hello. Hi. Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi. How are things? Oh, we are all, all here, huh? Okay. <laughs> so it's always a good feeling when this when the login process works. <laughs> you never know. Okay, great. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Hi. Hi, Mark. As you can see, Eric, my pandemic haircut continues. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Let me uh, look at that. Exactly. The mad professor look. I'm actually on holidays at the moment. Actually, I should show you what my window looks like. It's pretty spectacular. I'm in Cornwall. It's, I'm it's a rather, in a rather plain looking room, but I have this view out my window. Oh, that's pretty spectacular. Nice. <laughs> the only thing is it's freezing cold it is britain <laughs> you, can't solve, you can't solve that one with brexit that's my I, know, I, I, I tried i went body surfing with a wetsuit and managed literally to freeze myself to the to the close to the brink oh wow so, i'm surprised but, i managed to get anything in cornwall i thought it was booked up from the beginning of the pandemic well, this the the family have been on this for a while, so. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. But uh, oh, well, we will be. I look forward to exploiting that in future. Definitely, I've got to say, as somebody, I'm not. I'm I'm appallingly ignorant of of the British seaside, having assumed that you'd only ever go there if you couldn't afford to go to the continent. <laughs> and uh, it's actually very spectacular, I gotta say, down here. So Yeah, it is, it is lovely uh, down there. Devon as well, even parts of Dorset. Yeah. Uh, so my view is also on the Atlantic Ocean. From oh yeah? The, from the Canary Islands in Spain. Ah! <laughs> so, um, also quite nice view here, so. <laughs> There's Christian on his iPhone. Hey, Christian. Looking dashing as always. Oh. Right. There's, not, there's nothing like a discussion on fiscal rules to get you going first thing in the morning, though, is there? <laughs> you, you don't really need coffee, do you? No, well, I wouldn't go quite well. that far. <laughs> it is actually morning for me. So, how are things? Good. Good. Yeah, yeah can't complain. Well, good. Where are you at the moment, Christian? You. I'm in Berlin, actually, but um, in Berlin. Ah. Ch childcare didn't allow me to uh, to go to the actual venue, which is also in Berlin, which is a bit pathetic, but, um, you know, you know how it is. So um, so I just have this very narrow hour now. But yeah, it's all good. I mean, it's, uh, the summer is finally coming to the city as well. So Excellent. So how, how, how is the Berlin vaccination and COVID situation trending? Uh, it's it's developing quite positively. So incidence rates are, are, are going down while vaccination rates are ticking, picking up. So if we can keep this pace until the summer, then I think we'll be fine. Good, because my wife and daughter are planning to spend all of July in Berlin with the folks. So you need to keep with, it going. With the folks means you are not coming or? No, I'm staying here to do a book. With I yes. also Someone has to look after the dog. <laughs> but, um, of course, we know. Oh, I'm sure the dog will make an appearance at some point. You'll see it running. <laughs> yeah, of course. Oh, it looks like Thomas.
Hello, good afternoon, good morning, Mark, um, to everyone in the room and online uh, in the virtual discussion room. Um, very happy to have you all here and um, for an exciting discussion, uh, I'm, I have no doubt on one of the major topics that we will have to discuss in Germany in the next couple of weeks. Um, fronting the uh, the election in in September, and in Europe in a more general way, and the question is universal, and we want we will see that uh, this is a discussion which is uh, driven by people in the U.S., in in Paris, in Berlin, and anywhere, uh, actually about the fiscal rules, about the fiscal policy framework, uh, on how to to do a better fiscal policy, maybe uh, different from what has been a dominant uh, kind of policy making in the last decades, especially in Europe and in Germany, driven by uh, fiscal rules, which have proven to be uh, not optimal. And in the context of low interest rates, there's much space to rethink fiscal policy and rules and standards, and we will talk about all this. So very happy to have uh, some of the leading thinkers on, on all this uh, with us. Um, and we will start a first session um, and we have a sort of a geographic uh, logic in this afternoon. We will have a first session on the universal question, say, uh, of how to redefine fiscal frameworks and fiscal rules. Uh, then we will have a second session on Germany and the Schuldenbremse. And the third session in the afternoon will turn around the EU, European fiscal rules. And it will turn, and I think it's a good thing to have uh, the same setting or a similar discussion with all of this, with different applications for different uh, geographies. So uh, we want to start the first session and I will hand over to uh, Christian Odendahl from the Center for European Reform um, and uh, who has uh, uh, accepted to do this uh, chair to chair the session uh, he himself has just recently published a paper with Adam Tooze on uh, fiscal rules and uh, fiscal policy um, and uh, you will introduce the other uh, panelists thank you Christian and um, I will enjoy the debate well so will I um, thank you very much uh, Thomas for the introduction and, and a very warm welcome to everyone to this session um, as Thomas said this is really a three-part um, uh, program now on on public debt and fiscal spending this first one uh, being sort of the scene setting and the and, and the and the and the general panel so one of my job as chairs to remind everyone not to cannibalize the later sessions too much which talk about fiscal rules in Germany in specific detail and um, uh, on, on Europe's fiscal I know it's a lot of fun to talk about these rules but for this one for this session we want to take a, a broader view um, and we have two fantastic speakers to introduce our session for uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Two of my favorites, really, um, as they always manage to make you think in, uh, and to take a fresh look at what you thought you understood well. So um, I, I'm really glad that, that both could join us. Um, Mark Blythe, um, he's a professor of international economics at uh, Brown University in the US, though his accent will immediately give away where he's originally from. Um, and we should consider ourselves lucky, I've read, uh, that the world has, was not quite ready for his kind of music when he was a young man, uh, because until the age of 28, he happened to be a musician before he became a professional academic. Um, and now he writes books uh, with such charming titles as Austerity, the History of a Dangerous Idea, and Angrynomics, Analyzing the Cause of, um, of the West, West Current Mood. And this second book, he did not write alone, but with uh, our second speaker, Eric Lonegren, who is a macro fund manager, economist, and author, for example, of the book uh, Money and Why Central Banks Should uh, Have a Helicopter. Um, I'm not quite sure about your uh, musical talents there, Eric, uh, but his speaking talents are, are undisputed, I think. And so after this introduction of, of 10 to 15 minutes uh, by those two, uh, we have discussions with us to, to, um, to, to discuss the findings that, or the proposals that, that they suggest. One is uh, Peter Bofinger, well known in Germany as the former member of the German Council of Economic Experts and a professor at Würzburg University. Uh, then we have Maria de Merzis. Uh, she is the deputy director of Bruegel in Brussels, the economic think tank. Then we have Jakob von Weizsäcker, the chief economist of the German uh, finance ministry. 
uh, and formerly also with the Bruegel affiliation and uh, former member of the European Parliament. Then, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, Veronique is here. Fantastic. Uh, Veronique Riches Flores, an independent economist and former uh, chief economist of Societa Generale. Um, and um, with that, I think, I'm not. Uh, Christian, just uh, just to to uh, to a little correction, uh, Marie, uh, Veronique is there for my, uh, Maria, so it's uh, Maria de, Ma de Maez is, uh, couldn't join. So, um, oh, apologies. Just in order not to miss her later in the discussion. Oh yeah, that would be awkward if I if I call her up to discuss this. Um, well, then Maria will be with us next time. Um, so this is going to be a fun hour. Um, Eric and Mark, very excited to hear your input. The floor is yours for 10, 50 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. And, and, and I'm sure I can speak on Mark's behalf in this regard, which I will do very rarely. But just to say thank you for the organizers, we really, really appreciate it. And to, to Thomas in particular, and to all of you for taking the time to, to consider our thoughts. Um, and I should preface what we are saying here is, is as much about, uh, you know, being participants on a journey rather than claiming to have the answers. Uh, and the idea here is really to, to, to engage in our collective thinking and wisdom to try and, and try and work out uh, what we are doing and what we should be doing. If it's okay, I'm going to share my screen and just go through four or five slides. They're hopefully just a, a clear exposition of what we've been thinking about. And then I'll hand over to Mark um, to give, to give uh, some sort of political economy context uh, on these arguments that we're making. So. Okay. Great, so can I just confirm you you can see that okay, Christian? The prudence principle. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so one of the things I think is very important um, when considering fiscal rules or a fiscal framework is actually, first of all, to be honest about uh, the fact that our beliefs appear to have changed rather dramatically um, and to be clear about precisely why those beliefs have changed. Um, so if, if I take uh, Olivier Blanchard as, as, and I'm going to sort of unfairly use him as an example throughout this, this presentation, to me, he sort of typifies the collective journey, which was having been a, a proponent and indeed a designer in many senses of, of fiscal rules, has gone from one extreme of saying we should have fiscal rules, which are all predominantly based around sustainability equations, where sustainability equations are largely about saying, based on certain sets of assumptions, it makes sense to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio. That's the kind of core of all fiscal rules to date. Um, has now gone to the other extreme, which is really saying, I, 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 I'm now fully in the camp of discretion and th the world is too complex to have a fiscal rule. And so we, we need bodies of, of wise people uh, men and women in order to work out what the way forward is. Now that feels to me, first, first of all, I think we need to be really clear about why have people gone on that journey? So what has actually precipitated that shift? Um, because I think by analyzing that question uh, in of itself is actually very, very revealing. Um, I, I should also express it up front. I am uh, very, very unhappy about that dynamic in a way. Um, or, or I certainly think it's also very, very difficult uh, when we are trying to establish credibility with policymakers and the general public more broadly to make shifts of that nature, because you then face the obvious question, which is, um, why should I trust your current wisdom in the context of the fact that your prior wisdom seems to have shifted um, so substantially? Okay, so why has everybody changed their mind? Um, it's actually really clear. Um, and this, in a sense, Mark and I are really saying is the kind of conscious, unconscious rule that we are, in fact, all operating on. So in a sense, all that we're saying is, is let's be explicit about the principle that we're actually adopting. Um, and if we're explicit about it, that then already gives us a framework. 
And effectively what's happened is there's been a, a shift in the relationship of the, the real cost of debt um, to the government R relative to real rates of GDP growth. And in fact, this is most striking if you look at it globally. And again, it's worth just briefly rehearsing some of the history here, initially post the financial crisis. You know, many of us had been aware of the likes of Japan, of course, um, and other jurisdictions where interest rates were already extremely low. But there was a sense in which this collapse in real interest rate structures was, was becoming a global and more permanent force post the financial crisis. It's worth, though, as economists being honest about it. At the time, we thought that the decline in real interest rates was really telling us about prospective real rates of GDP growth. But it only started to slowly be understood that actually, no, there was something more profound happening, which was R was falling relative to the rate of real GDP growth. And in fact, if you look at global real GDP growth, including China, and you look at a global real interest rate, it's an even more striking picture. So actually, global real GDP is relatively stable on a 30-year view, largely because, of course, places like China's share of global GDP has been rising and offsetting the decline in rates of growth elsewhere. But R has just been kind of declining on a, on a global unrelenting basis. So why have we changed our minds uh, about fiscal rules is largely because that relationship has changed. Now, if we very briefly look at how that occurs, and actually, to his credit, uh, in, his, in, in, in one of his most recent papers, uh, Blanchard is extremely explicit about this, and of course it follows from uh, the logic of a standard uh, fiscal rule, and I, I, I won't spend too much time going through this because most of you will be very familiar, but all, all of this is showing here is how effectively the change in the debt GDP ratio um, is, which is B being the ratio of, of debt to GDP, um, the change in the, in the rate of debt to GDP is a function of your starting point level of debt to GDP, so debt at T minus one. Um, that then is, is going to be influenced by the relationship. The, the, the primary um, factors that are determining that are effectively the sign of R minus G. Um, and you realize that if uh, R is lower than G, one can effectively run persistent primary deficits um, in, in a manner which um, debt is still sustainable the way we think about it. So it just f falls out as a matter of um, the mathematics. Now, the interesting point, and I've taken a quote here from Blanchard, um, he is effectively saying our assumption was that it was positive. Um, and as a result, we designed fiscal rules that one of the consequences of which was that we needed to have primary surpluses. And he's very explicit that this very much underlay the construction of the EU rules. And it's still the way many observers and policymakers think about debt sustainability, but the environment has steadily changed. So, um, and, and in fact, in his paper, he goes on to, to, to just illustrate these two regimes. So in, in a sense, you have one set of fiscal consequences if, if R is greater than G and another set of consequences if it's uh, below G. Um, now, I'll just very briefly in terms of why real interest rates have collapsed, um, Thomas wanted me to include in this, you know, the, a huge amount of research has been done on this, and we're not going to add a huge amount to that. There are a couple of points I think that are left out of the research. Um, and I've given these very odd numbers, apologies for that. I've only just realized that. Um, the, 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 the third one here, I think, uh, is, is a critical one, um, which is I do think part of the reason real interest rate structures have declined has been monetary dominance itself. So if every time you have a recession, you cut interest rates, and in a sense, the way the system recovers is through higher levels of leverage, um, that itself, that process may cause your equilibrium interest rate, for want of a better term, to decline. Um, I, I, and another point I think that, that is worth being aware of is the risk properties of bonds. And again, I think this is something that isn't entirely understood and, and examined in the literature. But, the, but as a market participant, this is something I'm very aware of. If you think of a government bond in the 1970s was in fact a different asset to a government bond today, i.e. the risk properties and correlation properties were completely different. In the same way that a Brazilian or a Turkish bond is still effectively behaves like a risk asset and, and adds to the risk of a portfolio, 
in the developed world, adding bonds to portfolios actually provides you with diversification and that affects inflation risk premium, but also importantly term premium. Um, now, the exception, of course, to this trend is this trend hasn't been universal. And I think it's again, it's important to be clear as to why we haven't seen uniform decline in real interest rate structures or indeed public sector debt behaving as safety assets uniformly. Because, of course, during the euro crisis, something happened that made them behave like risk assets. And that is still the case if I look at, for example, Italian government bonds and I look at their correlation properties. And this is something that we need to be aware of. And I think paying attention to correlation here is as important as level. OK, so what is the prudence principle? Well, what we're really saying is, is that um, you know, we, we are sympathetic to adopting kind of what I would say as a mainstream fiscal rule, which is which is largely about, and, and I think the, the Ren Lewis Porter's rule, which is referenced in our paper, is a very uh, good starting point, where they're effectively saying you should you should deficit target and not debt target, you should look at rolling five year periods. Um, but they are and you should treat capex differently to borrowing for current uh, expenditure those are all very sensible principles that should be embedded in any fiscal framework um what what they have that i think is very interesting is they have they introduced the idea of a knockout and really what we're doing is is adapting that and going a little bit further now effectively their knockout says when you get to the zero lower bound it was done for initially but if you just think of it as the effective lower bound you should have a knockout. So really what they're saying is use a conventional debt sustainability rule, um, which is premised around ultimately stabilizing their GDP ratios, but one can design it intelligently, which is you know taking uh, rolling five-year averages and, and with those caveats that I've noted, um, but that you suspend effectively your rule when you're requested to do so by the monetary authority. That was what uh, Ren Lewis and Portis have advised. And you can absolutely see the logic, and this is kind of saying, well, monetary policy runs out of power. We need, now need fiscal policy. We can't constrain fiscal policy. What Mark and I have proposed is, uh, I, for a host of reasons, that's not entirely satisfactory, both from a democratic legitimacy standpoint, but also in a sense, you can debate the efficacy of monetary policy. It feels to us that that's a kind of two, two uh, has a whole host of problems associated with it. But why don't we just why don't we just make the rule that we are effectively all using an explicit rule? So in other words, we say we, we, we want to have a rule based system because we don't want to abandon that. But the nature of the rule is completely different when R is greater than G than when R is lower than G. And essentially what I'm saying is you would have a conventional rule when R is greater than G, you'd have some variant of the Ren Lewis Porter's rule. But when R is lower than G, you have substantial fiscal space. In other words, you actually permit um, B to rise substantially. Um, so that is, in essence, the, the, the nature of the rule that we are proposing. And now, it obviously is, is calling it a rule is probably generous. It's really a, a framework for thinking about a rule. Um, but I'm happy with that because I, I do think um, we, we, we still need to be in the game. And Mark will come on to this of, of, of rule designation, but we do need to have clear frameworks. I'm just I'm, I'm not going to take much longer because I realize I'm, I'm already going over time here and I apologize. There are obvious challenges. How do you measure R? We've suggested move, using a moving average of a 10 year yield. What do you do if market interest rates abruptly change? Um, and, and also, what is your rule in the R less than G? So it's all very well to say, well, there's fiscal space when R is less than G, and we're going to permit increases in the in the debt GDP ratio. But should we put some constraints, some intelligent constraints around this? For example, that the structural increases in debt should be to fund capex. I'm just going to conclude very quickly with some points that I think I, I'm very keen to get thoughts on from the, the discussants. Um, there's a, a critical issue in Europe is the one of enforcement. And I must say, I think that's one of the attractions of what Mark and I are imposing, because it is actually the real constraint. I mean, the real constraint on Italy is not the European Commission. It is the bond market and it is ultimately the spreads on BTPs. So um, in a way, I, our rule is quite attractive because you're just actually formalizing what is a constraint. And then you're in a sense freed of whether you have political capital or not, because it is the constraint. 
I've mentioned Mario Draghi's law of conditional safety. This is something I've written about in the past. It's, it's a contradiction in terms. How can your bond be risk free, but be conditionally risk free? Well, it is in Europe because it goes to, to QE eligibility. And I think this is something that's a very interesting point as to whether that should be made explicit. Two final points. One is there, there's a live issue, in my view, about whether governments should be hedging interest rate risk. So R is, of course, the average interest rate on your stock of debt. And people keep on talking about, well, what if interest rates rise? Well, if I fully termed out my debt, I don't really care if interest rates have rised. Uh, rise rather. And the final one is I think we actually do need to address preemptively rather than have to come back and try and uh, work this out retrospectively, is there's a fundamental error in global central bank design, which has only come about, of course, by accident that we'd never really thought about, which is now uh, they are going to have huge fiscal effects if they raise interest rates because of their balance sheets. And so I think there are ways to solve this. And the first one is we need to cut the, we should never have designed them like that. There should not be transfers from central banks to the fiscal authorities, certainly within the Eurozone, that makes no sense. These are just accounting challenges in my view. And I think another way to deal with this problem would actually be to have, have an, av an average interest rate using tiered reserves of zero. So the question just doesn't exist. But I think we actually need to break this whole point of the link between central bank equity and the sovereign, because otherwise we could, I can foresee a situation where we get ourselves into all sorts of problems where central banks are trying to raise interest rates and that then has consequences for fiscal policy, which is going to really, really raise the question of the democratic legitimacy of the central bank. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, Mark, now Eric has taken uh, 10 the of the 12, 10, 10 of the 12 the minutes already. So what can you say to it? No, just kidding. But, uh, you know, just, <laughs> no, just I'm, no, so I'm, I'm like. just a bit conscious. No, it's fine, Eric. I think, I, it's conscious of time. I think it's important that we hear from the discussant, so I'm going to take very little time. I just want to make two points. The first one is how our thinking on this came about, which was by accident. And I think that's often a good sign. Essentially, what happened was if when we were doing the, the, the work for our book, Angrynomics, we recorded it as a series of conversations. And that was the original ur text for the book. And during that conversation, Eric thought up this rule. This actually happened in conversation. And we put it in the book and forgot all about it. And then people started to read the book and people started to talk about the one organ Blythe rule. And at one point I went to Eric and said, do we have a rule? And then Thomas came to us and said, you have a rule, you should write it up. So that's why we're here, because things happen by accident. But more than accident, what's been driving this for a long time, and let me put just a tiny bit of sort of political economy context in this, is Eric talks about a regime shift between R and G and being in two different worlds. Uh, what I did on the front end of the paper was to try and put that in context and suggest that that regime shift may be even bigger than we think. If you'll allow me for a moment, if I have screen share access, I want to show you just a couple of slides because that will save time. So here's the first one. And this was given to me in 2012. Can you guys see this? Could you go to full screen? Full screen. Just... Okay, yeah. Okay, got it. Boom. You got that? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, right. So I got this in 2012 from a Japanese economic researcher that used to work in the cabinet office. And this was their attempt to gauge real interest rates over the long run. And uh, as you can see, uh, it tells quite a story that essentially the 1970s is a bit of an aberration that long run real rates had been falling for a very, very long time prior to this. And as someone who was raised in the intellectual period of the sort of the late 70s and 1980s, and that the focus on inflation is an ever present danger, this really hit home with me. Then I always wondered if we were sampling one part of the distribution and generalizing from that in an unwarranted manner. That is to say, what if the regime that we take as normal is actually the exception and our rules are based upon exceptions? In which case, then, if there's mean reversion in the system, then you're going to have a problem because your rules are going to be out of whack. And I think that's increasingly what we see. This was cleaned up, of course, in the famous schmelzing paper from the Bank of England a couple of years ago, where if you basically take the noise out of this, if you see where my uh, cursor is now, that you can see from 64 to, 2000, to around 2000, that's the spike of the 70s. But that's largely noise on the long run real trends. And if you look at real rates decomposed by centuries, you see that steady downward trend. Now, what does all this suggest? It strongly suggests to me, if I can go back to here, it strongly suggests to me that there's a real possibility that we took that moment of the 70s, which was based upon, if you will, the 
unintegrated, non-financialized hothouse economies of the kind of Fordist period from the 40s to the 70s and generalize that as kind of the standard model, when in fact they were real exceptions coming out of the post-war settlement that blew up for their own internal contradictions. And what we see now is a kind of a mean reversion in, in, in all of these things, long run real rates, inflation rates, et cetera. And we keep looking for that inflation. We keep looking for an inflation which effectively died in Europe sometime around 1987. And we don't want to get into the position that we did with Draghi in 2011, where we were raising interest rates twice in the middle of a crisis, because you can see an inflation which clearly isn't there. So if these rules have a purpose, at base, what I think it is, is this fear of the 1970s returning, the danger of inflation. But what if we are overestimating that? What if that is really not our problem? What if our problem is um, stagnant wages? What if our problem is the rise of populism? What if our problem is the, the fragility of democracy and the lack of faith that people have in the expert knowledge which we put out there into the world? And if we get it wrong again, if we have a chance to redesign these rules and we get it wrong again, then that could be very, very dangerous for the European project as a whole. So I think this is a very serious moment that encourages us to look out the window a little bit more and try and place what we're doing in a broader historical context. And that may lead us in a slightly different direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Eric and Mark, for this, for this presentation. Um, so I, I would like to go in the order of, of first Peter, then, then Veronique, and, and last but certainly not least, uh, Jakob. Um, to give us their, their view on sort of the, the, um, the new uh, consensus, as it were, on, on, on public debt and what that means for practical fiscal policy making. Um, Peter, why, why don't you start? Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to discuss this paper because it's innovative and uh, at the same time, it has a very fascinating idea. And so let me share the screen. Where is it here? So, so, oh, what's happened? So, can oops, one moment? So, one second. So, can you see the screen now? Can Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Fantastic. Okay. Right. So, let's start. Yes. So, um, what is what is the rule? Uh, that uh, Eric and Mike are uh, propagating. So I think it's very simple. I think that makes it fascinating. So it has two elements. If R exceeds G, target a stable debt to GDP role. If G exceeds R, uh, there is flexibility to pursue policies that uh, would require, sorry, to, that would require increased borrowing. But the question is, First, what is the policy rule if G uh, is, exceeds R? So I think that's not very explicit in, in the paper. And a problem that I see, there is no mechanism that provides a stabilization of the debt to GDP ratio. Because if in situations uh, where R exceeds G, you have a stable rule. And when G exceeds R, you have the flexibility to increase the debt to GDP role. Uh, that would imply that uh, in the medium term, longer term, uh, that, uh, that the debt to GDP level is more or less without control. So I think that's something I have no found no answer in the paper. Um, and of course, uh, if you allow an increase of the debt to GDP uh, ratio without any uh, speed limit or without any limitation, there is a risk that once you come into a situation when R uh, exceeds G for a longer period of time, you get serious problems of, of uh, fiscal sustainability. So this is something maybe I've, I did not find in the paper, but what, what provides the stabilization of debt to GDP uh, over, over time? Um, and then the paper says, yes, um, the level of R is market determined, but of course it's also strongly influenced by the level of the central bank policy rates. You can see this here. For the United States. Um, and this raises a problem uh, for the rule if central banks increase the short-term interest rate, which, which then also has a strong impact on the, on the longer-term interest rate. And I will show you this in this chart. So this chart shows longer-term development of the 10-year treasury constant maturity rate and cross domestic product. So they are both in nominal terms, so we would see the same picture in, in real terms. 
what you can see is whenever you have a recession, which are the shaded areas, um, the uh, interest rate exceeds the nominal growth rate. And this implies, if you apply the lonergan blyth rule, um, whenever you are in a recession, then fiscal policy is constrained because then it's not a, it has to stabilize uh, the debt to GDP ratio and is not allowed to do any substantial stabilization. So I think that's something uh, you have to have in mind. Of course, the paper says there must be some kind of, of longer uh, average, but overall, I think there's a, the risk of uh, pro-cyclical fiscal policies. So in my view, um, I'm not so very much con convinced of, 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 this, of this rule, uh, but what I liked in the paper was uh, mentioning of functional finance um, as a basis for a fiscal policy rule. And um, the main idea of functional finance or monet modern monetary theory, as I understand it, is there is no financial constraint for fiscal policy, but given that there is no financial constraint, there's always a real constraint for fiscal policy. And Abba Lerner makes it very explicit that the responsibility of the government is to, to, to maintain an equilibrium of aggregate demand and aggregate uh, supply in order to prevent inflation or unemployment. It's very interesting that the sentence that you have here is more or less identical with what you can read in section one of the German uh, act on stability and growth. It's quite interesting. It's almost the same idea. So, so if you have this idea of functional finance and you ask, could this be the basis for a fiscal rule? Um, uh, the, um, the main idea is that whatever you do with fiscal, with fiscal policy is relevant for price stability and you get then an assignment for fiscal policy for price stability, which is I would say more or less absent in the standard discussions uh, on, on market policy. So once you have this uh, responsibility of fiscal policy for price stability, it's then quite interesting to ask what could be kind of a framework for a fiscal policy that has a responsibility for price stability. And here, the idea is why not use inflation targeting which we all know as a strategy for fiscal for monetary policy as a joint framework for fiscal policy and monetary policy. And if you apply this to the Euro area, um, I, this chart, as I see it, gives you some very nice insights because the chart shows you that in 2013, 2014, inflation forecasts started to decline. They deviated downwards from the inflation target. So the, the framework shows here is the space for fiscal policy because we have trends in inflation to move downwards. At the same time, you could see here that monetary policy had reached this zero low bound. And now applying this kind of uh, functional finance idea uh, to uh, fiscal policy would have made a very strong case for a strong fiscal uh, stimulus or for a strong fiscal space in order to do something against uh, the decline in, in the inflation rate. I think that would have been very helpful in the, in the euro area because it would have also avoided that the ECB uh, should, that the ECB goes, goes into the negative terrain of interest rates. So I think applying this functional finance as a framework uh, for, for fiscal policy and, and uh, identifying a responsibility of fiscal policy for, for inflation uh, opens very new ideas on, on fiscal rules. So I don't have a fiscal rule available, but I think that's really helpful. And that leads to a final chart that I want to show you. Uh, you just discussed uh, reasons why um, real interest rates were so low uh, in, in, the, in the last decade. And I think one of the main reasons, which is normally not discussed, is that in, the, in this decade, uh, government uh, revenue, government spending was extremely low. So if you compare the blue bars with the orange bars, uh, the blue bars are 2001 to 2008, the orange ones 2011, 2018. And you can see the huge deceleration of, of fiscal policy in this period. And, in, and if, you, if you know, that government spending is about 30% to 50% of GDP, 
This deceleration, in my view, must have had a strong impact on macroeconomic developments. In my view, a cause for secular stagnation, also for low interest rates. And I think the role of government spending for inflation must deserves a much greater role um, than uh, so far it, it has deserved. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Fascinating final chart as well. If you see the outlier in this chart, uh, notice Germany, where it has completely switched around from no growth to at least a little bit of growth. Um, but one, one word. The interesting thing is that all countries have now approached the German very low uh, increase in real revenue. That's quite interesting. So Germany yeah, has exactly. become the standard set up for the rest of the world, which was probably not a good idea for the world. Thank you. Excellent. Well, that fits perfectly to the theme of this conference. Um, Veronique, um, what, what is your take on, on, on what you've just heard and, 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 and Mark's and Eric's paper? <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And, um, and thank you for the offer of, um, uh, of this paper, which met with a proposal which makes obviously sense for economists. Now, as I have only a few minutes to deal with this big issue of the fiscal framework, and have chosen um, a specific angle to address it. Uh, I have uh, looked at what is the situation today and what uh, um, the use of this rule would mean for fiscal policies in Europe and in European countries today, um, which, uh, as you all know, uh, when you speak about uh, complex uh, topics, uh, it becomes uh, a mess when you deal with Europe uh, for the same kind of question or same topic. So uh, looking at uh, nominal GDP for Italy over the last 10 years, we are uh, around 0.3% of nominal growth. Uh, against 1% um, government uh, interest rates. Today, on average, over the last three years, it was 1.7%. The difference between nominal uh, growth or oh, interest rates and nominal growth is huge, which will mean Italy has to apply a very strict fiscal policy stance, a restrictive policy uh, to deal with such a situation. Um, looking to Germany now, the same uh, numbers, nominal GDP growth has been roughly 2.6% over ten, the last 10 years. Uh, interest rates are more or less at zero, slightly above 0% uh, uh, on average over the last three years, which would uh, suggest um, uh, with this rule that Germany has to uh, support a very loose uh, fiscal policy. Um, the France is between the two, as very often it is the case uh, with the French economy. What I, um, I think that uh, applying to Europe such a rule would be uh, raise a number of questions. Some of them have been already uh, um, suggested by Peter. Um, in the case of Europe, using such a rule will probably exacerbate the difference in the fiscal policy stance between within European countries, which I think is really uh, a key point uh, why uh, when looking to structural trends and divergences between European countries. Um, so we risk to exacerbate the structural uh, gaps um, between European countries instead of reducing them. Uh, risk to, of course, uh, exacerbate the negative sentiment on Europe and what is doing Europe or the constraint of uh, you coming from Europe and the different countries, uh, and especially amongst the weakest countries of the region. Uh, I think there's uh, a risk, as underlined by uh, Peter, a key risk of pro-cyclical policies uh, and a, a key risk to reduce the ability of government to deal with asymmetric shocks. How to use this rule if you are facing an asymmetric shock? I, I'm always in the European uh, area, so uh, looking differently to this uh, topic maybe, um, but it raises a key question. Are we, would it be, um, um, 
useful to use this tool. I think it, it will be uh, quite dangerous indeed uh, by uh, really reducing the, uh, the ability to smooth the economic trend and to, to, uh, to deal with the, uh, the crisis. So I, I'm quite um, skeptical about the proposal, although, uh, as I said at the beginning, I welcome the proposal. It, it is such uh, evident um, that um, every economist is will be tempted to do, to say, well, why not this uh, so simple solution? But I think uh, there are several risks. And finally, when I, I think about uh, economic policy, whether fiscal policy or monetary policy, I usually think about both together. So the policy mix. And I think uh, with your proposal, we are missing something on that way. If, we, if you are weak or low interest rates, it's usually because, especially in the current environment where central bankers are um, very uh, invasive, if I could say, uh, it's uh, usually because central banks are doing what we need to help the economy. If you take this uh, context of interest rates, uh, which is not specific, uh, automatically a natural one, by using it for, uh, to de de define your fiscal stance, the risk is adding and to create some multiplier of a fiscal policy, which could be rather pro-cyclical or at the opposite, um, uh, very damaging for the economic situation. So I, I don't see how to use your proposal with no uh, major risk of reducing the efficiency of the, uh, the policy mix and uh, reducing the discrepancies uh, between European countries. That's my point. Thank you very much, uh, Veronique. And finally, Jakob, um, the uh, chief economist of the German finance ministry comes, you know, with that comes a bit of an affinity to fiscal rules at least. Um, but how about Martin and, and Eric's? Is there any chance? Uh, yeah, um, uh, many thanks. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to listen to, 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 to Eric and Mark and, and, and of course, uh, Peter and, uh, and uh, Veronique. And I think it's fitting that uh, we start uh, um, a series of sessions on, on fiscal rules uh, um, with, uh, with a Mark, uh, Eric's and Mark presentation. And, and, and the reason is not because I think their fiscal rules is what we're going to end up with. But um, uh, what I think is the real strength of, of your presentation, Eric and Mark, is, is the diagnostic end of things. And I think you're absolutely right that um, uh, changes in R minus G because of uh, very low interest rates, not because of very high growth rates, but of very low interest rates, that's a, a, an important change. And um, as Peter has elaborated a little bit, and, uh, and of course, Veronique as well, and the second aspect of these low interest rates, and they're in your title, of course, as we can all see, in times of low interest rates, is the zero lower bound and the problem for monetary policy at the zero lower bound. So, so um, if R minus G um, uh, uh, were uh, 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 um, uh, uh, positive, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, if, if R minus G were negative uh, for, um, uh, for, a, uh, um, for, a, for an infinite period of time, um, of course, in the extreme, uh, we simply would not have to worry about any kind of uh, this constraint. That's obviously the, the case. We would have a sort of perfect chain letter if you will, and it would work um, for obvious reasons, mathematically obvious. But um, as Peter's pointed out, and uh, um, uh, uh, um, there's no guarantee, and you acknowledge that, and it will last forever. That's why you have the second side of things. But if um, uh, um, governments act on the assumption that it will last forever, they could get themselves into trouble, even if, uh, frankly, the risk of, uh, of an interest rate reversal right now is not huge, uh, in, in, in Europe at least. Um, it, it could happen. It's, it's a non-zero probability. Uh, so I think uh, um, it, it maybe the, 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 the prudence that is implied uh, in your rule could use some refining. And, and that's the first comment uh, I, 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 would, uh, I would make, uh, much in line with what Peter has said. And then I would make a second comment, uh, linked not to R minus G, but the zero lower bound. Um, 
in uh, say the United States, if um, fiscal policy if fiscal policy feels that it needs to support monetary policy at the zero lower bound, then the federal government can simply say, okay, we step in, we, we do what, what we feel is necessary. In the euro area, that's more complicated. And um, one can come up with all kinds of fancy constructions, but in the end, um, one institutional constraint we'll always be confronted with is that you can't really push on a string. In other words, if a country doesn't want to spend more money, it's hard to force it to do that. And then it, it, it will perhaps find covered ways to, to pretend it's spending the money, but in, in reality it isn't. So, so it's very hard to push on a string. Uh, so, so helping um, a, a monetary policy via fiscal policy um, um, through a rules-based system that applies to all countries of the euro area is a bit of a challenge. And I think um, we are lucky because there's a third element that your presentation mentioned, but it didn't dwell on it too much. I think there's a third stylized fact, a lot to do with, uh, with climate change, but not only. Um, we live in a world where there is ample opportunity for investment, not least public investment, into things that really pay off in terms of um, increasing uh, economic potential in the future. And why is that useful? Um, I think it's useful because it solves both uh, Eric and Mark, your problem, and Peter's problem. It solves uh, Eric and Mark, your problem, because if you borrow in, a, um, in an uh, um, R minus G um, is negative world, not knowing whether this will last forever, but spend the money on things that really have a very good return in terms of growth potential, then you insure yourselves against the interest rate reversal and you're fine. So to the extent that we can, if we, for example, tackle the climate challenge using the extra flexibility, R minus G, we're pro if the money is spent well, of course, then the quality of public finances creeps back in, it's a pretty good deal. And in the European context, uh, Peter, uh, while it's difficult to push on a string, if we have a consensus, as we seem to be having in the EU, that spending money on this great transformation, it's, it's really an enormous modernization push to get uh, uh, the, the, the climate issue right and to combine it with uh, investment, uh, perhaps in, in, in some additional areas, including areas where, you know, through human capital investment, one can also do a, a lot, not only for productivity, but for equity in societies. And then I think it is quite likely um, that uh, um, countries will voluntarily um, do what is necessary in order to support monetary policy at the zero lower bound. And so I think if we add this third element of investments being out there, where I think a consensus is shaping up that this is something we require, um, if we have a, 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 a if a rule, if it's a rule or a broad-based strategy that rests on three legs, the R minus G leg, the uh, uh, um, zero lower bound leg, and the um, investing um, in, in, into a yet better future leg, I think it's much likely that we will end up in a stable and uh, consensual and broadly supported so that we, you know, it's not that at every election in every European country, we have to worry whether this will, <laughs> this will, uh, will, will, uh, will work. Uh, stable, macroeconomically stable, politically stable, um, and offering us a brighter future. Um, so in that sense, progressive package. And so I, I would very much hope, and that's really my, my, my closing plea, that in the sessions that are to follow, this idea of, of, of you know, taking these three elements together is, is taken seriously and hopefully uh, will help us uh, improve on, 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 the, on the framework of, of fiscal rules that we have today. Thank you very much. Excellent, Jakob. Thank you so much. Um, there were quite a few challenges for you, Eric and, and Mark, to, to, to get back to. Um, I just wanted to say, if anyone in the audience has a question, you can, you can type that into the Q&A or the chat function. And, um, and I, can, I can read it out, um, although mindful of the time that we don't have that much left. Um, Eric, Mark, should we go in reverse order? Um, Mark first, yeah, I mean, and then Eric? Excellent, excellent. excellent. Mark, yes. why did you start? 
Sure, Ex excellent comments. I mean, we do want to revise this and these are just right, really, really good uh, points. I'm just gonna take one part of each of them because I think it, they're, they're the most important for my own way of thinking about this. So uh, as usual, Peter, Peter is smarter than me and comes up with a measure, which is the differential between the interest rate and the inflation rate as an alternate that unifies the fiscal and monetary framework. And I'm like, well, that's, that actually really works. I'm not sure this really replaces it, but I think that it is getting along the same lines to it. Um, where I would sort of push back a little bit is to take something that Jakob just said is, you know, some countries, they may have the fiscal space, but they're not going to overspend. And I do think that part of what we've got lying around in our head here, and it's always been a problem in the Eurozone, is the ability to talk about moral hazard on the one hand and solidarity on the other, thereby poisoning both of them. So the, the idea that politicians are runaway spenders just you know, has never really been true. Adam Tooze put this well when he says, you know, the notion of the heroic central banker who held back the democratic hordes who were going to bankrupt the state really wasn't true the minute that the 68ers turned in their uh, radicalism for pension plans and housing assets. So it may not be the case that even if you have that fiscal space, it leads to inevitably to runaway spending. And I think if we keep that moral hazard framework there as the primary thing, it really makes it difficult to do anything along the lines that Jakob is suggesting, which I wholeheartedly agree with, as the way to push this forward through the investment side of things. In terms of Veronique, this is exactly what I said to Eric when we were writing the paper. Italy is in permanent austerity if we impose this framework. And therefore, you need something like an expanded uh, next-gen fund or some other investment fund and a way of altering what constitutes the primary balance, et cetera, in terms of spending to make that work. And then the legitimate question is how much of this is kind of moving the accounting framework around to make things look better than they are. My only sort of response to that is to say, well, the current framework doesn't work either. So Italy still isn't growing and BTPs are basically being as held as ward of court by the ECB. And we do have a long-term problem there, which is, a very, very, very large bond market with suppressed rates has been held together by central bank intervention. So whatever we come up with, Italy is a problem, but ours probably doesn't help Italy per se, and you're quite right to point that out. And then my last point, again, is exactly on Jakob's point, that yes, the, the climate change and investment and the long-term payoff, that's exactly how to think about this, and I wish that we thought of it. As you said, it's implicit in the paper. We don't develop it, we should, and it's exactly what we need to do. And Europe is actually the one part of the world where we really see good movement in this direction, so we should maximise and double down on that. But again, I would simply say that for that to happen, the current rules need to go. It would be, it's still really hard to do that within the current, not just the uh, framework of fiscal rules themselves, but the intellectual framework that still holds those rules as being the appropriate way to do things. Having sort of 60% debt, debt to GDP levels as long-term targets when you're facing a climate emergency is not a good set of rules. So whatever we do needs to push beyond that. I'll now pass to Eric. Right. Well, I just really thank you all very much. Those are really interesting and really helpful points. Maybe if I just quickly address the sort of some, some, some straw men, I, I think obviously in terms of G, we have in mind a trend G, you know, that will, you know, and that, that remains a question. Um, so th th there shouldn't be anything pro-cyclical about what we're describing here, because if you bear in mind that what we're suggesting is when R is greater than G, you have effectively a Ren Lewis Porter's rule, which is actually a, 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 a rolling average allowing you to, it's a standard fiscal rule, which is allowing you to be aggressively counter cyclical as long as you're still consistent into the medium term with, with stabilizing the debt to GDP ratio. Um, the other point, I, I think though, Peter made a more fundamental point, which is a fair one, is that this rule would appear to have a bias where your, your, your debt GDP ratio can only go up. That's obviously assuming you don't elect to do otherwise. I think there is a legitimate area of discussion, and Mark, Mark and I need to think about this: is what do you do as your what is your rule when when R is below G? And it may well be to kind of square this circle here, and this links to what Jakob was saying, and Mark has just reiterated that actually your structural increases in debt 
should be for capital expenditure, in which case you can then look at net assets of the state and you might have stable net assets, but you can get, you know, what we all agree on, which is you have cleared the, the runway to allow the state exploit its cost of capital to do a lot of fixed asset investment. Now, Veronique made a lot of really good points. The, 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 I, I would say, I, I think if you, if, if you look carefully, and this is an area that we need to clarify, we, are, we, are, we absolutely want this rule to be, uh, to be counter cyclical and not pro cyclical, that, that absolutely. The, the point of Italy, I'm afraid though, and I just wanna stress really what Mark has said is, we've got a problem is the answer. Because if you really believe, so 10-year BT, BTP is now currently around 1%. If you think Italian trend nominal GDP growth is sub 1%, we've got a problem. <laughs> because I can do whatever you want with a fiscal rule. I can't get out of the arithmetic of that. Because if you're saying with a secular collapse in real interest rate structures, <laughs> I still have an interest rate above nominal GDP growth. Well, uh, you know, the, 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 it, the, the spreadsheet just looks terrible, right? Um, so, so in a sense, um, you know, but now I make just a final point really is, is that uh, don't give up on this too quickly because we need a rule. I, I still think it's too much to say to the European population and the political class, we're going to go from having had rules to having no rules at all. And bear in mind, this is the operable rule. This is why we've all changed our view on fiscal space. And this is also how market discipline works. You know, as a market participant, I'm looking at Italy going, you've got a problem now and Europe needs to tackle that problem. And we might as well, we should be clear about it. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. Um, I'm conscious of time, considering that the next session uh, was uh, supposed to start at, at 3 p.m. Berlin time sharply. So I think I will leave it at that because it set the stage perfectly for the, for the next discussion. Um, I, I thank Eric and Mark for their, for their input and uh, Veronique, um, Jakob and Peter for, their, for the discussion. And I'm very much looking forward to the next two sessions, which are on German fiscal policy and uh, our Schuldenbremse. Um, and, and Europe's fiscal rules. Thank you so much for joining us in this session. I have a lovely coffee break of now four minutes and I hand over to Thomas for this break. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you very much, um, Christian, for uh, chairing this uh, session. And I hope that uh, some of you may uh, stay uh, in the room because it's slightly like uh, a fluid um, continuation of uh, the discussion. So coming back in uh, three, four minutes, um, and then we have the discussion on the German debt break. Thank you.
Hallo Michael, grüß dich. Jens, grüß dich. Ja. Alles gut? Ja. Soweit läuft alles, genau. Du bist in Köln oder hast du dir, hast du dir so virtuellen Köln hintergrund? Das ist virtuell, äh, ja. ja. Das ist fast, also du weißt ja, der Blick hier aus dem Institut ist fast realistisch. Fast so, genau, richtig. Genau, genau. Und alle gesund? Alle gesund und wir sind ja in Startlöchern. Also unser zweiter Sohn kommt doch in den nächsten Tagen. Oh! Ja, also wenn es schlecht läuft, dann muss ich, kriege ich gleich einen Anruf, dann bin ich weg. Ja, da muss ich krass sein. Ja, das ist ja auch eine Investition in die Zukunft. Da sind wir so ja, ist es, genau. Ja, also da drücke ich die Daumen, alles Gute. Gell? Danke, danke. Ja, ich bin jetzt, ich muss ja spätestens 16 Uhr raus, dann würde ich jetzt... Äh, du fängst an, ne? Ich fange an, genau. Ja, aber mhm. wird das für Thomas ja gleich nochmal sagen. Hm? Ab wann macht ihr in Düsseldorf wieder Präsenzveranstaltungen in der Uni? Habt ihr ja schon geklärt? Puh. Hallo, Frau Hallo, hallo zusammen. Oh, hallo. <lacht> So, hello again, Frau Schmidt. Wir, wir treffen uns irgendwie jetzt täglich in unterschiedlichsten genau. Kontexten, genau. Das ist, ja, so. Täglich grüßt das Murmeltier. Also. Nein, aber das könnte mir deutlich, könnte mir deutlich Schlimmere, äh, Schlimmeres vorstellen, als sie täglich zu treffen. Ja, dann. <lacht> ja Frau Schmitz und ich, wir haben uns sogar quasi in virtuell in New York getroffen. Ne? Genau, genau. Also man kommt, man kommt ganz schön rum. Man kommt rum, ne? ohne sich zu bewegen. Die Gesellschaft der Sesshaften. <lacht> Wer kommt jetzt noch dazu? Ich überlege jetzt gerade, haben wir jetzt schon? Äh, äh, Sahin Vallet. Ja, erstmal ja die Philippa Siegel-Glöckner. Ja, genau. Die ja, genau. ist ja sozusagen die Hauptperson. Genau, aber ich sehe sie nicht hier. Bislang habe ich sie noch nicht. Also ich war gerade, ich habe mir eben so nebenbei ähm, die, das Vor. Sure, das so Panel. hello, it's, um, it, we're speaking in English, right? English, Deutsch? Ähm, meine Präsentation ist jetzt auf Deutsch. Ach so, okay, dann sprechen wir Deutsch. Ah, das. Und dann ja? später eine Diskussion. Ja, genau. Gut, also wir sprechen Deutsch. Jetzt weiß ich Bescheid. Hallo allerseits. Wir haben einen äh, vielfältigen und interessanten Tag hinter uns und äh, beenden ihn jetzt mit äh, einem Vortrag von Philippa Siegel-Glöckner vom Dezernat Zukunft. Philippa hat uns äh, einen Plan mitgebracht, wie wir, ähm, obwohl wir in einer Krise sind, die sehr kostspielig war für die öffentlichen Finanzen und große Herausforderungen vor uns haben, wie wir also damit fertig werden können, mit, mit, werden können mit neuen fiskalpolitischen Konzepten. Und dann haben wir ein sehr kompetentes Panel, die sich alle dazu geschaltet haben, ähm, digital, die das dann nochmal diskutieren und vertiefen können. Und zwar haben wir Monika Schnitzer, Sie ist Professorin an der LMU München und vor allen Dingen vom Sachverständigenrat Wirtschaft. Herzlich willkommen. Michael Hüter, Herr Präsident des Instituts für Wirtschaft Köln und Jens, sein Co-Autor Jens Südekum von der Universität Düsseldorf. Und wir haben Shahin Vallee vom German Council on, oder Deutsch, ich weiß gar nicht, wie es auf Deutsch hat. Hier steht German Council on Foreign Relations. Philippa, without further ado, du hast das Wort. Vielen Dank. Ja, vielen Dank ähm, für die Einladung, vielen Dank für die Möglichkeit, heute unsere Vorschläge ähm, für eine neue deutsche Finanzpolitik vorzustellen. Ich würde noch nicht so weit gehen, als dass es ein kompletter Plan ist, aber vielleicht ein paar erste Ideen, die auch auf dem aufbauen, was in der letzten Session besprochen wurde. Jakob hat es angesprochen, es geht auch darum, wofür man das Geld ausgibt. Bevor wir da aber einsteigen in die konkreten ähm, Policy-Vorschläge, sollten wir vielleicht einmal kurz darüber reden, was eigentlich heute die Herausforderungen sind, ähm, die die deutsche Finanzpolitik zu bewältigen hat. Da geht es erstens, und das kam jetzt auch schon sehr zur Sprache, um die Dekarbonisierung. Und da geht es nicht nur um Geld, sondern wir müssen wirklich in den nächsten zehn Jahren wahnsinnig viel schaffen. Wir müssen unser Land komplett umbauen, eine Industrienation ohne Atomenergie komplett auf erneuerbare Energien umstellen. Zweitens haben wir es mit dem demografischen Wandel zu tun, mit einer starken alte Älterung, Alterung der Gesellschaft und das in Verbindung mit einer ziemlich hohen ökonomischen Abhängigkeitsquote. Die ökonomische Abhängigkeitsquote, das ist das Verhältnis von Transferleistungsempfängern zu Erwerbstätigen, also alle, die Sozialleistungen beziehen und Renten im Verhältnis zu Erwerbstätigen. 
Und diese Quote ist in Deutschland über 60 Prozent. Und wenn man natürlich schon eine alte Bevölkerung hat und dann noch viele Menschen im erwerbstätigen Alter, die Unterstützung brauchen, ist das gerade aus finanzpolitischer Sicht eine sehr, sehr große Herausforderung. Und dann zuletzt haben wir bekanntermaßen in Deutschland einen großen Leistungsbilanzüberschuss. Wir brauchen die Nachfrage aus dem Ausland, um unsere Produkte absetzen zu können. Und in politisch volatilen Zeiten ist das durchaus ähm, ein gewisses Risiko. Das waren jetzt so die Big Picture Herausforderungen. Wenn man jetzt mal einen Schritt detaillierter wird oder die, die Sichtweise des Bundeshaushälters übernimmt, das sehen Sie hier auf dem rechten Chart, was da die Kopfschmerzen ganz konkret bereitet und was auch nicht. Was nicht, das ist diese rosa-pinke Linie, das sind die Zinszahlungen. Die lagen letztes Jahr bei so ungefähr 5,6 Milliarden für den Bund, Tendenz fallend und zwar schon über ganz lange Zeit und gehen noch weiter hinunter. Im Vergleich dazu sehen Sie die obere Linie, das sind die Zuschüsse zur allgemeinen Rentenversicherung. Die lagen letztes Jahr das erste Mal über 100 Milliarden Euro und machen knapp ein Drittel des Bundeshaushalts aus. Also wenn, wenn es Haushälter gibt, die nachts nicht gut schlafen, dann würde ich sagen, ähm, wegen diesen Posten und ähm, anderen Transferleistungen, gerade eben, da wir diese große ökonomische Abhängigkeitsquote haben. Deswegen sind wir beim Dezernat Zukunft der festen Überzeugung, dass die Nachhaltigkeit der öffentlichen Finanzen in der heutigen Situation, wir wollen das nicht generalisieren, aber in der heutigen Situation sehr stark abhängig ist von der Vollauslastung des Arbeitsmarkts. Finanzierungskosten sind nicht das Problem, aber was wir in Deutschland brauchen, wir müssen es schaffen, dass so viele wie möglich Menschen im erwerbsfähigen Alter sich selbst erhalten können und auch für ihre Rente, für ihren Ruhestand aufkommen können. Wir schlagen deswegen eine Verschiebung des finanzpolitischen Ziels vor. Was Sie auf der linken Seite des Charts sehen, also eben bis, bis 2020 praktisch, das Graue ist, wie wir bisher Finanzpolitik, Fiskalpolitik gemacht haben. Das oberste Ziel war, die Schuldenquote von 60 Prozent einzuhalten, wenn es ging zu unterschreiten. Das ist dann der große Stolz im Finanzministerium. Und der Grund dafür war, dass wir die Zinszahlungen begrenzen wollen. Das hatte in den 90er Jahren und Anfang der 2000er auch wirklich einen Sinn. Also ich war ja bis vor kurzem im Finanzministerium, wenn man da mit Kollegen sprach, dann haben die alle noch sehr genau im Kopf, wie 15 Prozent des Bundeshaushalts in Zinszahlungen ging. Das war ein wirkliches Problem. Ähm, heute ist aber vielleicht ein bisschen anders. Das hieß nicht, dass man nicht die Wirtschaft mit Finanzpolitik schon stabilisieren wollte oder heute schon stabilisieren will. Man hat schon ein bisschen versucht, die Konjunktur auszugleichen, aber das ist ein untergeordnetes Ziel gewesen, ganz klar. Und es ging darum, die Wirtschaft zu stabilisieren, nicht sie voll auszulasten, nicht bis an die Kapazitätsgrenzen zu gehen, zu schauen, dass jede Person, die arbeiten kann und möchte, das auch tut, sondern nur darum, die Wirtschaft um ihren Wachstumstrend zu stabilisieren. Das ist die graue, gestrichelte Linie, die Sie da sehen. Und dann die, die blaue ist die tatsächliche, der tatsächliche Verlauf. Was wir jetzt vorschlagen, ist eine Änderung des primären Ziels. Anstatt die Schuldenquote zu stabil zu halten oder zu unterschreiten, sagen wir, das primäre Ziel jetzt sollte sein, die Wirtschaft und insbesondere den Arbeitsmarkt auszulassen. Und der Grund, das hatte ich schon erwähnt, ist die Nachhaltigkeit der Finanzen hängt, wenn man sich die heutigen Ausgaben anguckt, fundamental davon ab, wie viel wir an Rentenzuschüssen zahlen müssen, wie viel wir an Sozialausgaben haben. Und zuletzt haben wir natürlich einen großen realen Bedarf, also da hatte ich die Dekarbonisierung angesprochen, aber in Bereichen wie Erziehung und Pflege gilt das Gleiche, wir brauchen die Arbeitskräfte. Die Voraussetzung dafür, und das war Thema des letzten Panels, sind günstige Finanzierungskonditionen. Wenn sich die Welt wieder ändert und wir wieder in eine Hochzinswelt kommen, muss man sicher nochmal neu denken. So, das ist jetzt ein bisschen makroökonomisch, globalgalaktisch gesprochen. Die Frage ist, was macht man mit den deutschen Fiskalregeln? Wir fangen da ja nicht mit einem weißen Blatt Papier an. So, und dazu, ich hoffe, Sie können es lesen, es ist ein bisschen klein wahrscheinlich, ähm, schlagen wir vor, dass wir die einfach gesetzliche Ausgestaltung der Schuldenbremse reformieren. 
Wir wollen nicht das Grundgesetz anpacken, aber wie die Schuldenbremse dann im Detail ähm, im Gesetz und in Verordnungen ausgestaltet ist. Ganz kurz, was macht die Schuldenbremse eigentlich? Die Schuldenbremse begrenzt das jährliche Defizit. Da gibt es ein paar Ausnahmen und ein paar Sternchen, die möchte ich jetzt mal zur Seite lassen. Ähm, ein Aspekt, auf den es ankommt, ähm, wo das Defizit begrenzt wird, ist, wie gut oder schlecht die Wirtschaft momentan läuft. Die Idee ist, wenn die Wirtschaft nicht so gut läuft, dann darf der Staat mehr tun, um die Wirtschaft zu stabilisieren. Wenn sie sowieso heiß läuft, dann sollte er Nachfrage rausnehmen. Das wird reguliert über die sogenannte Konjunkturkomponente. Die Konjunkturkomponente, die sehen Sie auf dem Chart, die ist noch in grau, aber schon rot umrandet. Grau, das ist alles, was vom Grundgesetz abgedeckt ist. Jetzt die Ausgestaltung der Konjunkturkomponente, das sind dann die bunten Kästchen, das ist einfach gesetzlich geregelt und bedarf damit für die, die nicht sich so viel mit Gesetzesänderungen beschäftigen, keiner Zweidrittelmehrheit im Bundestag und Bundesrat sind daher leichter zu ändern. Was wir jetzt anpacken wollen, um eine Wirtschaft von Konjunkturstabilisierung, von Trendstabilisierung zu Vollauslastung, um die Finanzpolitik neu auszurichten, ist, wir wollen verändern, wie berechnet wird, wie weit die momentane Wirtschaftsleistung von ihrem Potenzial weg ist. Weil je nachdem, wie groß dieser Abstand ist, dürfen wir dafür Geld ausgeben oder müssen sparen, um, um die Wirtschaft vor Überhitzung zu bewahren. Und entscheidend ist da die Frage, wie das Potenzial der Wirtschaft berechnet wird. Weil je nachdem entsteht dann eben auch dieser Abstand, für den wir Geld ausgeben dürfen oder nicht. Das ist die Berechnung des Produktionspotenzials. Und an die wollen wir gerne ran. Ähm, wenn man sich anguckt, wie das Produktionspotenzial berechnet wird, dann kommt das zustande, indem man sich das Arbeitsvolumen anguckt, ähm, den Kapitalstock, also was investiert wurde in der Vergangenheit und die äh, totale Faktorproduktivität, wie produktiv unsere Wirtschaft ist, wobei da vielleicht auch noch andere Sachen drin stecken. Das will ich aber zur Seite lassen. Wir fokussieren unseren Reformvorschlag auf das potenzielle Arbeitsvolumen und wie das berechnet wird. Heute kommt das zustande, indem man sich anguckt, wie groß die Bevölkerung ist, wie viele Menschen am Arbeitsmarkt teilnehmen, die Partizipationsquote, ähm, wie viele Arbeitsstunden sie arbeiten und dann, was die niedrigstmögliche Arbeitslosenquote ist, ohne dass Inflation entsteht. Das ist die sogenannte Non-Accelerating Wage Rate of Unemployment. Und die wollen wir uns jetzt mal angucken. Wie es momentan ist, wo wir eben nur versuchen, einen Trend zu stabilisieren und nicht die Wirtschaft auf Vollauslastung zu bringen. Wir sagen heute, die Wirtschaft ist bei maximalem Potenzial, die ist voll ausgelastet, mehr geht nicht, wenn wir eine Erwerbsbeteiligung so haben, wie wir sie in der Vergangenheit hatten, weil wir ja nur versuchen, einen Trend zu stabilisieren. Jetzt ist es so, dass traditionell in Deutschland Frauen immer noch weniger arbeiten als Männer. Das heißt, wenn wir weiterhin den Trend da stabilisieren, dann sagen wir in unserer Fiskalregel, Vollauslastung ist dann, wenn Frauen eine 9 Prozentpunkt geringere Erwerbsbeteiligung haben als Männer. Genauso sagen wir bei den Arbeitsstunden, heute arbeiten 5,6 Millionen Menschen in unfreiwilliger Teilzeit, sagen wir ja, wenn das in der Vergangenheit so war, dann ist das in der Zukunft halt auch so. Also 5,6 Millionen Menschen in unfreiwilliger Teilzeit heißt Vollauslastung. Und genauso bei der Arbeitslosigkeit ist in dieser ähm, Arbeitslosenquote impliziert, dass wir 2,2 Prozent Langzeitarbeitslose haben. Langzeitarbeitslose, das sind nicht Menschen, die aufgegeben haben, die sich zurückgezogen haben. Das sind Menschen, die über lange Zeit aktiv Arbeit suchen, bei der Arbeitsagentur gemeldet sind, in Vermittlung sind und trotzdem keinen Job finden. Und wir sagen, nö, maximales Potenzial ist, wenn die keinen Job finden, das geht einfach nicht. So, wir sagen, Vollauslastung ist dann nicht wirklich erreicht. Das kann nicht ernst gemeint sein. Und außerdem, wenn wir nachhaltige Finanzen haben wollen, müssen wir es etwas besser versuchen. Deswegen schlagen wir vor, anstatt die Erwerbsbeteiligung einfach fort, fortzuschreiben aus der Vergangenheit, zu sagen, wir zielen ab auf eine Erwerbsbeteiligung von Frauen, die drei Prozentpunkte unter Männern liegt. Das ist ungefähr, was in Skandinavien erreicht wird. Außerdem sagen wir, alle Menschen, die unfreiwillig in Teilzeit arbeiten, in unserem mutigen Szenario arbeiten so viele Stunden mehr, wie sie wollen. Und in einem etwas konservativen Szenario arbeiten die Hälfte der Zeit, äh, die sie haben wollen. 
Und wir sagen, es sollte keine Langzeitarbeitslosigkeit geben. Kurzfristige und friktionelle Arbeitslosigkeit wird man immer haben. Aber wenn Menschen über lange Zeit Arbeit suchen, dann sollten sie die irgendwann finden können, wenn die Wirtschaft wirklich ähm, auf, auf Volldampf läuft. Und wenn wir das machen, dann erhöhen wir das Produktionspotenzial und bekommen, wenn wir die europäische Methode ansonsten nehmen, die in Deutschland angewandt wird zur Berechnung, ähm, bekommen ein Produktionspotenzial, von, äh, eine Konjunkturkomponente, also wie viel ausgegeben werden darf, ähm, von 20 bis 24 Milliarden Euro in 2023. Das liegt ähm, 15 bis 20 Milliarden über dem, was unter den heutigen Regeln möglich wäre. So, dann wollen wir auch sagen, okay, wenn uns das so wichtig ist, dass wir Vollauslastung haben, dann sollten wir auch für jeden Euro, den wir unter der Vollauslastung liegen, ähm, schauen, dass wir genug ausgeben, an den richtigen Stellen ausgeben, um wirklich zu verhindern, dass die Wirtschaft im Abschwung wieder ihre Vollauslastung verliert, ähm, Arbeitsplätze verloren gehen und wir wieder langfristig ein Problem haben mit dem Haushalt. Und deswegen wollen wir die automatischen Stabilisatoren stärken und damit die Budget-Semi-Elastizität, wie viel Euro wir für jeden Euro, den die Wirtschaft unter ihrem Potenzial liegt, ausgeben dürfen. Hierzu nur ganz kurz, wenn man dazu selbst, glaube ich, drei Stunden reden könnte. Deutschland hat ähm, eine relativ, äh, relativ kleine automatische Stabilisatoren im europäischen Vergleich, wobei das hier auch eine bestimmte Berechnung ist. Wir können später gerne darüber reden, ob das die richtige ist. Ähm, deswegen schlagen wir vor, man, dass man hier bestimmte Verbesserungen vornehmen könnte, eben gerade in Bereichen, wo es in Krisen schwierig wird. Bei niedrigen Einkommen, sagen wir, könnte man die Sozialabgaben ähm, im Abschwung heruntersetzen. Zweiter Vorschlag, man könnte eine konjunkturell schwankende Klimaprämie, einen Klimabonus machen. Sebastian Dolin und Sebastian Gechert haben gerade heute vom IMK ein Papier dazu ähm, rausgebracht. Ähm, und dann könnte man bestimmte Dinge, die wir jetzt in der Corona-Krise ad hoc gemacht haben, mit automatischen Triggern versehen, damit man nicht ähm, auf äh, das Parlament angewiesen ist, dass wir in der Krise das Richtige tun. Und dann noch ein paar andere technische Dinge. Wenn man anstatt 20 Cent für jeden Euro, den unsere Wirtschaft unter Potenzial liegt, ausgibt, 50 Cent ausgibt, dann kommen wir auf eine Konjunkturkomponente in 2023. Also was der Staat ausgeben darf an Defizit, um die Wirtschaft zu stabilisieren, von 50 bis 60 Milliarden Euro, 1,3 bis 1,5 Prozent des Bruttoinlandsprodukts. So, natürlich bringt es nur was, Druck auf seinen Arbeitsmarkt zu machen und seine Wirtschaft voll auslasten zu wollen, wenn man auch das entsprechende äh, produktive Potenzial hat, wenn zum Beispiel die Frauen, die ein Jobangebot kriegen, das auch annehmen können, weil sie eine Betreuung für ihre Kinder haben. Deswegen muss man natürlich auch auf der Investitionsseite was tun. Die hat ganz viele Facetten. Wir haben uns rausgepickt, weil das, glaube ich, der größte Block ist, die kommunalen Investitionen. Sie sehen hier die, die schwarze oder dunkelblaue Linie. Ähm, seit Anfang der 2000er waren die netto negativ. Also es gab mehr Abschreibungen, als dort neu investiert wurde. Das muss dringend geändert werden. Und da haben wir einen Vorschlag mit René Geisler erarbeitet, wie man das hinbekommen könnte, dass das Geld auch abgerufen wird. Und zwar schlagen wir einen Investitionsfonds vor, konstante Ausschüttung über zehn Jahre, keine Anträge, keine detaillierten Mittelnachweise ans Bundesfinanzministerium von einer Gemeinde irgendwo in Südbayern, das gar nicht nachvollziehen können, ähm, sondern stetige Mittel, die dann vor Ort so ausgegeben können, äh, werden können, wie es sinnvoll ist. Nun ist natürlich alles dieses unter der Voraussetzung, dass die Finanzierungssituation so bleibt, wie sie ist. Mark und Eric haben da vorhin einen Vorschlag gemacht, was man dafür eine Regel machen könnte. Wir haben eine bisschen mehr aus der, ich glaube, weniger aus der Makromarkt sich kommende und mehr aus der Haushälter kommende Regel uns überlegt, weil wir es für wahnsinnig wichtig halten, dass man rechtzeitig erkennt, wenn sich die Finanzierungskonditionen verändern, wenn der Staat neu über seine Strategie nachdenken muss, über seine Fiskalstrategie. Und da haben wir uns angeguckt, was ist denn eigentlich ganz genau das Problem? Das Problem ist, wenn wir zu viele Zinszahlungen als Anteil vom Haushalt haben, wenn eben wieder 15 Prozent vom Haushalt oder Ähnliches in Zinsen geht. Und deswegen schauen wir einfach ganz direkt auf diese Zahl und sagen, wenn es einen einprozentpunktigen Anstieg gibt in dieser Quote, also Verhältnis von Zinszahlungen zu Haushalt, 
dann sollte die Bundesregierung gegenüber dem Bundestag rechtfertigen müssen, wieso ihre heutige Strategie, die eben ausgerichtet ist auf Vollauslastung, die von günstigen Finanzierungskonditionen ausgeht, wie die noch aufgehen kann und wieso die noch die richtige ist. Ähm, wir haben das mal für die Vergangenheit durchgespielt und für zwei zukünftige Szenarien. Was Sie hier sehen, sind die zukünftigen Szenarien. Einmal ein Hochzinsszenario, das ist aufgebaut auf dem Finanzplan des Bundesfinanzministeriums. Das ist die rosa-rote Linie, Finanzplan. Und dann einmal ein Niedrigzinsszenario, das sind die heutigen Markterwartungen. Das heißt hier Forward, das ist projiziert auf, auf Basis von Forwards. Und was wir sehen bei der Zinshaushaltsquote im Hochzinsszenario, da schlägt unser Indikator, dieser ein Prozentpunktige Anstieg der Zinshaushaltsquote, Einmal nächstes Jahr an, das ist eigentlich fast ein Sondereffekt, weil der Haushalt einfach so viel kleiner wird, weil wir nicht mehr die Corona-Ausgaben haben. Illustriert übrigens auch, wieso da nicht automatisch was passieren sollte. Dann schlägt er aber auch noch zweimal an ähm, innerhalb der nächsten zehn Jahre, weil die Zinsen eben merklich ansteigen und man dann wahrscheinlich schon was tun sollte. Im Niedrigzinsszenario, da schlägt er einmal an, und zwar erst nach sieben Jahren, wenn langsam so die Zinssteigerungen reinläufen. Also es ist ein merklicher Unterschied der beiden Szenarien. Wenn Sie sich im Vergleich auf der rechten Seite die gesamtstaatliche Schuldenquote angucken, da können Sie die beiden Szenarien fast gar nicht unterscheiden. Also da haben wir, glaube ich, am Ende 1,4 Prozentpunkte Unterschied, was jetzt ehrlich gesagt keine Politikerin, kein Politiker groß dazu bewegen wird, irgendwas zu verändern. Daher schlagen wir diesen Indikator vor, weil er unserer Ansicht nach sehr viel sensitiver ist, sehr viel genauer und früher erkennt, wenn wir eine Veränderung in der Zinsdynamik, in den Finanzierungsbedingungen haben und wir neu überlegen müssen, ob unsere Finanzpolitik die richtige ist. Ich will zum Abschluss kommen, eine kurze Übersicht über alle unsere Reformvorschläge. Was haben wir vorgeschlagen? Erstens auf der Nachfrageseite. Wir wollen ein Vollauslastungsziel, anstatt nur eine Trendstabilisierung zu haben. Das wollen wir konkret umsetzen durch eine Anpassung des Produktionspotenzials, also schon eine Modifikation der Schuldenbremse, aber nicht auf Grundgesetzebene. Zweitens wollen wir die Konjunkturstabilisierung stärken, dazu eine Weiterentwicklung der automatischen Stabilisatoren machen. Die Budgetsemi-Elastizität, die dann in die Schuldenbremse reinläuft, wird automatisch angepasst. Da müssten wir gar nicht eine Berechnungsmethode verändern. Dann auf der Angebotsseite, damit auch die Produktivkraft zur Verfügung steht, die wir, die wir ausnutzen wollen, ähm, schlagen wir einen kommunalen Investitionsfonds mit stetigen in Investitionsfonds vor, mit stetigen Investitionen über zehn Jahre, die Kommunen gut vorhersehen können, wo sie anständig planen können. Und zuletzt zur Absicherung des Ganzen einen Frühwarnindikator, sodass man erkennt, wenn wir wieder in einer anderen Welt sind und neu denken müssen. Und dazu schlagen wir vor, nicht auf die Schuldenquote zu gucken oder zumindest nicht allein, sondern den Anstieg bei der Zinshaushaltsquote zu beobachten. Bevor ich ende, will ich einmal ganz kurz meinen ganzen Co-Autoren und allen anderen, die unterstützt haben, danken. Das war ein, wirklich eine große Teamarbeit. Max Kahe, Pula Schneemelcher, Florian Schuster, Viola Hilbert, Henrika Meyer. Ohne euch wäre das nicht möglich gewesen. Ähm, unsere Ehrenamtlichen beim Dezernat Zukunft sind absolut essentiell für unsere Arbeit. Vielen, vielen Dank. Ebenso vielen Dank, Thomas. Ähm, das Forum New Economy hat äh, diese Studie in Auftrag gegeben, die uns ganz viel Spaß gemacht hat. Und jetzt freue ich mich sehr auf die Diskussion. Ja, ganz herzlichen Dank, Philippa. Und jetzt einer derjenigen, die ähm, Feedback gegeben haben, ist, äh, oder ist auch hier Jens Südekom und hat auch ein zweites Papier für die zusammen mit Michael Hüter arbeitet fürs Forum New Economy, das hoffentlich komplementär ist, weitere Vorschläge enthält und darauf freuen wir uns jetzt. Ja, ganz herzlichen Dank. Von meiner Seite ist es tatsächlich so, dass Michael Hüter und ich ja für das Forum New Economy ein Papier vorgestellt haben. Ich werde es aber auch ums Kurz zu halten, keine Slides zeigen, sondern eben ganz kurz ein paar Anmerkungen zu Philippa bringen. Und Stichwort komplementär. Ja, ich sehe es tatsächlich so, dass die beiden Vorschläge sehr gut komplementär zueinander sind. Erstmal möchte ich sagen, ich glaube, die Diskussion, die wir jetzt haben, die kommt genau zur richtigen Zeit, denn es ist eine große Gefahr, die ich sehe, ähm, derzeit haben wir ja noch ähm, den Ausnahmetatbestand der Schuldenbremse gezogen für 2021. Ich glaube, wir gehen 
alle oder fast alle davon aus, dass es vielleicht auch 2022 oder wahrscheinlich auch 2022 nochmal gezogen wird, ähm, aber spätestens 23 nicht mehr und ähm, dann droht natürlich, je nachdem, wie sich die wirtschaftliche Entwicklung bis dahin ähm, gestaltet, droht natürlich ähm, so etwas wie eine fiskalische Bremse, vielleicht sogar im Extremfall eine fiskalische Vollbremsung, ähm, vor allem auf Ebene der Bundesländer. Ja, und ich kann sagen, ich bin jetzt so häufiger gerade jetzt eben so auf Landesebene unterwegs mit den Fraktionen, mit den Landesfinanzministerien. Die Sparhaushalte äh, werden schon vorbereitet, äh, die dann spätestens 23 kommen. Ja. Aber nicht, weil es irgendwelche Marktsignale gäbe, die irgendwie zeigen würden, dass Sparhaushalte notwendig sind. Ja. Äh, bei den Zinsen ist trotz der enormen Neuverschuldung äh, für Deutschland und auch für ganz Europa nichts passiert. Äh, wir haben keinen Anstieg da gesehen. Es gibt keine Marktsignale, die irgendwie darauf hindeuten, dass wir am Ende der Fahnenstange angekommen sind. Das heißt, wenn Sparpolitik kommt, dann kommt sie, weil es die Fiskalregeln gibt. Das heißt, eine Fiskalregel, die vor langer Zeit definiert wurde, drückt uns dann gegebenenfalls quasi in Austerität herein. Ja, wobei ich ja eigentlich sagen möchte, wenn ich jetzt die Diskussion mal so sehe, mittlerweile eigentlich ein großer Konsens herrscht, zumindest nehme ich das so wahr, dass Austerität die völlig falsche Antwort wäre auf die Corona-Krise. Das war nach der Finanzkrise überhaupt nicht klar. Und wir wissen alle, welche Fehler gemacht wurden in den Jahren 2010 bis 2012. Ich sehe die Diskussion, wie wir sie momentan haben, so, dass eigentlich auch in der politischen Ära, äh, Arena eigentlich eine große ähm, Einigkeit darüber herrscht, dass die wesentliche Strategie im Umgang mit den Corona-Schulden darin bestehen sollte, aus ihnen herauszuwachsen. Ja, also letztendlich äh, die Schuldenquote zu stabilisieren, indem wir einfach äh, Wachstum des Bruttoinlandsprodukts haben und dadurch die Schuldenquote einfach automatisch absinkt, ohne dass irgendwelche besonderen Tilgungsanstrengungen ähm, da unternommen würden. Ja, also so, wie es im Grunde nach der Finanzkrise auch im Wesentlichen funktioniert äh, hat. Ähm, wenn ich mir anschaue, was die Parteien jetzt auch im Zuge der Bundestagswahl vorschlagen, dann ist es eigentlich so, dass dieses Herauswachsen als Königsweg von allen mehr oder weniger ähm, akzeptiert wird. Ähm, dazu passen aber äh, die geltenden Fiskalregeln nicht. Ja? Ähm, wie gesagt, die Gefahr ist akut, dass wir viel zu früh auf die Bremse treten, weil es die Regeln äh, sozusagen so wollen, ähm, etwa durch die vorgeschriebenen Tilgungsverpflichtungen, die sich eben ergeben, aus den Schulden, die jetzt eben im Zuge des Ausnahmetatbestandes ähm, aufgelaufen sind. Insofern ist es jetzt genau der richtige äh, Zeitpunkt, diese Diskussion zu führen. Und Michael Hüter und ich, wir hatten ja in unserem Papier ähm, etwas vorgeschlagen, was letztendlich darauf hinausläuft, äh, so eine im Prinzip ähm, modifizierte Form der goldenen Regel wieder einzuführen. Ja? Äh, also letztendlich die Kreditfinanzierung von Investitionen, so wie es früher eigentlich immer der Fall war, zuzulassen. Ähm, entweder indem man eine explizite ähm, Reform der Fiskalregeln eben macht auf deutscher und europäischer Ebene oder aber, wenn das politisch unrealistisch ist, indem man ähm, so Lösungen um sich andenkt, die letztendlich auf die Schaffung von ähm, selbstständigen Fonds ähm, hinausläuft. Ja? Also wir können auch sagen Schattenhaushalte, äh, die dann sozusagen mit Instrumenten wie den Fis äh, finanziellen Transaktionen äh, zum Beispiel dafür sorgen, dass man das machen kann, ähm, ohne dass man quasi die formellen Regeln angreifen muss. Und ähm, ich glaube auch, dass das kommen wird. Ja, ich denke, wenn ich mir jetzt die äh, Vorschläge der Parteien anschaue, ähm, besteht fast Konsens äh, nach, meiner nach meiner Lesart. Ähm, Armin Laschet hat jetzt einen sogenannten Deutschlandfonds vorgeschlagen, noch nicht sehr explizit, was das genau bedeuten soll und wie der ausgestaltet wird. Das wird wahrscheinlich jetzt in den kommenden Wochen kommen. Ja, ähm, die Grünen haben einen Investitionsfonds vorgeschlagen, ähm, die SPD letztlich auch. Ja, das heißt, also, ich bin mir ziemlich sicher, dass das kommen wird. Das hat aber eine ganz andere Logik ähm, zu der, was Philippa gerade gesagt hat. Denn die Fiskalien, die wir haben, sind einfach asymmetrisch konstruiert. Ja? Äh, wir verbieten Schuldenfinanzierung ähm, angeblich, um kommende Generationen ähm, nicht zu belasten und sozusagen aus der Sorge heraus, ähm, dass aufgrund politökonomischer äh, Mechanismen es eben ansonsten zu einem ähm, Deficit-Bias kommen würde ja, in der Gestaltung der Haushalte. Das heißt also, die Schuldenfinanzierung ist äh, ausgeschlossen. Aber wir haben nichts Vergleichbares, ähm, was darauf hinaus, äh, also eine, wir haben keinerlei Regel, die letztendlich dafür Sorge tragen würde, dass eben auch in den öffentlichen Haushalten genug Zukunftsausgaben getätigt werden nicht? und ähm, kommende Generationen eben einen intakten Kapitalstock zum Beispiel übereignet bekommen. Deswegen ist der Vorschlag von Michael Hüther und mir letztendlich äh, die goldene Regel, die eben ja einfach ähm, per se in dem Sinne plausibel ist, dass eben bestimmte Formen ähm, von 
öffentlichen Ausgaben, nämlich die Investitionen, ganz symmetrisch nach einer ähnlichen Logik eben auch die Kreditfinanzierung zulässig sein muss. Und das ist ein Argument, und jetzt komme ich zu Philippa, was völlig unabhängig vom Auslastungsgrad der Volkswirtschaft gilt. Das hat überhaupt nichts mit Unterbeschäftigung zu tun. Das auch an der Vollauslastungsgrenze der Volkswirtschaft würden diese Art von Investitionen und die Kreditfinanzierung dieser Art von Investitionen absolut plausibel sein. Denn es geht dabei nicht zuallererst um Nachfragestimulierung, sondern es ist streng genommen ein rein angebotspolitisches ähm, Konzept, ne, dass man sagt, ähm, wir, wir investieren in etwas, was langfristig auch Nutzen stiftet, also auch im Sinne jetzt quasi der Bepreisung dieses Nutzens ähm, in der Zukunft, nutzen wir entsprechend kongruent auch Finanzierungsinstrumente, die künftige Generationen auch an der Finanzierung beteiligen. Ne, das hat überhaupt nichts mit ähm, Nachfragestimulierung zu tun. Philippas Vorschlag äh, läuft im Kern ja darauf hinaus, ähm, den konjunkturellen Normalzustand zu hinterfragen. Ne? Und da habe ich große Sympathie für. Also implizit könnte man ja sagen, die Konjunkturkomponente ist genau dann neutral, ne? wenn ein konjunktureller Normalzustand vorherrscht. Und eine Lesart dieses Begriffs konjunktureller Normalzustand könnte eben sein, das ist voll. Beschäftigung. Ne? Also so, wie wir auch in ähm, ganz normaler marktökonomischer äh, Textbuchlogik argumentieren würden. Ja? Ähm, wir sollten sozusagen die gesamtwirtschaftliche Nachfragekurve, können wir so lange nach rechts verschieben, auch ohne Inflationsdruck, bis wir quasi ähm, das Potenzialoutput erreicht haben und erst dann sollten wir aufhören. Ja? Und ähm, in der Praxis ist aber die Ausgestaltung der Konjunkturkomponente eine ganz andere. Das hat Philippa ja sehr schön dargestellt. Da geht es nicht um Vollauslastung, da geht es um einen irgendwie definierten konjunkturellen Normalzustand, der im Prinzip nichts anderes ist als ein gleitender Durchschnitt der Vergangenheit. Ja? Und das macht natürlich, wenn wir ehrlich sind, überhaupt keinen Sinn. Wir können doch nicht ernsthaft sagen, bei einer Jugendarbeitslosenquote von 43 Prozent, die wir gerade in Spanien haben, äh, das ist kompatibel mit äh, Vollauslastung, also mit einem konjunkturellen Normalzustand. Ne? Wir alle kennen, oder Sie kennen wahrscheinlich alle die äh, Diskussion um die Nonsense-Output-Gaps, ähm, die ja recht prominent geworden ist von Robin Brooks und Co-Autoren. Das ist genau die richtige Stelle, ähm, wo wir eben diskutieren müssen, was ist eine sinnvolle, einfach gesetzliche Ausgestaltung ähm, der Konjunkturkomponente. Das ist eine Diskussion, die, glaube ich, auf europäischer Ebene noch viel, viel relevanter ist äh, als in Deutschland. Nicht? Also auch in Deutschland sind es schon, Philipp hat ja Beträge genannt, ähm, eben als zusätzlicher Spielraum. Und da muss man auch immer sagen, es ist ja nur ein Spielraum, der genutzt werden kann und nicht unbedingt genutzt werden muss für Kreditfinanzierung. Auf europäischer Ebene, wenn ich nach Italien schaue, nach Spanien schaue, ähm, sind das natürlich noch viel, viel relevanter, diese Frage. Was ist quasi eine sinnvolle Definition des Output Gaps? Und von daher ist jetzt genau die richtige Zeit, diese Diskussion zu führen. Deswegen habe ich große Sympathie für das Papier. Die andere Diskussion, die Kreditfinanzierung von Investitionen, würde ich eben davon trennen. Das ist das, was Michael Hüter und ich aufgeschrieben haben. Und ich glaube, das wird jetzt auch kommen nach der Bundestagswahl. Ist aber, wie gesagt, ein ganz anderes Thema. Insofern sind die beiden Vorschläge aus meiner Sicht sehr schön komplementär. Dabei würde ich es gerne belassen. Vielen Dank. Ja, vielen herzlichen Dank. Und ähm, ich würde vielleicht jetzt, um in die Runde, äh, die äh, Diskussionsrunde zu eröffnen, das Wort erstmal an Monika Schnitzer übergeben wollen. Natürlich haben Sie Gelegenheit, das einfach zu kommentieren, was Sie jetzt gehört haben. Ich hätte aber auch eine ganz konkrete Frage, ähm, zu, im Grunde genommen zu den Prämissen, die in beiden ähm, Vorschlägen stecken. Vor dem Hintergrund der aktuellen Krise. Wir können ja auch nicht so tun, als wenn, wir, als wenn das nicht passiert wäre. Also da gibt es zwei Dinge, die mir so auffallen, bei denen ich mich frage, ob die zu dem passen, was wir gerade erlebt haben. Das eine ist, ähm, ähm, also der Vorschlag von Philippa zu sagen, was wir jetzt sehen, die äh, Erwerbsbeteiligung von Frauen, ähm, die Arbeitsstunden, äh, die Frauen leisten, ist ein, kann eigentlich nicht als der konjunkturelle Normalzustand äh, aufgefasst werden. Das muss viel höher sein, mindestens so äh, wie, wie vielleicht in Skandinavien. Ähm, und da ist natürlich die Frage, also was wir jetzt ja erlebt haben, ist, gut, wir haben eine Krise, das musste man bewältigen und äh, da gibt es auch viel zu diskutieren, aber auf jeden Fall, ja, wir haben ähm, sozusagen Kontaktbudgets verteilt, um eben mit der äh, Ansteckungssituation fertig zu werden. Und sagen wir mal, im Vergleich auf jeden Fall zu anderen europäischen Ländern haben wir doch sehr stark, äh, also sehr lange jetzt auch wieder Schulen eingeschränkt, Kita-Betrieb eingeschränkt und so weiter. Passt denn das äh, überhaupt zu 
unserer gesellschaftlichen Situation, sagen wir mal so, diese Vorstellung. Das ist das eine. Und das zweite ist, äh, Jens, äh, Jens Hüdekom sagt ja gerade ganz wichtig, wenn man mit Schulden fertig werden will, Wachstum und was äh, jetzt Hüter Südekom das Papier betont, sind Investitionen. Da sind auch Investitionen in Bildung, Ausbildung dabei. Sie mit dem Sachverständigenrat haben das ja auch sehr betont in dem Papier äh, gerade. Wir geben eigentlich gar nicht genug äh, Geld für Bildung aus. Also Und das kann man... Ja, sicherlich so sagen. Aber es ist natürlich auch die Frage, also im Moment geben wir ja Bild für, Geld für Bildung aus, dass wir dann aber sozusagen, wir haben die Ausgaben vorgesehen, aber nutzen es gar nicht. Ist eine besondere Situation, aber trotzdem ist ja ein bisschen die Frage, ähm, in dem Fall der Ausgabeneffizienz. Und wird sich das jetzt ändern, wenn wir aus der Krise wieder rauskommen? Sind dann die Prämissen, die in beiden Papieren stecken, realistisch? Wie sehen Sie das? Ja, ganz herzlichen Dank. Das sind natürlich wunderbare Steilvorlagen für äh, Themen, die ich ohnehin ansprechen wollte. Lassen Sie mich einfach mal damit starten, dass ich äh, frage, äh, Schuldenbremse, warum haben wir das überhaupt? Ne? Also ein Stück zurückgehen und fragen, äh, warum haben wir die Schuldenbremse eingeführt? Und das hat aus meiner Sicht vor allem politökonomische Gründe. Wir haben eben über die Jahre gesehen, der Schuldenstand ist immer weiter gewachsen. Es sind in der Phase jetzt nicht die Investitionen gewachsen. Man hat in schlechten Zeiten Kredite aufgenommen, aber in guten Zeiten das weitergetan, jedenfalls nicht zurückgefahren. Und äh, das war letztlich der Auslöser dafür, dass man irgendwann gesagt hat, jetzt hat man diese Schuldenbremse. Die Frage ist jetzt, verhindert diese Schuldenbremse die adäquate antizyklische Politik und verhindert die Schuldenbremse, dass genügend investiert wird? Ich glaube, das sind die zwei zentralen Fragen, die wir uns stellen müssen und zu denen ja die beiden Papiere sprechen, die Frau Siegel-Glöckter vorgestellt hat und, und Hüter und Südekum vorgestellt haben. Lassen Sie mich mal mit dem ersten Punkt starten. Und Sie werden gleich sehen, ähm, Frau Mann, ich werde werd all Ihre Fragen dabei gleich jetzt einbauen. Ähm, verhindert also die Schuldenbremse die adäquate antizyklische Politik? Ich würde jetzt erstmal denken, aktuell in der Krise hat es ja eigentlich ganz gut funktioniert. Wir haben diese Ausnahmeregeln, wir haben die Ausnahmeregeln gezogen. Das hat funktioniert. Jetzt ist die Frage, wie lange hält das noch mit dieser Ausnahmeregel? Und an der Stelle würde ich tatsächlich mich dafür einsetzen, dass wir die Ausnahmeregel entsprechend flexibel auslegen, sodass wir also jetzt nicht von 100 auf 0 wieder runterbremsen müssen. Das ist eine Frage der Ausgestaltung. Aber Ihre Vorschläge, Frau Siegel-Glöckler, gehen ja darüber hinaus. Also Sie sagen ja, man sollte grundsätzlich ähm, hier reformieren und ähm, sagen, wir sollten uns an der Zinsquote eher orientieren als an der Schuldenquote. Da ist meine erste Frage schon mal, was hat man jetzt eigentlich als Staat besser unter Kontrolle? Ich kann sehr wohl kontrollieren, wie viel Schulden ich aufnehme. Ich habe überhaupt nicht unter Kontrolle, wie viel Zinsen ich zahle. Das hängt vom Markt ab. Und äh, wenn sich da etwas äh, tut, und da kann sich sehr schnell was tun, ähm, dann ist die Frage, wie die Fristigkeit meiner Schulden sind. Im letzten Jahr die Fristigkeit der Staatsanleihen, die der Staat begeben hat, war einjährig. Also der große Teil war einjährig. Jetzt wird das dann langsam umgeschuldet. Aber gleichzeitig äh, ist die Frage wirklich, wie viel Kontrolle hat man denn darüber? Und äh, was Ihr Punkt dann auch war, Frau siegel dabei zu sagen, naja, und wenn wir dann sehen, bei der Zinsquote äh, tut sich was, dann sollte sich die Regierung erklären, aber das heißt ja nicht notwendigerweise, dass man dann auch schon gleich handeln muss. Für meine Begriffe ist da ein bisschen wenig Verbindlichkeit dabei. Jetzt komme ich natürlich aus einer Generation, das ist vorhin angesprochen worden, die Leute in den 90ern, die Erfahrung gemacht haben, da war ich schon fertig mit dem Studium und ich habe tatsächlich die Phasen erlebt, als der Anteil am Staatshaushalt der Zinsausgaben so hoch war, dass man keine Flexibilität hat hatte, dass man eben nichts investieren konnte. Und gerade dann, wenn man es gebraucht hätte, hat man nichts investieren können. Und dann da nochmal neue Schulden aufzunehmen, ist ja noch mal extra teuer gewesen. Also das war ein Teufelskreis damals. Und das begründet natürlich auch, warum nicht jeder so ohne weiteres Hurra schreit, wenn es das heißt, na, aktuell sind die Zinsen niedrig, jetzt lassen wir es doch drauf ankommen. Aber lassen wir mich zum zweiten Punkt kommen, jetzt zu dem Thema Produktionspotenzial, Vollauslastung. Und da sind wir natürlich sofort auf einer Linie. Ich würde genau wie Sie sagen wollen, die Frauen müssen stärker beteiligt werden. Partizipationsquote müsste hochgehen, wobei die schon ziemlich hoch ist, muss man sagen. Das Problem ist, dass die Frauen in Deutschland im Vergleich zu anderen Ländern sehr viel weniger Stunden arbeiten. Und äh, da bin ich jetzt auch bei Ihnen, äh, Frau Brandt. Das ist natürlich ein Thema, das man angehen sollte. Die Frage ist jetzt nur, ob hier äh, diese konjunkturelle äh, 
Maßnahme das entsprechend Wichtige ist. Und das sehe ich eben überhaupt nicht. Also es ist nicht der Punkt, dass wir jetzt hier die Konjunktur anheizen müssen, damit die Frauen aus ihrer Teilzeit rauskommen. Da müssen wir über ganz andere Dinge nachdenken. Da müssen wir über die Kinderbetreuung nachdenken. Da müssen wir über das Ehegattensplitting nachdenken. Also wir können gerne mal eine Runde zum Ehegattensplitting machen. Und ich bin sofort dabei und erkläre sehr ausführlich allen Leuten, die es hören wollen, warum das Ehegattensplitting die Frauen davon abhält, wirklich Vollzeit zu arbeiten. Aber an der Stelle ist das deswegen für meine Begriffe das falsche Mittel, um dieses Thema anzugehen. Und das wäre an der Stelle dann eben auch nur eine, ja, um, ein, eine Möglichkeit, die Schulden zu erweitern, ohne dass das jetzt wirklich an dem Problem konkret etwas ändern würde. Nächster Punkt jetzt, ist die Schuldenbremse wirklich schuld dran, dass zu wenig investiert wurde? Wir haben uns ja im Beirat das Wirtschaftsministerium ist ganz ausführlich in einem Gutachten damit auseinandergesetzt und gezeigt, dass die Investitionen eben schon vor Einführung der Schuldenbremse niedrig waren, zu niedrig waren. Ich würde immer sagen, ja, zu niedrig waren. Aber ähm, man kann jetzt nicht den kausalen Zusammenhang herstellen, was liegt jetzt an der Schuldenbremse. Woran liegt es? Das liegt natürlich an einer falschen Priorisierung der Ausgaben. Das liegt an schwankenden Ausgaben. In dem Moment, wo ähm, die, die Investition immer das Residuum ist, äh, habe ich äh, das Problem, ich habe zu wenig Kapazitäten in den äh, Planungsbüros, in den Ministerien, in den Kommunen, um dann wirklich Geld verausgaben zu können. Und ähm, ich habe zu wenig Baukapazität. Also das ist genau das große Problem. Wir haben zu schwankende Ausgaben und dementsprechend ähm, hält uns das davon zurück, ähm, Investitionen zu tätigen. Jetzt wäre die Frage, ist die goldene Regel geeignet? Das hat Herr Südekum ja eben ausgeführt. Ähm, für meine Begriffe ist hier das größte Problem. Was sind denn Investitionen? Wie definieren wir das? Und das, was bei uns bisher nach VGR als Definition def verstanden wird, würde ich nicht notwendigerweise alles als Investition sehen, beziehungsweise wichtige Dinge sind da nicht enthalten. Also die Sanierung von Brücken wäre jetzt keine Investition. Und genau das ist das, was uns aktuell Probleme macht. LKWs können nur mit 60 über die Brücke fahren, weil die Brücke sonst zusammenbricht. Also das kann nicht die, der richtige Ansatz sein. Und jetzt, was Sie angesprochen hatten, Frau Brand, die Bildung, die ist eben auch nicht Teil der Investitionen. Genau da fehlt es uns doch. Wir bräuchten tatsächlich sehr viel höhere Ausgaben im Bildungsbereich. Wir liegen in Deutschland unterhalb des OECD-Durchschnitts, was unsere Ausgaben an Bildung angeht. Und das ist eigentlich unser wichtigstes Kapital. Da müssten wir unbedingt investieren. Also das äh, würde jetzt aber aktuell mit der goldenen Regel nicht funktionieren. Da haben wir nicht die richtige Definition. Und wieder, wir hatten die goldene Regel früher mal, es hat nicht funktioniert. Woran liegt es jetzt eben? Das liegt eben daran, dass die Ausgaben nicht richtig jeweils priorisiert worden sind. Und ähm, das heißt, selbst wenn man dann ähm, ähm, Geld im Rahmen der goldenen Regel dafür hat verwenden können, hat man ähm, es trotzdem nicht für die richtigen Ausgaben verwendet, sondern ähm, vieles dann wiederum verbucht als Investition, was es am Ende vielleicht gar nicht war. Jetzt war Ihr Vorschlag, Frau siegel da äh, eigenständige Investitionsgesellschaften einzurichten, die dann auch Kredite aufnehmen können. Den ersten Halbsatz würde ich mitgehen, eigenständige Investitionsgesellschaften. Das mit den Krediten würde ich erstmal zurückstellen. Eigenständige Investitionsgesellschaften insofern, als genau dadurch diese Verstetigung entsteht. Also was ist unser Problem? Unser Problem ist, dass die Ausgaben für Konsum, für Sozialausgaben zum allergrößten Teil gesetzlich festgelegt ist und dann Investitionen immer das Residuum sind. Und was wir wirklich brauchen, ist nicht nur über die Schuldenbremse sozusagen den, den, die Größe des Topfs zu deckeln, sondern dann auch innerhalb des Topfs klarzumachen, wofür das Geld ausgegeben werden soll. Und da kann man eben nicht nur den Konsum, die Sozialausgaben gesetzlich festlegen, da muss man auch die Investitionen gesetzlich festlegen, damit das eine nicht immer das Residuum bleibt, nämlich die Investitionen und hinten runterfällt. Dadurch muss eine Verstetigung der Investitionsausgaben herbeigeführt werden. Ob das dann wiederum mit extra Krediten einhergeht, an der Stelle bin ich skeptisch, weil das eben dann wieder sehr leicht dazu führt, dass wir ähm, insgesamt den, den Haushalt doch immer weiter aufblähen. Ähm, die Frage ist, wie dann die, die Schwankungen, die konjunkturellen Schwankungen aufgefangen werden. Das kann man, statt erstmal Kredite aufzunehmen und die dann zurückzuzahlen, auch machen, indem man erstmal anspart und sie dann später ausgibt. Um, so würde es die schwäbische Hausfrau machen. Ich will nicht sagen, dass das die einzige Möglichkeit ist. Aber auf jeden Fall muss man hier doch drüber nachdenken, wie man am Ende dabei landet, dass um, 
man nicht wieder denkt, jetzt lagern wir alles in die Investitionsgesellschaften aus und mit dem Haushalt, wenn die Einnahmen sprudeln, so wie sie das die letzten zehn Jahre getan haben, leisten wir uns die eine oder andere Reform, die eben auch zu Lasten der Zukunft geht, die zu Lasten der zukünftigen Generation noch eine ähm, Wohltat für die Rentner und ähm, dann ist das Geld verfrühstückt. Ja, also deswegen mein, mein ähm, Lädoyer am Ende wäre, ich denke, es ist politökonomisch wichtig, den Topf zu begrenzen, zu deckeln. Gleichzeitig ist es wichtig, zu sagen, wofür man das Geld ausgibt. Und an der Stelle wiederum ist es wichtig, diesen Investitionsbegriff deutlich zu überdenken, sodass es wirklich Investitionen in die Zukunft sind. Ja, herzlichen Dank, Frau Schnitzer. Ich will jetzt eigentlich erstmal den beiden sozusagen vorschlagenden Parteien äh, auch Möglichkeit geben, darauf einzugehen. Aber eine Nachfrage hätte ich noch mal zu dem, was Sie gesagt haben. Würden Sie denn äh, dafür plädieren, dass man, so wie es ja de facto im Moment ist, Investitionen gar nicht Kredit finanzieren darf, um jetzt diese, ähm, ja, um, um diese Deckelung beizubehalten, dass man jetzt nicht äh, zu weit geht mit seinen Ausgaben? Oder würden Sie auch sagen, naja, Investitionen, das kommt ja doch auch mehreren Jahrgängen, äh, Generationen zugute, da, da ist vielleicht Kreditfinanzierung auf jeden Fall, muss man ja vielleicht nicht in der Regel festschreiben, aber sie rechtfertigt sich. Also auch an der Stelle, diese, wenn man das mit Investitionsgesellschaft machen würde, müssten durch den Haushalt bestückt werden. Da müsste also sozusagen klar sein, da geht in regelmäßigen Abständen, geht da so und so viel Geld rein, damit wird finanziert. Der Haushalt an sich finanziert sich natürlich auch mit Schulden. Wir haben eine Schuldenquote aktuell von 70 Prozent. Wir hatten vorher 60 Prozent. Jetzt können wir das erhöhen auf 100 Prozent. Das wird uns nicht mehr Investitionen geben, weil wir gehen immer bis zum Limit. Und für das Nächste haben wir dann kein Geld mehr. Also wir haben ja eine Schuldenquote von 60 Prozent. Da ist ja, wir können 60 Prozent Schulden machen. Und das kann ja für die, für die Zukunft genutzt werden, tun wir aber nicht. Wir nutzen es eben auch für sehr viel, was rein konsumtiv ist. Irgendwo muss man dann so ehrlich sein und so sagen, wofür wollen wir das Geld wirklich ausgeben? Und da muss man natürlich in Krisenzeiten zugeben, das haben wir gerade getan. Aber das heißt nicht, dass ähm, man den konsumtiven Teil ausdehnen kann und sagen dann, ja, aber gleichzeitig wollen wir noch ein bisschen investieren, dafür nehmen wir jetzt nochmal extra Schulden auf. Die letzten zehn Jahre haben gezeigt, dass man das nicht gemacht hat. Vielen Dank. Ja, vielleicht um das, äh, damit wir das gleich mal aus, aufgreifen können, Philippa, also du kannst natürlich auf alles eingehen, was du möchtest, aber in, in speziell, also diese Idee, das Produktionspotenzial ganz anders zu definieren, fand ich auf jeden Fall spannend. Aber die Frage, die ich jetzt an Frau Schnitzer gestellt habe, würde ich auch an dich stellen. Also die Frage sozusagen, kannst, kannst du denn das, was du erreichen willst, nämlich eine höhere Erwerbsquote von Frauen, mehr Arbeitsstunden rein mit dem, was du sozusagen dadurch schaffst, nämlich dieser zusätzliche Raum für Ausgaben, wie erreicht man das dann automatisch oder wie funktioniert das denn genau? Gehe ich vielleicht darauf zuerst ein und dann, es ähm, war sehr, sehr spannend, was Sie gesagt haben, vielen Dank, ähm, habe ich, hab ich da mir eine Reihe Sachen aufgeschrieben, versuche mich kurz zu fassen. Aber vielleicht ganz kurz, also auch zu unserem Argument, ähm, wir machen eine fundamentale Unterscheidung zwischen Makro und Mikro. Unser Grund für ein höheres Defizit ist, das ist ein komplettes Makroargument. Also wenn wir mehr Frauen haben wollen, die arbeiten, dann muss irgendjemand denen ihre Arbeit abkaufen. Wir brauchen zusätzliche Nachfrage. Und die Frage ist einfach, woher kommt diese Nachfrage? Und das ist unser zentrales Argument, wieso wir die Konjunkturkomponente hochschrauben wollen und das Produktionspotenzial auslasten wollen. Das hat nichts zu tun mit der Allokation und ich gebe Ihnen vollkommen recht, also wenn man sagt, man muss jetzt die Schuldenbremse aufbohren, damit man Investitionen machen kann, da bin ich bei Ihnen, das glaube ich auch nicht. Abgesehen davon, dass auch unter unserer Zielsetzung man absolut allokative Trade-offs hat. Ich glaube nur sinnvollere, weil wir erstmal ein positives Ziel dafür haben, was eigentlich nachhaltige Finanzen kreiert. Also man kann dann auch noch politische Ziele darunter legen. Also wie soll eigentlich unsere Gesellschaft, unser Arbeitsmarkt aussehen? Das ist ja irgendwann auch sehr politisch. Also wir haben uns zum Beispiel schwer getan, schon als Ökonomen und Ökonomen so eine Erwerbsquote für Frauen da überhaupt irgendwie reinzuschreiben, weil man könnte sagen, das sollte fundamental eigentlich vom Parlament entschieden werden und überhaupt nicht in der Fiskalregel drinstehen. Ähm, insofern nur, wir haben gesagt, was machen wir denn erstmal? 
ähm, um das aus der finanzpolitischen Sicht zu betrachten, was generiert langfristig nachhaltige Finanzen. Und da brauchen wir einfach ähm, eine hohe Erwerbsbeteiligung. Und Sie hatten es schon genannt, also Partizipationsquote ist gar nicht so das primäre Problem. Gerade in Deutschland haben wir da eine hohe für Frauen. Ähm, aber die Art der Erwerbsbeteiligung ist problematisch. Viel Teilzeit, äh, viel Minijobs ähm, etc., was dann eben gerade bei der Rente ähm, ein großes, großes Problem ergibt. Deswegen sagen wir eben, wir brauchen diese Ausrichtung auf Vollauslastung, die dann auch natürlich wieder Trade-offs kreiert, weil sie sagt, also wenn man das wirklich ernst nimmt, ähm, dann sind alle Maßnahmen, die zu mehr Arbeit führen, relativ unproblematisch. Wenn ich aber jetzt sage, ich investiere in, ich weiß nicht, ein großes digitales Lernsystem, das ich aus Amerika kaufe, was eine Investition ist und da könnte man sagen, da haben manche gar kein Problem, das Kredit zu finanzieren, sage ich aber, wenn diese Ausgabe riesig ist, das geht ins Ausland, das schafft keine Nachfrage hier. Wir haben aber ein Problem mit der Auslastung unseres Arbeitsmarktes. Vielleicht ähm, ist das vielleicht kritisch zu sehen. Also es ist gar nicht so, dass, da, dass wir sagen, everything goes und wir brauchen einfach mehr Geld und dann wird alles gut. Wir machen ein Makroargument, das heißt, wir brauchen eine gewisse Nachfrage, um den Arbeitsmarkt auszulasten und die Forschung hat auch in den letzten Jahren gezeigt, also dass es eben diesen Effekt gibt. Wir haben es ja gesehen, in Amerika und in Deutschland hatten wir eine Auslastung der Wirtschaft weit über Nairo oder unter, je nachdem, wie Sie es sehen wollen. Und wir hatten keine Inflation. Also wir haben eine höhere Erwerbsbeteiligung bekommen, ähm, einen größeren Arbeitsmarkt. Und das ist einfach ist, ist gut gegangen. Also durch hohe Nachfrage kann man eine, eine höhere Wirtschaftsleistung schaffen. Das vielleicht nur, nur vorab. Ich würde diese zwei Argumente wirklich trennen. Nur glauben wir auch, dass Nachfrage und Angebotspolitik so religiös zu trennen, das ist mehr aus der VWL der letzten Jahre entstanden, aber das entspricht doch nicht der Realität. Also in der Realität brauche ich sowohl ein Jobangebot als auch einen Kita-Platz für mein Kind. Und deswegen muss man beides tun. Jetzt versuche ich einmal kurz die Struktur abzugehen, damit es nicht zu lang wird. Äh, politökonomisch, sie sagt, wir brauchen unbedingt eine Regel, wer begrenzt was, naja, ich bin mir da nicht so sicher. Also ehrlich gesagt, das ist auch, was ich noch in der Uni gelernt habe und was ich in meinem Uni-Examen mit größter Überzeugung geschrieben habe. Aber wir haben es doch in den letzten Jahren einfach nicht unbedingt gesehen. Also wir haben gesehen, dass es den Bias in beide Richtungen gibt. Jetzt hat es Lukas Haffert in seinem Buch zur schwarzen Null auch mal systematisch aufgearbeitet, dass es so ist, also Länder, die eine strikte Fiskalregel haben, die eigentlich immer nicht brauchen, weil sie übererfüllen, wir in Deutschland waren ja auch ganz gut mit der politisch schwarz, äh, gesetzten schwarzen Null, die noch mal strikter ist als die Schuldenbremse. Also ich würde einfach bezweifeln, dass es immer einen Bias in die eine Richtung gibt. Ich glaube, dass es sehr viel komplexer ist und man echt am Ende die einzelnen Akteure angucken muss und wie deren relative Verhältnisse sind. Aber da wird es dann kompliziert. Ich bezweifle nur, dass es durch eine Regel, die in eine Richtung begrenzt, so einfach getan ist. Ganz kurz zur Finanzierungsfrage. Sie sagten, ähm, Schuldenquote könnte man besser ähm, kontrollieren als Zinsquote. Also die Schuldenquote zu kontrollieren, ist, glaube ich, wahnsinnig schwer, ehrlich gesagt. Ähm, wenn, wenn wir sehen, wo die deutsche Schuldenquote groß angestiegen ist, zum Beispiel Finanzkrise jetzt, da hätten wir überhaupt nichts tun können. Das mussten wir machen. Ähm, und wir haben ja auch... Also, wir schauen immer schön auf unser Defizit, aber wenn Sie dann gucken, wie eigentlich der Maastricht-Schuldenstand zustande kommt, der hat so viele autonome Faktoren drin, die meistens genauso groß sind wie unser Defizit oder Überschuss. Da hätte ich Zweifel an, an dieser Aussage. Ich glaube, wenn man ehrlich ist, ist es wahnsinnig schwer, den Fiskus dann zu, zu kontrollieren. Laufzeit von Staatsanleihen. Ja, wir haben letztes Jahr viele Einjährige ausgegeben, bewusste Entscheidungen der Finanzagentur, um ähm, Portfoliokosten zu optimieren, beziehungsweise Einnahmen. Ähm, durchschnittliche Laufzeit ist aber sieben Jahre in Deutschland. Ähm, das können wir durch, durch Anleihenlaufzeiten machen, die wir ausgeben, aber auch durch Swaps. Also das ist eine reine Optimierungsfrage. Da hat die Finanzagentur, macht, macht Forecasts und sagt, wie lange Zinsbindungsfristen sie haben will. Insofern sind wir da gar nicht so den, der, der Willkür der Märkte ausgesetzt. Und ehrlich gesagt, also da haben wir bei unserem Indikator ziemlich genau darauf geguckt, dass der einem noch eine Chance gibt, zu ähm, reagieren. Sie hatten die 90er Jahre angesprochen. In 90er Jahren wäre der viermal hintereinander angeschlagen innerhalb von, glaube ich, sieben Jahren. Also in den 90er Jahren hätte unser Indikator gesagt, ihr macht hier absoluten Wahnsinn, hört mal auf. Insofern waren wir da ganz zuversichtlich, dass er solche Szenarien, die problematisch sind, identifiziert und zwar relativ schnell. Ähm, über das Makro-Ding hatte ich gesprochen. Ähm, was ich interessant fand, ähm, Sie haben noch über Investitionen gesprochen und ähm, 
wir haben nicht die richtige Definition. Ich frage mich halt dann, was die richtige Definition ist. Natürlich kann man einfach sagen, wir machen es wie die USA und nehmen Bildung und, und Forschung und Entwicklung mit rein in Investitionen. Ähm, aber geht es dann nicht noch weiter? Also ähm, Biden sagt jetzt auch Pflege, weil damit eben wieder Arbeitskraft freigesetzt wird. Im Endeffekt, glaube ich, kommen wir wieder an den Punkt, wo was eine Investition ist, auch eine gute kontextabhängig ist und wo Nachfrage und Angebotsseite zusammenpassen müssen. Deswegen tue ich mir schwer, dann einen Begriff festzulegen, der für sich unabhängig vom Kontext sinnvoll ist. Mich würde sehr, sehr interessieren, was Sie da als Standard ansetzen würden. Also was ist nach Ihrer Meinung nach die richtige ähm, Definition für eine Investition und wie sollten wir Investitionen gegeneinander abwägen? Ähm, also und priorisieren, Gleiches gilt vielleicht auch allgemeiner für Ausgaben, wobei die Frage vielleicht etwas zu breit ist. Dann die letzte Sache, die mich noch sehr interessieren würde. Ähm, Sie hatten gesagt, naja, Sie wollen beides verstetigen, damit nicht ähm, die Investitionen am Ende das Residu Residual sind. Aber wenn wir beides verstetigen, also dann what gives? Dann haben wir, wenn wir noch einen Budget Constraint haben, dann haben wir eine Variable, die zu viel gefixt ist. Also das würde mich interessieren, wie Sie, wie Sie das auflösen. Und hiermit belasse ich es erstmal, damit es nicht komplett als weiter Vortrag wird. Naja, ja, es ist eine, eine Diskussion. Aber ich würde, also Jens Südekum muss jetzt leider schon gehen. Der Co-Autor, Michael Hüter, ist aber da. Und bevor ich das jetzt eben nochmal die Fragen zurückgebe, die greifen wir auch auf jeden Fall nochmal auf, würde ich nochmal für den Beitrag fragen wollen, also die Punkte, die Frau Schnitzer genannt hat. Erstmal, was ist denn jetzt eigentlich der richtige Investitionsbegriff? Äh, zweitens, wir hatten schon mal eine Schuldenregel. Wie äh, unterscheidet sich der Vorschlag, den Sie gemacht haben, zusammen mit Jens Südekom davon? Also wie stellen Sie sicher, äh, dass der Raum, den man schafft, durch äh, zusätzliche Kreditaufnahmemöglichkeiten tatsächlich für Investitionen genutzt wird? Vielleicht besonders vor dem Punkt, den Frau Schnitzer genannt hat, der ja irgendwie sehr virulent war, auch schon in den letzten Jahren, wo man schon gesagt hat, ja, ja, ich will ja mehr investieren. Ähm, Gelder bereitgestellt hat, Bundesmittel für ähm, äh, Investitionen auf, auf Landesebene, auf kommunaler Ebene und es dann doch mit dem Mittelabfluss nicht so geklappt hat, we wegen der Baukapazitäten, wegen der Kapazitäten ähm, in, den, äh, in den Planungsbüros und so. Also wie stellt, offensichtlich hat man gar nicht die Fähigkeit zu investieren, wie stellt man das dann eigentlich äh, sicher? Also das sind dann ja wieder vordergründig konsumtive Aufgaben, aber Ausgaben, Entschuldigung, ähm, wie, wie schnüren Sie das Paket, damit es diesmal auch funktioniert? Ja, Frau Bahn, vielen Dank für die Fragen und vielen Dank für die Präsentationen und Anregungen. Ähm, zunächst folgender Punkt. Es ist ähm, der Blick zurück nicht so düster, wie Frau Schnitzer ihn beschrieben hat. Und die letzten zehn Jahre mit der Schuldenbremse sind auch nicht so goldig, wie sie im Nachhinein erscheinen. Denn wenn man sich mal genau die Finanzgeschichte der Bundesregierung anschaut, waren das immer Stufensprünge. Es ist nicht ein kontinuierlicher Prozess steigender Schuldenstandsquote gewesen, sondern immer ein Sprüngen, wenn exogene Schocks da waren. Das war in den 70er Jahren, dann hat man wieder konsolidiert, dann war es in den 80ern auf 40 und dann war die Wiederverhandlung auf 60 und dann kam die Finanzkrise auf 80. Also ich glaube, es ist ganz wichtig, man kann, wenn man sich genau anschaut, keinen kontinuierlichen Prozess sehen, sondern wenn man sehr viel genauer hinschaut, stellt man fest, man hat immer wieder konsolidierungspolitisch gegengearbeitet. Das hat man auch unterschiedlich erfolgreich gemacht mit unter Instrumenten. Aber wenn Sie die Geschichte der Konsolidierungspolitik daneben legen, ist es nicht so, dass Sie sagen können, es ist ein permanenter sozusagen Aus, Ausweitung des Handlungsspielraums durch äh, einfach Kreditaufnahmen. Sondern es hat immer wieder Besinnung, immer wieder Korrekturphasen gegeben. Die hatten nur ein Problem. Und das wird bei dem ganz entscheidenden Punkt ähm, dieses Papiers von Philippa, dass nämlich ähm, Sie eigentlich den Staatshaushalt nicht in eine ordentliche Verfassung bringen, wenn sie am Arbeitsmarkt nicht erfolgreich integrieren. Das ist aus meiner Sicht der ganz entscheidende. Da komme ich aber gleich. Wenn wir die letzten zehn Jahre uns anschauen, wir haben mal kontrafaktisch gerechnet, mit einer Situation einer konstanten Steuerquote und nominal konstanten Zinsausgaben, dann stellen Sie fest, dass die, Steuer, die Schuldenstandsquote im Jahr 2019 nicht bei 59,6 Prozent gelandet wäre, sondern bei 79 das heißt also, in diesen vergangenen zehn Jahren hätte es trotz der tollen Schuldenstandsquote ohne die Arbeitsmarktintegrationseffekte und die daraus folgenden Steuer- und Abgabeneinnahmen, aber auch der Zinseffekt durch die, durch die Entlastung gar nicht zu diesem, Groß, zu diesem Ergebnis gekommen. Es ist also nicht Ausdruck einer wirklich steuernden 
Finanzpolitik, die jetzt da die Schuldenbremse hat, also wirklich gebremst, sondern es ist ein Ausdruck einer glücklichen Situation, einer erfolgreichen Arbeitsmarktintegration. Ja, was sind Investitionen? Der zweite Punkt. Ich meine, das ist eine alte Debatte. Das kennt Frau Schnitzler genauso gut wie ich. Es gab ja in der alten Regel des Artikel 115 mal den Hinweis, Näheres regelt ein Bundesgesetz. Dann hat mal irgendwann der Bundesgesetzgeber aufgeschrieben, das sind die Haushaltsgruppen 8 und 9. Und dann sind wir genau bei der Frage, was ist eigentlich das Bruttoanlagevermögensstatus? Und natürlich ist es richtig, im Prinzip Bildung zu, in einer solchen Weise zu sehen. Nur wenn Sie Bildung Investitionen nehmen, müssen Sie auch die Abschreibungen auf Humankapital gegenrechnen. Und genau das ist der entscheidende Punkt. Würde man relativ einfach den, Staat, den Bund dazu bringen, das zu tun, was die Kommunen machen müssen, die Doppik einführen, dann würde er uns jedes Jahr vor Augen führen, was er mit seinem Bruttoanlagevermögen macht. Und eine Straße, die nicht mehr benutzbar ist, das ist ein Abgang aus dem Bruttoanlagevermögen. Nicht? In den Kapitalstockrechnungen wird ja nicht über Abschreibung, sondern über Abgänge argumentiert, weil was nicht mehr nutzbar ist. Das muss nicht übereingehen. Und das wäre schon mal eine einfache Ergänzungsmaßnahme. Wenn man die Doppik einführte, würde man eine Anfangsbilanz machen. Man würde man sehen, was der Staat jährlich in seinem Vermögensbestand hinterlässt. Und darauf könnte man auch den Investitionsbegriff kalibrieren. Er bleibt aber zu einem gewissen Maße arbiträr. Ich glaube, das muss man ganz nüchtern und ganz, ganz undramatisch einfach so sehen. Was ich Spannend finde, das würde ich gerne nochmal aufnehmen aus dem Papier von Philippa, ist einfach den Blick auf das Arbeitsvolumen. Denn das ist ja eigentlich völlig kompatibel mit dem, was ich eben sagte, der Erfahrung der letzten zehn Jahre. Die Konsolidierung ist gelungen durch die Ausweitung der Erwerbstätigkeit. Und ein ganz entscheidender Punkt, das ist mir völlig im Konsens, ist die unfreiwillige Teilzeit, ist dieses, diese un, ungleichmäßige Aufteilung der Arbeitsvolumina. Wir haben uns mal ein Papier überlegt, also wenn man so Orientierungen sucht. Da haben wir mal gesagt, was sind denn Länder in Europa, die sagen wir, vom Sozialmodell irgendwie ähnlich sind, was haben die erreicht? Und wir haben mal Schweden und die Schweiz herausgenommen. Und dann stellt man fest, wenn man die Kategorien durchgeht, Partizipation, also mehr Integration im Arbeitsmarkt, hätte man noch zweieinhalb bis drei Prozent Punkte Luft. Das ist aber nicht so richtig viel. Zweitens, dann stellen wir fest, die, sowohl die Schweizer als auch die äh, Schweden arbeiten länger, haben mehr Arbeitsstunden im Jahr. Wir haben auch mehr Arbeitswochen. Die Schweizer haben 45,3 Arbeitswochen, wir haben 43,4. Was ich damit sagen will, ist, man kann mit Blick auf das Wachstum ein bisschen breiter noch rangehen. Das wäre mein, mein Impuls. Denn Sie müssen ja eins sehen, wir verlieren schlicht und ergreifend vier Millionen Erwerbspersonen in der nächsten Dekade alterungsbedingt. Die verschwinden einfach. Wenn wir unter gegebenen Regulatorik, also unter gegebenen äh, Rentenzugangsregelung, verschwinden die. Die vier Millionen muss ich ja irgendwie schon mal kompensieren. Ich kann also nicht, wie in der vergangenen Dekade, einfach durch Integration Nettoeffekte gleich mit generieren, sondern ich muss dem demografischen Verlust irgendwie dagegen arbeiten. Und deswegen wäre mein Impuls zu dem wichtigen, völlig von mir geteilten Ansatz, Arbeitszeit, Teilzeit, etwas breiter zu gucken. Man kann es ja der Gesellschaft als ein Angebot machen. Wenn ihr seht, das ist das, dann müsst ihr vielleicht auch mal über Jahresarbeitszeitvolumina nachdenken, vielleicht auch mal über Arbeitswocheneffekte. Also dann kriegt man noch mehr Ansätze, um das Stichwort der Vollauslastung, was Sie völlig zu Recht hier äh, bringen, einfach auch deutlich zu machen. Ich hätte nur gar nicht so viel Sorgen, Philippa, dass man das mobilisieren kann über die Nachfrage, weil wir sehen es ja jetzt schon wieder. Wir haben ja diese schwere Corona-Krise jetzt mal als Gesundheitskrise, aber wir haben sie auch als ökonomische Krise und sehen eigentlich, die offenen Stellen steigen wieder an. Der Fach, das Fachkräftethema bleibt so relevant wie zuvor. Und es wird über Weiterbildung ähnliche Dinge gesprochen. Das heißt, da wäre ich relativ, vielleicht ein bisschen naiv, aber relativ optimistisch, dass wenn wir dieses Arbeitsvolumen generieren, wir das auch in, tatsächlich auch nutzen können. Also dass dem nichts entgegensteht, sondern der Strukturwandel mit Blick auf Innovationsleistung, mit all das, was wir für die Dekarbonisierung tun müssen. Und, das vielleicht der, und dann noch der letzte Gedanke, wo wir, glaube ich, alle relativ nah beieinander sind. Ich teile völlig, was Monika Schnitzer gesagt hat, zu der Volatilität der Ausgaben, also der Unstetigkeit. Das ist einfach so. Die Dinge, die nur jährlich festgelegt werden, also wie die Investitionsausgaben aus, gegenüber den im, im Sozialhaushalt durch andere Gesetzesansprüche definierten Schwanken. Der, der, mein Argument war auch deshalb immer für eine Art Sonderhaushalt, der rechtlich selbstständig sein muss, also nicht ein reines Sondervermögen, das dort zu packen, weil wir es transparent sehen. Dann sehen wir ja, was wird denn getan, 
für die äh, Energiewende? Was wird getan für den Digitalausbau? Was wird getan für die Dekarbonisierung im Bereich Mobilität und Verkehr? Das wird auf zehn Jahre definiert. Und dann haben wir, hat natürlich immer völlig recht, dann bleibt da eine, was ist die Variable im System? Und die Variable für mich ist im System, dass wir diesen Haushalt über Bundesanleihen finanzieren lassen. Das ist eine Finanzierung quasi außerhalb, aber es würde über den Bundesgesetzgeber gehen. Und der andere Haushalt, der liefe nach den jetzigen Regeln, weil da habe ich die Investitionen ja faktisch nicht mehr drin. Da hätte ich die Konsumausgaben, da kann ich sozusagen die ganze Regulatorik abwickeln, die ansonsten relevant ist. Und hier dann dadurch Raum zu schaffen, das wäre sozusagen ein, ein, ein Thema, das man dann vielleicht näher sich anschauen müsste, wie man das macht. Die Verfassungsrechtler sagen uns, das ginge auch mit der jetzigen Schuldenbremse, die ja nur den Haushalt von Bund und Ländern adressiert. Und das wäre sozusagen die Überlegung. Und nur ein Hinweis, vielleicht kommen wir noch drauf, wir haben heute noch nicht diskutiert, die Tilgung der Corona-Schulden. Denn das macht uns ja eigentlich Bauchschmerzen. Wir haben eine Escape Clause von der Schuldenbremse, die dafür sorgen soll, dass wir so einen Schock abfedern können. Aber dann müssen wir so schnell tilgen, dass es dann zu volkswirtschaftlichen Schäden kommt. Das ist ja natürlich auch absurd und deswegen plädieren wir für eine 40-jährige Tilgung, die Sache beiseite gelegt. Also ich glaube, da ist auch der Sachverständigenrat eher entspannt, sagen, das kann nicht sein, dass wir jetzt so tilgen, dass wir das konterkarieren, was die Escape Clause eigentlich möglich macht. Ja, vielen herzlichen Dank. Wer jetzt noch gar nichts oder, oder wir nicht jetzt äh, auch wirklich mal zur Kommentierung äh, einladen möchte, ist Shaheen Vallee vom Council of Foreign Relations. Und vielleicht äh, können wir mal so einen Kommentar äh, bekommen, tatsächlich aus äh, Sicht der äh, Außenpolitik in dem Sinne. Natürlich ist das relevant. Also die, jetzt hatten wir eine sehr deutsche Diskussion über die, ähm, ähm, die, die Schuldenregel oder die goldene Regel. Natürlich werden die Dinge, die jetzt in Deutschland gemacht werden, auch immer auf europäische Ebene gehoben. Da gibt es Fans dieser Denkweise, also der, der Denkweise, die jetzt hier für die jetzt Reformen vorgeschlagen wurden und aber auch Länder, die sich jedenfalls in der vergangenen Krise davon zu sehr eingeschränkt gefühlt haben. Also wie wichtig ist es, um jetzt gemeinsam die äh, aktuelle Krise zu bewältigen, dass eben in Deutschland über diese Regeln nachgedacht wird und äh, man das natürlich, äh, wenn man das denn tut, wahrscheinlich auch auf europäischer Ebene tun würde? Thank you very much for your uh, invitation and for this uh, fascinating debate. Um, um, I have prepared a, a, few, a few slides that I want to share with you. And, uh, and of course, um, this debate is very important in Germany, but it's very important in the rest of Europe. And I think it's absolutely fitting that we start by having this conversation about the fiscal rules in Germany, because in my view, the way we settle this debate in Germany is going to have an overbearing uh, effect on, on the rest of, uh, of Europe. And so uh, you shouldn't feel guilty at, whole, at all to have had a, a very narrowly uh, German discussion because I think this narrow German discussion uh, has very far reaching European consequences. Um, let me share, well, let me go uh, over a few, um, uh, a, few, a few slides with you. Uh, and, and, and thank you very much um, uh, to, uh, to Philippa for this great paper. Um, I, I want to uh, question something nonetheless. I think we have spent most of the discussion assuming that um, uh, the uh, space we had for reform was basically um, the limits of the constitution. Uh, and, and I want to challenge that. So first, you know, let's go to what can be done within the rules. And this is most of what the discussion has focused on today. Uh, first, I think, uh, you know, we could extend uh, the suspension of the rule uh, for longer. And this has been uh, discussed uh, before me. Uh, we could discuss a gradual reintroduction of, of the rules. Uh, we could also, dis uh, you know, discuss the idea of, of front-loading the use of, um, of, of reserves. Um, you know, as you know, uh, due to fiscal overperformance over the previous years, uh, the federal government has created special funds in which it has, you know, accumulated revenues. There has been the Asylum and Refugee Reserve Fund, which has more than 40 uh, billion. 
there's the Energy and Climate Fund, which has more than 6 billion, and there's the Bundeswehr uh, Reserve Fund, which has also less than, less than a billion. These funds have been accumulated due to fiscal overperformance over the years, and they could be dispersed now. And then there are all the options that, that Philippa and others mentioned uh, recently, which is modifying the operational framework of the Schuldenbremse and modifying the cyclical component in particular. So either you know, using references to the interest rates or as, as Philippa proposed, you know, changing the view we have on output gap and the calculation of output gap and therefore creating a lot of fiscal space through this instrument. Another option, which was uh, mentioned uh, uh, last by, uh, by Mr. Uh, Hutter, is the idea of uh, stretching the repayment period of the COVID debt over a longer term. Uh, as you see on this chart, you know, the federal government and the Bundestag has voted to repay this debt over a 20-year horizon, which is extremely short, and which will create a very rapid consolidation uh, from the year 2024 uh, onwards. Uh, keep in mind that the lenders uh, voted as well on repayment plans at the lender level, and some of them have chosen a 50-year uh, repayment horizon. And so having a much longer repayment horizon is entirely possible, and this uh, hasn't been chosen by the federal government at this point, but I think this is something that is deserving more attention. Uh, and lastly, you know, we have municipal debts that have accumulated at the municipal level and have created a backlog. And I think clearing that backlog of municipal debt, the alt Schulden could, could create also some fiscal space at the, at the local level. This was an idea that Minister Scholz put on the table, but that he was not able to carry uh, through. And I think that's something to consider. But that to me are the range of options that you know, can operate within the rules. I think we should really ask ourselves, why do we take the constitution as such an impossible uh, uh, thing to modify? And I would argue, and I will use the rest of my presentation to argue that not only um, we should uh, think about a reform of the constitution, but that, but that we can. Um, I know that in Germany, uh, there is a, a form of, of constitutional patriotism, and, and, and I think uh, it's very right that there is uh, such a thing. Um, but I think, you know, the constitution can be both sacred and we can be very proud of it and at the same time be modifiable. Um, in fact, the basic law was designed uh, to be modifiable, you know, at the inception, at the inception in 1949, it was designed to be a very temporary basic law until reunif reunification. And the idea was that there would be a new constitution after reunification. It didn't happen like that. And in fact, there was no new constitution after reunification, but there were a series of pretty profound constitutional amendments. We tend to forget it, but the basic law since 1949 has been modified more than 60 times, um, you know, proving the point that um, you know, it can be modified and it actually can be modified a lot more easily than is collectively uh, uh, believed. There were very profound reforms of the constitutions in 1956 that allowed rearmament. Re re there were deep reforms in 1968, big reforms after reunification in 1994. And then there were a series of smaller reforms, mostly revolving around fiscal federalism. Um, and I'll come to that. In 1992, you may remember, there was a constitutional court ruling uh, that backed the bailout uh, uh, of transfers to, uh, to lenders that were effectively uh, bankrupt. And this created a chain reaction of constitutional reforms. Uh, that culminated, culminated in 2009 with the creation of the debt break, uh, and that has been viewed since as the holy grail that needs to be preserved at, at all costs. Uh, I think it's important to remember that the 2009 reform had uh, more than one objective. It was not only about um, uh, fiscal uh, responsibility and debt sustainability, it was also about internal fiscal federalism and about controlling the finances of the lender and limiting redistribution and transfers between the lenders. I think that's an essential element that tends to be forgotten. Uh, this has been um, changed to, to some extent in 2017 after the uh, migration crisis, which provoked a need for much larger transfers within, uh, within Germany. Um, and then, and people tend to forget it again, 
um, there was a, a reform of the constitution uh, as early as uh, last year in September 2020 with a constitutional amendment that allowed to extend transfers from the federal government to the municipalities. I'm quoting these examples to show that um, uh, reforms of the constitutions, even when the government doesn't have a two-third majority, are entirely possible. And in many of these cases, they were in fact largely unavoidable. My conjecture is that um, this is becoming more and more unavoidable and this should become therefore a, a topic of political discussion. It should become a topic of political discussion because it's actually becoming a topic of legal discussion. As you know, there is a, a famous uh, battle of the judges between national constitutional courts and the, the European Court of Justice, and in particular uh, uh, between the German Constitutional Court and the European Court of Justice, which uh, was recently, I think, highlighted by the tension between um, uh, on, on the case of, of the ECB ruling and the PSPP ruling. Uh, but I think there is a, a new case that might be um, uh, equally, if not more important for the future of fiscal conversation uh, is the April 20, 2021 ruling uh, on the Climate Protection Act. Uh, and I think what is happening now is that we're moving from a battle of the judges between the national constitutional court judges and the European Court of Justice judges to a battle of the judges inside Germany between the two senates of the Constitutional Court. Uh, the first senate, which ruled on the Climate Protection Act, uh, effectively not only recognizing the power of international law and its bearing on the national constitution, but also you know, recognizes effectively the potential friction between climate transition objectives and, uh, and the Schulden Bremse. And so I think there's a real question to be raised now as to whether our climate commitment is not raising uh, uh, and making the case for a more profound constitutional uh, reform. Whether in fact the old uh, Schwarze Null uh, is not going to be replaced by a new Schwarze Null, which will not be the balanced budget, which will be uh, you know, having uh, emissions uh, going down to zero. And I think the real discussion we should have is whether this debate between you know, fiscal policy and climate objectives is a debate that should be settled by the judge in Karlsruhe or whether this is a debate that should be settled by uh, politicians uh, in Berlin uh, by way of an election. And that's why I want to make the case, and that's my final slide, uh, the case for constitutional reform focusing, I think, on four big topics. One is that, you know, as you know, this constitutional reform has introduced the output gap uh, concept in the constitution. I find that quite scary, to be honest, that such a loose economic concept, which has a lot of theoretical merit, but which is very um, uh, unpractical, uh, is uh, creating, uh, you know, is becoming uh, uh, sacred to the extent of being incorporated in the constitution. I think it has been and, and, and Philippa has explained it very well, it has you know, proven to be a poor instrument to actually design and implement uh, fiscal stabilization. Um, the second element which I think uh, you know, deserves more attention is that climate protection and, and green investments are probably not compatible with the debt rule as it is today. And even with the modifications that Philippa has mentioned, which would be you know, enormously useful, I think they are not enough to ensure that Germany and Europe meets its climate objectives. And so I think, you know, a much deeper reform of the Schulden Bremse is necessary and would require a constitutional amendment. The third, and I think this has been proven several times, including with this COVID crisis, is that the fiscal federalism that was designed in 2009 has failed and it has failed now repeatedly. And the need for transfers for a, a transfer union inside Germany between German lenders has proven to be necessary. I think the German Federation will not survive if there are no transfers. And this fact, this was recognized by the 2017 constitutional reform that basically extended, extended the, the finance act light and, and, and allowed transfers between lenders and the federal government to be prolonged. And finally, uh, one thing I'm, I'm getting increasingly concerned about is that in the efforts that we are all making to um, create more fiscal space within the strictures of the rules, we are digging trenches inside the rules and we're creating a less transparent and less democratic budgetary process. 
So I believe there is one thing sacred in the German constitution is that the German uh, government and the German Bundestag should be sovereign over fiscal matters. And what is happening now is that basically we're creating all sorts of off balance sheet vehicles to do fiscal policy instead of the federal budget because we don't want on paper to escape uh, a discussion on, on the constitutional debt break. And so public private partnerships and all sorts of reserve funds that are being created are being precisely created to basically evade the fiscal rule while still optically respecting it. And I think that's a, a, a fundamental uh, a political problem that should be resolved. And so I would really encourage um, us all to, to have this, this conversation and this debate openly. I think German political parties and German uh, think tanks have a great role to play between now and the German elections. Uh, my experience, my short experience of German elections is that what is not discussed during the campaign um, is rarely discussed uh, during the coalition negotiations. And so to me, it is of critical importance that these issues of reforming the debt break are not only part of the campaign, but then they become part of the coalition's Vertrag. And that's the only way to have a German commitment to changing um, uh, the fiscal rules. And in my view, that's necessary to open the debate to change the fiscal rules in, in Europe. So I think there is a, an enormous responsibility uh, 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 on, on us all to make sure that this conversation takes place in Germany in the coming months, because I, I suspect there will not be a reform of the European fiscal rules uh, if there is no discussion of the German fiscal rules first. And so I think all the discussions we had today are extremely important to find the technical hooks to create more space within the rules. But I think we also have a responsibility to open the discussion about reforming the rules more profoundly. Thank you. Ja, vielen herzlichen Dank. Ähm, sehr faszinierend, die Argumente. Und, und äh, wären auch Sachen gewesen, zum Teil, die ich hätte äh, aufgreifen wollen. Ich habe eine Nachfrage. Und zwar äh, klang es jetzt, also äh, was jetzt nicht so ganz klar geworden ist, also sehr gute Punkte darüber. Ja, natürlich, die, die Verfassung kann ich ändern. Ähm, die Frage ist, sind Sie der Meinung, ähm, es soll eine reformierte Schuldenregel geben in der Verfassung oder, so klang es mir eigentlich eher, also mit den Punkten, was sollen Politiker entscheiden, was soll sich aus Regeln ergeben, könnte man fast sagen, dass sie gesagt haben, ist eine Fiskalregel mit quantitativen Zielen überhaupt das Richtige? Also nicht nur, ob es nun in der Verfassung ist oder nicht in der Verfassung. Man kann sich ja auch, ähm, andere Wege vorstellen, um sicherzustellen, dass man langfristige Schuldentragfähigkeit hat. Zum Beispiel so eine Art erweitertes äh, Congressional, wie in den USA das Congressional Budget Office, dass man also sehr transparent, dass die Regierung sehr transparent sein muss, wenn sie sagt, das will ich ausgeben, das sind meine Ausnahmen, das sind die Wachstumswirkungen, die, die ich erwarte und das ist die Wirkung auf die Schuldentragfähigkeit und es dann sozusagen dem Parlament zu überlassen, da die Entscheidungen zu, zu fällen. Wie sehen Sie das? Braucht man eine, einfach nur eine reformierte Schuldenregel? Soll sie in der Verfassung sein? Oder einfach gesetzlich? Oder muss man sich ganz fragen, ob, man, ob Schulden, Fiskalregeln das richtige Instrument sind, um Schuldentragfähigkeit herzustellen? Um, so, thank you. This is a very uh, this is a very important question. Um, so I think, insofar as achieving debt sustainability, I'm not convinced that fiscal rules are the right instrument. However, um, uh, I believe that fiscal rules might be necessary to organize fiscal federalism, and in that sense. Uh, uh, you know, when I mean, what I mean by fiscal federalism is organizing the transfers between the federal government and the lenders and then the, the transfers between the lenders. And in that sense, I believe a fiscal rule at the national level is also useful because I view it as part and parcel of fiscal federalism at the European level. 
And so I don't think I believe in fiscal rules for the purposes of achieving fiscal sustainability. I agree with you, you know, an alternative uh, framework with a CBO and, a, a, you know, and an empowered uh, uh, Bundestag could probably do the job. Um, uh, but I think, you know, having rules uh, to, uh, uh, to organize fiscal federalism at the national and at the European level could be uh, very useful. I also think that in order to take into consideration our climate, climate neutrality objectives, fiscal rules can be very important because basically fiscal rules could help you to calibrate the amount of investment that you must make in order to meet your climate objectives. And this is not what the rules are doing at all. In fact, today, the rules are doing the opposite. So to me, an ideal you know, rules-based framework would create strong incentives for governments to basically meet their climate commitments by way of rules and would organize the fiscal federalism. So I don't believe in rules so much uh, for debt sustainability. Uh, I think they can serve other purposes. Yeah, herzlichen Dank. Philippa, wird da bestimmt sowieso drauf eingehen, aber mich würde es auch interessieren, also weil ich es an einem Punkt sehr interessant fand, wo du sagtest, ja, wir haben uns überlegt, ob wir jetzt die Beschäftigungsquote, ich weiß nicht, was die Erwerbsquote überhaupt damit reinnehmen, ist das nicht was, worüber das Parlament entscheiden soll. Also denken wir nicht viel zu ähm, eng oft in den Regeln, die wir eben haben, weil wir denken, wir können die Verfassung nicht ändern oder man muss eben irgendwie eine Schuldenregel haben, sonst klappt es nicht. Dieser, dieser Anstoß zu sagen, Nee, es geht auch anders. Muss man den nicht aufgreifen? It's okay, wenn ich auf Englisch antworte, weil das macht eigentlich yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll respond in English if that's okay, because that makes it a bit easier with um, Shaheen's comments. Um, so let me start with this. I mean, I fully wholeheartedly agree that we need a redemocratization of like fiscal policy. Um, actually, I mean, this is what one of the famous um, German constitutional lawyers um, who specialize in finance, as he says, He's entirely clear that financial law is serving law, dienendes Recht. So it basically it should follow whatever your political goal is. So I yeah, I couldn't agree more that you know these kind of things, like how many women you know work, what the participation um, rate is, that that should be regulated in the law or even the constitution. That's insane. Uh, I think where where the two of us disagree is just on the path to change. So first of all, I think we need to really have a debate on where we want to go, what the right goal is before we talk about mechanisms, because otherwise things can go awfully wrong. And secondly, I just think that the path to reform in Germany is a little bit longer. Yeah, you talked about constitutional reform and referred to, I think, Article 104 in the Constitution that's been changed a couple of times so that we could do more transfers to, to the local level. But that's precisely because the politics work, because everybody was in agreement. Today on the debt break, you just don't have the same situation. I think we really need to basically change the discussion, change the debate, um, both economically, also then like in the public and in the legal sphere. And this is actually the next paper we're working on, but this will take a while um, or a little bit longer is to dissect all of this um, from a, more from a democracy perspective and a legal perspective. And you know, how does this even work that we put output potential in the constitution? Um, and should we do this or should it be put back? Um, so full agreement, just how we change this, especially considering the election is end of September, which is scarily close. Um, I think we need to make sure that we don't set the goal so high um, that we set ourselves up for failure and then nothing happens. Ja, wir haben noch ein ganz bisschen Zeit, deswegen würde ich Herrn Hüter jetzt auch gerne nochmal die Gelegenheit geben, sozusagen auf diese Kritik einzugehen. Bewegen wir uns nicht viel zu eng in diesem ja, Verfassungsrahmen, den wir da haben? Fürchten wir zu sehr, den jetzt nicht zu ändern? Müssen wir nicht grundsätzlich herangehen, um fiskalische Nachhaltigkeit zu haben, aber auch, um eben die digitale, die grüne Transformation zu schaffen? Also vielleicht ganz kurz dazu. Ich denke, es ist eine Frage politischen Pragmatismus, wie man das aufbricht. Und ich glaube, es ist einfach klüger, didaktisch klüger, wenn man die auch mitnehmen kann, die ein ganz starkes Commitment äh, fast persönlich für die Schuldenbremse haben. Und zu sagen, ja, das ist ein Regel im Grundsatz, das würde ich schon sehr deutlich sagen, ist hilfreich, aber sie hat halt 
Defekte. Sie hat Defekte in der Frage, wie geht man mit der Escape Clause bei der Tilgung dann um. Sie hat Defekte in der Frage, warum ist es hinderlich oder warum kann es nicht sein, dass ein Bundesland die Altschulden seiner Kommunen aufnimmt und dafür die Kommunen entlassen in seiner Verantwortung. Das muss dann wie Hessen gemacht werden in einer Bank. Es wird irgendwo geparkt bei einer öffentlichen Bank. Das ist ja völlig absurd. Das heißt, es gibt ein paar von Learnings und das, das kann man, glaube ich, auch besser vermitteln. Also insofern ist mein Ansatz eher in der gegebenen Verfassungslogik, die Dinge weiterzuentwickeln und dafür auch Mehrheiten zu suchen, statt es komplett neu umzusetzen, sondern zu gucken, was geht. Und da sind ja Dinge auch angesprochen. Wir können die Tilgung verlängern. Das können wir ganz gut machen. Wir können aber zwischen den Gebietskörperschaften nicht hin und her schieben. Also müssen wir da eine Lösung finden. Der Investitionsfonds, noch mal gesagt, hat den hohen Charme der Transparenz. Dann müssen wir den Mut haben, den noch extra zu haben. Auch dafür werden wir aber auch jemanden sozusagen als, als eine Screeningstelle benötigen. Warum entwickelt man nicht den Stabilitätsrat zum Investitionsrat? Ja, der im Sinne der ganzen Transformationsaufgaben, die wir haben, ein Testat und weiß das Parlament das. Und dann hätten wir so eine Art CBO. Und dann, also wir, mein, mein Argument ist eher ein ganz pragmatisches, nicht die Verfassung komplett neu zu schreiben an der Stelle, sondern ich würde sie auch entschlacken. Ich finde, da steht auch Detailkram drin, was in eine Verfassung überhaupt nicht reingehört. Ja, also ich meine, also das ist ja der Tagespolitik entzogen und äh, das von der Grundlogik her, das ist vielleicht leichtere Möglichkeit, mehr dafür zu gewinnen. Na, zwei Minuten habe ich noch. Ich würde nämlich Frau Schnitzer vielleicht noch mal fragen. Es ist zwar, gehen wir zurück, aber äh, Philippa hatte ja ein paar Fragen an Sie. Also wie geht das mit der Verstetigung der Investitionen, wenn wir gleichzeitig ähm, da Regeln auf der Seite haben? Und vielleicht auch einfach noch ganz kurz zu dieser Idee, äh, zu, zu der Frage, gehört die Fiskalregel eigentlich, wir haben es immer so gehabt, aber gehört das in die Verfassung oder ähm, ist es da viel zu detailliert? Okay, ich fange mit dem Letzten an. Jetzt ist sie mal in der Verfassung. Verfassung hat immer den Vorteil, dass man nicht mit jeder neuen Koalition das wieder gleich umwirft. Also manchmal hat es eben große Vorteile, dass man sich bindet. Da ist ja eine Frage der Bindung. Wie ist das mit den zwei festen Größen plus dann noch ein fester Deckel? Sie haben völlig recht, das ist genau der Witz. Bisher war eben das, was ähm, which gives, das war, war immer die Investition, das war das Residuum. Und wenn man jetzt beides festlegt, muss da was in der Zwischen, dazwischen sein. Und das ist letztlich das, was man an, an Schuldenmöglichkeit hat. Nur muss man das jetzt auf beides verteilen. Und das wäre auch so, wenn man das, wie Herr Hüter sagt, dann halt in der Investitionsgesellschaft auslagert. Da muss man halt sich darauf verständigen, wie viel von dem Schuldenspielraum, den man hat, gibt man in die Investitionsgesellschaft, wie viel in den Rest. Das ist dann tatsächlich das, was man austarieren muss. Ein Punkt nochmal zu dem Thema, was sind wirklich wichtige Investitionen? Das wollte ich vorhin schon loswerden, habe ich vergessen. Die wichtigste Investition für meine Begriffe ist Forschung und Entwicklung, Bildung und Forschung und Entwicklung. Ein Euro Forschung und Entwicklung bringt uns mehr als zehn Euro auf die Dauer. Und das ist so ziemlich die beste Investition, die wir haben können. Und da müssen wir unbedingt dran gehen. Jetzt will ich aber noch ganz kurz auf, auf Herrn Vallée eingehen. Ich finde, er hat einen sehr interessanten Punkt aufgebracht jetzt mit der föderalen Struktur, ob wir da nicht noch mal ran müssen. Transferunion hat ja gesagt, das ist ja nicht nur innerhalb von Deutschland dann ein Thema, das ist ja auch innerhalb von der EU ein Thema. Und ähm, uns hat ja auch gerade die Corona-Krise gerade gezeigt, dass es vielleicht mit unserer föderalen Struktur insgesamt nicht zum Besten bestellt ist. Wer hat Ausgabenhoheit, wer hat Einnahmenhoheit? Das sind Dinge, die man sehr gründlich diskutieren sollte. Ich weiß nicht, ob man die im Rahmen der Schuldenbremse diskutieren sollte. Ich glaube, das ist etwas, was wir uns insgesamt einfach mal vornehmen müssen, gerade nach der Erfahrung in dem letzten Jahr. Da würde viele, die das hohe Lied des Föderalismus singen, vielleicht jetzt doch nicht immer gute Beispiele nennen, dass das alles so perfekt gelaufen ist. Und an der Stelle sollte man sicherlich darüber nachdenken, wie man das verbessern kann, ohne dass ich jetzt hier die Lösung schon präsentieren kann. Mir ist es aber auf der anderen Seite auch extrem wichtig und fast noch wichtiger, diesen, diesen Ausgleich zwischen verschiedenen Generationen herzustellen. Denn bei den Ländern können sich die, die aktuell zu kurz kommen, beschweren. Bei den jungen Generationen können die das nicht. Und das ist genau das, was es für mich so wichtig macht, dass man hier Mechanismen findet, die die nächste Generation schützen und da hilft uns jetzt das Bundesverfassungsgericht vielleicht durch das Klimaurteil. Wir müssen also jetzt den Klimaschutz entsprechend berücksichtigen. Aber wenn das heißt, dass wir jetzt sehr viel investieren, müssen wir uns auch überlegen, wie können wir das dann finanziell schaffen. Denn das heißt ja nicht, dass wir jetzt uns auf alle Ewigkeiten hin verschulden dürfen. Und dann geht es nochmal darum, Thema, wie stabilisieren wir unsere Rente und wie 
andere Dinge auch. Also umso wichtiger auch, dass wir so investieren, dass wir auch wirklich uns das alles leisten können. Und diesen Generationenvertrag an der Stelle vor Augen zu haben, das ist für mich ein ganz wichtiger Aspekt dieser ganzen Diskussion auch der Schuldenbremse. Ja, vielen herzlichen Dank. Das war eine faszinierende Diskussion mit unheimlich vielen Facetten. Ganz herzlichen Dank, Philippa, Herr Hüter, Jens Südekom ist nicht mehr da, Frau Schnitzer und Charlene Vallée auch für die ähm, nochmal ganz andere Perspektive. Ähm, ich habe viel gelernt. Dankeschön und noch einen schönen Nachmittag. Thanks a lot, um, Nicola, for um, chairing, moderating this uh, session. Uh, really very inspiring. And I would like to thank uh, especially Shaheen to having challenged this uh, German uh, pragmatic uh, consensus because I would say um, it's, it, I mean, it's always two, two ways. I mean, if we don't discuss about further steps, politicians will struggle to, to go this way. So if maybe it's part of the discussion that we need uh, to also go beyond, not, not be too pragmatic, because otherwise it will be difficult for politicians to, to uh, think about um, new things. And as if we look, uh, we had this discussion a little earlier on the dynamic of the, of the discussion in Germany on fiscal policy. I mean, having the FDP uh, suddenly promoting tax cuts like in Reaganomics old style. Uh, this was the party re very recently uh, that want, uh, wanted to forbid any in-depth uh, debt for, for uh, public um, policies. So I think, and uh, Armin Laschet uh, talking about um, this funds and, and so on, I think we are in approaching an election, but still in a, in a, par a paradigmatic change. And that's what we're talking about new paradigms and I think we should continue that way and challenge whatever uh, is um, on the table. Um, thanks a lot uh, again to, to all of you. We will take 10 minutes now uh, break, uh, take a coffee, take a breath, whatever, and we'll come back and we'll be very near all this, but then on the European level uh, with an exciting session, certainly exciting session about proposals, how to reform European fiscal rules. And I'm happy to have the next session then. Thank you.
Uh, hello, uh, back again uh, for our not yet last session, um, but uh, a very important one. Um, as mentioned on now the European dimension, talking about fiscal policy and fiscal rules and uh, reforms. And to start, uh, and we wanted to have a, a, a better idea of the, the basic uh, things, so some, the situation uh, in, in a way, and what is the fiscal position of uh, different countries? What are the deficits uh, actually, which hopefully will allow us to better seize the need for reforms or the need for to finance. So I asked um, Sebastian Dolin from EMK, director of EMK in, in Düsseldorf, uh, to give us a short overview of some uh, work he has done on the state of public deficits and, um, and debt in, in the main Euro countries and give us some ideas of the scenarios we are looking forward to um, in case uh, the current rules are set in place again, what would the different countries uh, need to do in austerity terms as I said, to have a better basis for uh, uh, discussion and afterwards about the fiscal rules. Please, Sebastian. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here today. It's the first time for months that I speak in person at an event. And uh, well, it feels a bit strange, but it's also great to, to be in such a setting again. Um, this is a very important topic. What I'm going to present you today is uh, joint work with Christoph Pitz and Sebastian Batzka. And um, well, we have uh, made some simulations uh, and I'm going to present you the results from that. Let me just start and uh, talk about the challenges which um, Eurozone countries are facing. And I brought you some data with the current deficits of um, France, uh, Spain and Italy. And what you see on the right hand side are these deficits after the COVID or in the COVID-19 crisis, because we are still in that crisis. And um, for, for many countries in the Eurozone, um, and, and you see that here for, for the three uh, large countries I just mentioned, the deficits now are bigger than they were in 2008, 2009 at the advent of, of, of the Euro crisis. And uh, what you also see is that uh, these actual values are far away from um, the targets uh, you see there, we have um, more than 10% deficit in, in Italy this year, probably in Spain last year. France is a little bit below 10% of GDP, and, and these are huge deficits. Um, I'll come to the second uh, factor, the, the debt to GDP ratio later, which is limited in the Maastricht Treaty um, to, to 60%. So you see already that there is uh, adjustment uh, or need for adjustment here. And what, what many fear is that this adjustment will recreate what we have seen after the crisis of 2008, 2009 into the Euro crisis, namely that austerity uh, will actually um, dampen economic growth and lead to permanent scars in the economy. Um, well, now, what is going to happen? And that is not as simple as it sounds. Of course, we have the Stability and Growth Pact, and that has some very simple rules. It says, well, if you are away from your medium-term uh, budget objective, which is 0.5% for, for most countries in structural terms, um, or if you have a debt to GDP ratio of more than 60%, you need to adjust that by 120s per of, of the difference per year. Um, but then how these rules are exactly applied, this is uh, further detailed in the so-called Vademecum. And if you have learned Latin, you know that usually Vademecum means a very small book, which you can keep handy, a guide where you can always look into. Um, but these Vademecums are not very handy anymore. If you look to the right hand side, these are uh, two pictures from last, the last two editions. One is a bit more than 200 pages and the other is a little bit more than 100 pages. And actually it's not, not always easy to, to understand what is meant by, by these rules. And I, I already see Mr. Westphal there um, in the ministry. I'm not sure how many of those uh, know exactly what, what is meant in those uh, hundreds of pages. Um, well, here are the debt to GDP ratios and uh, what you see here is that maybe the adjustment to the medium term budget objective might be the smaller problem. Um, well, there, there's usually the rule, you should make an effort, you should reduce by at least 0.5% of GDP per year. Um, 
this is already quite significant, but what might be more of a problem is actually the 120s rule. Because for Italy, for example, if you look at it, um, the, the debt to GDP ratio is now 160%. And that means you have a difference of 100 percentage points to the 60 percent target. That means a reduction of five percentage points per year. Of course, now you have a little bit of, of growth of inflation. So that, that isn't really, you don't need to pay down your debt by that amount, but still it's uh, an incredible amount of um, austerity which you need for that. Now, um, simulating this is a bit complicated because we have a number of conceptual problems at the moment. We have in these deficits a number of one-off payments, which are, well, which just go, will go away by themselves and which will not be contractionary if they go away. I mean, if your restaurants and hotels are closed and you compensate them for that, and next year they open again and you don't compensate that, then, then of course your budget shrinks, your, your deficit shrinks, but it's not necessarily contractionary. Um, in addition, we have large uncertainties about the deficits in 2021. Um, already, if you look, it, at the German budget last year, what the projection was, what the outcome was, um, and, and there, there might be a lot of leeway in there, which will not be spent and not be borrowed. Then if you take a macroeconomic model, and we use NIGEM here from the National Institute, there's already austerity in the baseline. So we need to know what we add to that baseline. And what we have done here and what I'm going to present you is we have taken the NIGEM baseline, which already goes to a path which is sustainable, in a way that the debt to GDP ratio shrinks, but not maybe as much as uh, set in, in the fiscal rules. And we have made sure that the 120 rule is met according to the formulas we have found in the Vademecum. Um, we have limited the consolidation to 0.75% of GDP until this path is met. And we have set at least 0.5% of GDP uh, if the deficit is larger than the medium term budget objective. And then we have taken whatever is necessary there as additional consolidation and have put half of that into cuts in public consumption and half into cuts in public investment. And then we have run all this through the um, simulation. When I'm going to present that now to you, usually you see a baseline and uh, your simulation in a graph. I'm also going to show you that, but you need to keep in mind that our simulation is only the additional austerity, which is not yet in the NIGEM baseline. So you rather should look at how, how the, the overall path is and whether this is a useful outcome or whether not. Let me first start with the results for Italy. On the left-hand side, you see Italy's GDP and um, this small dotted line is the base. The uh, purple line is uh, the GDP with our simulation. And uh, what, what really is stark in this outcome is that um, well, the pre-crisis GDP level is only reached by the end of 2023, but which is worse if you implement that kind of austerity, the 2007 level of GDP is only uh, reached in 2027. So basically this country after COVID and after the decade before that, the Euro crisis will have two lost decades. And we know from Latin America that usually already one decade, one lost decade can be enough for political turmoil. And uh, I mean, we have seen problems in the Italian political system. So that is something I would be very worried about. What I'm also worried about is that uh, the effect is permanent. So in 2030, GDP is about 0.75% below the baseline. And I haven't shown that here because the uncertainty becomes larger if, if time progresses. But if you go to 2040 or 2045, we still have a, a significant negative effect from this austerity in the 2020s, which we are simulated here. At the same time, um, the benefits are quite limited. On the right-hand side, you see the debt to GDP ratio of Italy. Um, first, what, what the path would be without this additional um, uh, austerity, and then some the, the, the austerity we have simulated. And you see that debt to GDP is falling, um, but well, it's by 2000, uh, 2030, it's just reaching roughly 130% of GDP. And uh, the, the difference between the austerity and additional austerity and non additional austerity scenarios, this is just marginal. Um, two results from France. And Spain, what you see here is a uh, story is not quite as stark as in Italy, uh, but in France, uh, pre-crisis GDP will only be reached in 2022. 
And uh, again, even at the end of the stimulation period, the, there's a permanent negative effect, but which is probably worse is that if you, we haven't put that into the graph, but if you follow this line prior to the crisis and you prolong this trend, you will see that basically we will remain permanently below the trend. Um, and well, of course, this is only a simulation. This is an IGEM baseline with some additional um, uh, uh, austerity, but that is a pretty bad outcome if we, we now have that kind of permanent effect of the COVID crisis combined with the austerity to come. Spain looks a little bit worse. Um, Spain has this, uh, we reached the pre-crisis level in 2023. And uh, again, GDP remains significantly below pre-crisis trends. And you see here, uh, the difference here is larger and uh, growth flattens out um, in the future. So the point is, uh, is this really a decent policy approach? And maybe this is without alternatives, but if we look at the United States and um, the NIGEM baseline now has at least the stimulus package from early in this year in it, uh, we see that a different policy approach is possible. Remember, there were some stimulus packages last year passed, and there was a big stimulus package of around two trillion passed early this year. In this projection, there's not yet the infrastructure package because it hasn't been passed yet. There's just a stimulus package, but still, the stimulus package here is enough to lead uh, to a situation in which the pre-crisis GDP is reached later this year, and uh, we uh, return to to trend. Yeah, there's no permanent scar, at least not in the simulation. Um, well, there's a new paper out from uh, Olivier Blanchard and Jean Pisani Ferry, uh, and they argue, even though they think the stimulus in the US might be a bit too large, they say this is basically the right approach because by getting back to the, the pre crisis path very quickly, you prevent hysteresis effects and permanent scars in potential output. And maybe we should also think in, in the Eurozone whether we need a fundamentally different approach to fiscal policy in order to prevent the path which I have shown. So, um, to conclude, the EU fiscal rules put a significant consolidation burden on major euro area public budgets. The GP might remain below the pre crisis trend. And there's a danger of a negative feedback from these underutilized capacities to lower GDP potential in the future. And uh, at least in my eyes, uh, policy should try, fiscal policy should try to prevent that. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, for this uh, excellent introduction into what we're talking about. Um, I would just ask if there's any direct question you can could ask directly from the from the panel or and in the chat. But uh, Sebastian will anyway stay with us and will be able to answer questions um, in the course of the discussion if there are any. Otherwise, I would uh, hand over directly to Martin Sandbu, who has accepted uh, to moderate and chair the session from the Financial Times. Um, happy to have you, and I hand over to you. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, I really wish I could be with you in in Berlin. Uh, it would have been legal to travel now, but not without quarantine going back. So I'm glad the technology allows us to meet in in this way. It's nice to see uh, some colleagues and friends and some new faces, even though it's over a, a computer. But hopefully, here's to hoping that soon enough we can all meet in person again. Um, I'm very pleased to to chair this session because it's, of course, a, a hugely important uh, topic, what to do about the fiscal rules in the Eurozone. And uh, Sebastian's introduction was, was perfect, I think, uh, because it points out really what is at stake and how big the numbers are in terms of the economic effects, potentially of different fiscal policies and therefore what sort of uh, policies the rules encourage or, or require. Um, the rules at the moment are suspended, as we know, uh, because of the pandemic and they will be suspended into next year, uh, but that makes it politically all the more important to try to get to some understanding or ideally consensus of what rules we go back to or go into when we go back, because it seems it would it would seem strange to go back to rules that were already recognized as not working very well. Um, so this is what I want to just say by way of introduction, 
that changes were already underway, or at least the need for change was widely recognized uh, even before the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic changes everything. It seems to seems to seems to me that everything is being rethought at the moment. Uh, including fiscal policy. Uh, but we know that there was already uh, a sort of uh, <laughs> ambivalent desire to change the rules. Uh, everyone agrees that the rules weren't fit for purpose anymore, or at least not working. Nobody agrees on what they should be instead. There are proposals on the table. The European Fiscal Board has, has gone towards at least establishing some principles. They recommend that fiscal rules should, uh, uh, should follow. But it's all to play for, uh, and that's why the idea is being presented now, as we heard in the previous panel too, that sort of what, what Thomas said to uh, uh, round off the previous panel, the kind of ideas that are actually being put on the table now will help the decision makers uh, to try to get to some sort of uh, consensus. Probably towards the end of this year, this will have to be addressed uh, in the Eurogroup and eventually among among the, the leaders, heads of state and government. So I'm very, very pleased that this session uh, we will have uh, Philippe Martin and, uh, and Xavier Rago present uh, their recent paper. I understand Jean Pisani Ferry is also in the virtual audience. Uh, he is a co author. Um, I don't know who of the two will present or if they'll present jointly, but I have seen Philippe on the call already. Uh, Philippe Martin is, uh, is uh, the chair of the French Council of Economic Advisors. Xavier Rago is uh, president of the French Economic Observatory. Um, it's obviously a high powered proposal. I look forward to hearing them present it, but I think it's particularly important because we know that the French government has its, its ambition to try to, to nail this during its presidency uh, in the first half of next year. Although we don't know yet what the French policy on what the changes should be is. I don't know if there is a formulated policy yet, and I can only imagine uh, that what we're about to hear will at the very least inform the political decision about what to pursue. So it's doubly important intellectually in itself and politically because it will matter in France and in the Eurozone. Uh, just before I hand over to whether it's Philippe or Xavier, I'll have to be told. But we have a stellar panel to uh, to discuss. Uh, we have uh, Guntram Wolf, who everyone knows, the director of Bruegel in Brussels. We have Anna Maria Simonazzi, professor of economics at uh, Sapienza. And we have Thomas Westphal from the uh, Federal Minister of Finance, head of the Europe section there. Uh, we were meant to have Margit Schatzenstaller, who I think has not been able to join us, but do correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, we will miss her, but if uh, if that changes, let me know. Um, I will ask uh, Philippe and or Xavier to present uh, their paper, and I will then ask each of the panelists to uh, to respond with their initial uh, reactions, thoughts, comments in the order that they appear in the program, and then try to have a bit of an interactive discussion and ideally take as many questions as we can from those who are watching. So feel free to put questions into the chat while you're here, I will sort of monitor them and we will see, I'll give people a choice whether they want to ask their question themselves or I, depending on time, I may group some questions together and ask them. Uh, but for now, let me hand over to uh, Philippe uh, Xavier, who is there and who will want to actually do the presentation? I, I, hi, Martin, I will do the hi, Philippe. presentation. Thanks. Very good. Philippe, over to you. Thanks for the introduction and, and the invitation. And indeed, uh, Jean and Xavier are part of the audience, so they, they will respond to, 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 to the question. So you may have seen that actually this morning, VoxEU published a, a summary of our proposal, uh, and it's part of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, VoxEU debate on your uh, area reform. And indeed, as, as you said, and the introduction and the past presentation was uh, excellent because indeed, this is, I think, the right time to have uh, an intellectual but uh, policy-oriented debate on, on, on what we need to do on, on, on these uh, uh, fiscal reforms. And as I am not shy on publicity, let me also put the English version of, uh, in, the, in the chat uh, um, of, uh, of the proposals, uh, the longer version that uh, we've published also, it's in French and in English. The, the one I just sent is the English one. Uh, so what we've tried to do with uh, Jean and, and, and Xavier is indeed doing uh, going 
back to, uh, to, to, in some sense, what the fiscal rules should do, uh, the basics of what fiscal rules should do, but also uh, taking seriously the institutional framework uh, that, uh, that needs to be consistent with, uh, with this, uh, these proposals. Uh, indeed, as you said, Martin, there are many proposals. And in some sense, I would not say that there's a consensus, but clearly, uh, and you'll see, we put a lot of focus on the issue of debt sustainability. And, and this has been indeed part of the proposals of the EFB. This has been also part of the proposal of, for example, of Blanchard, Leandro, and Zettelmeyer to, to really put the focus on, on the issue of debt sustainability. Uh, where we part from uh, uh, Blanchard et al. is that, uh, as you know, they, they focus on, on standards, uh, which in some sense we think are a bit too far from, uh, from the existing framework. So uh, we, we, we tend to think that we're trying to be a bit more uh, realistic, maybe in terms of the proposed institutional uh, framework. So in the presentation, presentation I'm going to, uh, to focus on the fiscal rules. There are also things that uh, we, we make some proposals uh, also on um, on uh, on the demand spillovers, but I, I'm not going to have time to, uh, to to talk about this. So let me share with you my slides. Can you see them? Yeah, we can see them. Good. Okay. So indeed, the the the, the two objectives that we we put at the core of our proposals is the debt sustainability. And that's the, the reason is that indeed, this is the negative externality that is at the core of, uh, uh, of what's happening when one country has a public debt that is too large because it generates some risks for the stability, uh, both on the financial and monetary dimension on the whole of the union when there's a risk on insolvency. And, and as we know, and we've seen uh, during the crisis, this is also very much correlated to the risk of a potential exit of a member state in terms of, and, and, and this generates a lot of negative spillovers in terms of contagion, et cetera, et cetera. The second uh, objective, uh, but which I won't talk uh, in the main presentation, but we can come back to it uh, in the discussion is the demand externality uh, and the fact that indeed we know that fiscal policies in one country can have spillovers effects on, on other trade partners. But clearly the focus here on, on what I'm going to, to talk about is the debt sustainability. So indeed, and from that point of view, the, the presentation uh, uh, by, uh, by Sebastian just before was very, uh, e make my life um, uh, quite easy because indeed uh, what we're uh, uh, proposing is a debt sustainability, which, uh, uh, which uh, we, um, and we propose a, a, a debt target, which is a country specific five-year debt target. Uh, and, and the country specific dimension is important, but because as uh, 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 Sebastian was, uh, was showing, indeed, there's quite a lot of heterogeneity. And if we were to apply the rules RDR, indeed, uh, uh, this would have quite a lot of negative impact. So uh, the country specific debt sustainability is going to depend, and that's where we're going to, uh, to, to put the economic analysis on the fact that uh, there may be sustainable primary surpluses that are quite different in different countries. Italy, for example, has shown that it is able to have uh, 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 sustain, um, sustainable primary surpluses for quite long periods. This has not been the case, uh, for example, in France, uh, from that point of view. And then, uh, as we know, and debt sustainability, of course, uh, depends a lot on the R minus G difference. Uh, and again, nominal interest rates, growth rates, and inflation vary uh, with, uh, with each country. So that's from that point of view, that's the reason we go for this uh, medium term five year country specific uh, debt target and which is specific for each country. And so the way we think of it is that each government submits a debt target again five year, which is then assessed uh, at the national level by independent fiscal institutions. And if we have time, we'll, we'll discuss this because uh, this is an important institutional dimension of our recommendation, and then by the EU. And the different vulnerabilities in terms of maximum primary balance, and also in terms of the, the risk on R and G, 
generate a debt target, uh, in person, in a reduction in a debt to GDP ratio that the government commits, uh, 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 each government commits uh, uh, for this five year uh, uh, period. Um, and so here, this has to be uh, assessed uh, in terms of debt sustainability, long term debt sustainability for, for each country. Uh, then, um, uh, once you have the debt target, and I will tell you what is the institutional framework uh, that uh, generates uh, an agreement on this debt target, in some sense, it's a bit of reverse engineering. Uh, you, you will have an instrument, uh, uh, which is the nominal expenditure ceiling, uh, which uh, comes from the, 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 the analysis or the, uh, uh, the um, prediction on potential growth. Uh, and on uh, what is the net discretionary measures on, on revenue. So once you have the debt target, five-year debt target, you can generate what should be uh, the growth rate, the maximum growth rate on nominal expenditure ceiling once huh, you, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you analyze uh, what are uh, tax measures, which are permanent tax measures that could increase or decrease uh, this, uh, this, uh, this ceiling. And that's basically what is going to generate an upper bond for your annual budget loans. Um, now that means huh, that uh, clearly uh, uh, subject to the compliance of this, uh, this requirement that leaves uh, uh, um, uh, automatic, automatic uh, stabilizers uh, to, to operate fully. In this note, we didn't go into the technical detail on, on uh, why uh, this rule is, uh, is uh, uh, stabilizing. Uh, we did that in a, in a, in a form on, in a earlier note, and, and we know that be, there's been quite a lot of work showing indeed that uh, uh, not setting, uh, not having a, a, a fiscal rule which is based on, based on, on structural deficit has actually better properties in terms of, of stabilization. One point, and in fact, this was uh, an issue that was already uh, uh, this, a bit discussed, is that, uh, uh, is that in our proposals, we don't have a golden rule. So we don't have a specific uh, uh, debt, which is for investment, because or even, uh, even for green investment. Um, because basically, uh, we think that at the end, uh, we have to take into account uh, any type of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of spending, it's difficult, as we know, to, to differentiate what is uh, investment and what is not. Uh, so I think this, uh, we, we think that would not be a very good idea. However, and that will be the role in particular of uh, uh, the independent financial institution, it will be important to stress the risk that uh, indeed, uh, when you spend more uh, on, on, on current spending and not enough on investment, this can have an impact on potential growth and potential growth will have also an impact on debt sustainability. So that's the way we actually uh, 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 differentiate between uh, spending that has or does not have an impact on, on potential growth. On climate, uh, we take into account the time profile of climate investments, or actually not we, but uh, the uh, the invest the uh, the institutions, uh, the, the 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 independent uh, uh, fiscal institutions have to take into account this uh, this time profile, so as to prevent the fact that you would prevent uh, you had perpetual delay of the the, the green investments. Uh, so in some sense, we have to take that into account also in terms of sustainability. Um, we have a recommendation also on, on the, the debt ceiling in, in practice. Uh, so uh, we to, to ensure that we have consistency on uh, between the multi-year, the five-year public finance programming and the annual budget loads. Uh, here we copy and paste something that comes from Germany. Uh, so we have an adjustment account with a deficit ceiling that would be credited when spending is, is, uh, is lower than the expenditure ceiling and debited when, uh, when it exceeds it. Um, so in terms of the institutional framework, um, we, we, put, uh, um, we put a lot of focus on, on national and domestic institutions, institutions. This is something, a theme that has been quite often repeated that we need to, uh, in some sense, renationalize re a big part of the, 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 the fiscal debates. Uh, so that means uh, uh, stopping the micromanaging of national fiscal choices. Uh, which think, we think does not work and has a lot of, uh, uh, generate a lot of uh, toxicity in, uh, in the political debates. 
Um, but that means clearly, and we go into detail on, on that in the note, uh, 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 increased resources, uh, better surveillance capabilities, and, and more guarantees on the, um, on the independence on the uh, uh, independent uh, fiscal institutions at the national uh, uh, level. Um, and so that means uh, here that also, uh, we also give a stronger role uh, for the EU uh, in, uh, in, uh, in protecting uh, the, uh, the, um, the union stability. Uh, again, on, on, on the issue of debt sustainability, on excessive indebtedness, we talk also about non-cooperative policies and demand externality component, but this is not something I'll have time to, uh, to detail right now, but we can come back on that later. On the institutional framework, I'm not going to go into detail on this, uh, on this, uh, on this, uh, on this graph, but basically it starts from the government. And so this part here that gives the five-year debt target, it's submitted to uh, the national independent fiscal institutions, which has to assess and validate the debt target uh, based on the risk that I talked about. Then the European Fiscal Board has also a larger and more important uh, role in our, in our framework. Uh, because it's going to define the methodology on debt sustainability. Um, it audits uh, and, and makes sure that indeed these uh, uh, independent fiscal institutions have the, 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 the good methods and the independence that is necessary to make their job. The Commission uh, remains key, of course, in, uh, in the assessment of, uh, of, uh, of debt sustainability of, of these uh, of this, uh, rules, in particular in terms of uh, recommending to the ECOFIN uh, the five-year fiscal stance, uh, both for the area and uh, also whether to uh, approve or reject the member states' debt targets and which goes with them the expenditure rules. And then at the end, uh, it's the ECOFIN that determines uh, not only the, uh, uh, the, 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 the recommendation on the overall uh, uh, euro area fiscal stance, but whether it approves or rejects the debt targets and the, uh, the, expenditure, uh, the expenditure ceiling. In terms of enforcement, so basically uh, 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 the Council uh, remains the one that approves the debt target and the expenditure rule. Uh, there is an excessive uh, deficit procedure that is triggered by a, a, a violation of the, the country specific expenditure rule. If there is a risk of budget violating uh, the, the expenditure rule, the Commission uh, refers to it uh, to the Eurogroup. We have the adjustment accounts that I, I talked about. Uh, and again, also, we think that uh, it's important, the role uh, of uh, the uh, independent uh, fiscal institutions, but also of the Commission and the Council, uh, when they pronounce themselves on uh, the, the, the budget, uh, uh, the debt target and uh, on the, 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 the expenditure rule, there will be a legal dimension, which, uh, which we, uh, we, uh, I, uh, I talked about, but also clearly there will be financial consequences in the sense of uh, increasing the borrowing costs uh, when uh, indeed uh, uh, some, when, uh, some of these institutions, especially the, uh, the, the national fiscal institutions will say, look, uh, in this debt, this debt target is maybe not uh, uh, strong enough, is not uh, ambitious enough, and uh, this is putting at risk in some scenarios the debt sustainability of the country. Uh, this clearly may have some financial consequences. Uh, I should say also that in our framework, clearly the ECB is in charge of, uh, 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 of uh, potential self-fulfilling expectations, uh, which could be triggered uh, obviously by this type of uh, pronouncement. So, so clearly um, there is a separation of, of, of work. The ECB is in charge of self-fulfilling expectations driven crisis, but here we are talking about fundamental uh, based uh, uh, debt, uh, debt sustainability. And finally, let me end with this. Uh, uh, Martin, you, uh, you, uh, you, you alluded to the fact that indeed uh, we are now in a situation where the rules have been uh, deactivated. Uh, but we'll have to, to think about how to deactivate this special situation. So we will condition, uh, we, we recommend to condition the deactivation of uh, the general escape clause uh, on first a political agreement. So that's the reason why we should start discussing these issues quite early on, on the new European fiscal framework because indeed it, it would be very unwise to come back to the uh, ancient rules, which I think there is now a consensus uh, don't work very well. Uh, but also, uh, uh, so that's a political condition, 
but also on an economic condition, which is the effective return of the EU economy to a level of GDP per capita, which is basically the, uh, the, the pre-crisis uh, level of uh, GDP per capita. Okay, so let me end here. I have other, um, uh, we have other proposals, but I wanted to uh, focus here and concentrate on, on the fiscal, on the fiscal rules themselves and not the overall uh, fiscal framework. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippe. You need to unshare your screen. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. I have plenty of questions, but I'm not going to abuse my position as chair. So I'll, I'll pass it to uh, our panelists to give their reactions, comments. And I hope I am confident uh, we'll ask some probing questions so we can go back to you and your co-authors afterwards, Philippe, to, uh, to get some further clarifications. Uh, Gunther, I'm from Bruegel. I'll start with you. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation. And let me uh, say that, of course, I share a lot of the concerns that uh, were raised about the rules framework and some of the implications at the beginning. <clears throat> and I also do share um, the uh, concerns that um, uh, Sebastian Dulin uh, pointed out about the delayed recovery um, of some of the Eurozone countries, in particular of Italy. And actually, I did make the point uh, last week um, at the informal ECOFIN in um, Lisbon that, uh, of course, there is scope uh, for short-term additional uh, fiscal stimulus to help us um, reduce um, the gap um, and the output gap um, in the short term. But I think that is actually a question that is quite apart uh, from the fiscal rules question, because as we know, currently the fiscal rules are uh, not in place. And I think there is wide spread agreement, um, even in the ECOFIN, um, the conservative ECOFIN, that in the short term, um, there, it would be foolish um, to um, remove uh, fiscal support uh, too early or too rapidly, um, because that would indeed um, uh, be detrimental to uh, the Eurozone recovery. Um, I also do share, and um, I have to say um, the point, um, uh, the skepticism about the Blanchard Leo, Leandro uh, Zettelmeier paper, um, I, I do think uh, it has institutionally lots of problems. And by the way, I also think economically it, uh, it is un unthinkable to um, have an institution come out um, with a public pronouncement that there's a significant probability of default in a country and therefore that country uh, needs to adjust um, its fiscal path. I think that would be immediately uh, triggering self-fulfilling fiscal crisis. So I think a completely unfeasible framework. Now, um, turning to uh, to your your paper, um, uh, Philippe and colleagues. So it's very nice to see you also again. Um, uh, I, I, I do want to sort of take issue with a few points, and uh, perhaps also for the sake of debate, and sort of, in a sense, land in a very different place where, where, you, where you land. I mean, one, one important dimension, which I, I think I want to raise at the beginning is, is the question of rules versus discretion. I mean, you, you, when, I, when I read these papers, I always have the impression the authors think that there is really no discretion and everybody plays exactly by the rules and the rules are applied to 100%. Well, that hasn't been the reality of the Eurozone for many, many years. I mean, at least since the arrival of the Juncker Commission, there was lots of discretion in the application of the fiscal rules. And I'm wondering why that is not reflected in these papers. Now, one can debate whether that discretion is appropriate or not, but there definitely has been lots of discretion, both at the side of the Commission, um, as well as uh, at the side of of the council and arguably um, since the Juncker Commission, uh, fiscal policy making in the Eurozone has become much less uh, tight and much less um, focused on rapid deficit reduction um, than it was before. So in a sense, I think policymakers have changed quite a bit their behavior and have, have ad adopted their um, fiscal reaction function quite substantially. So that's my first point. My, my second point is um, on the question of centralization versus decentralization. Um, you know, you, you put a strong emphasis on the decentralization and, you know, having national uh, fiscal, uh, independent fiscal institutions um, take decisions and sort of monitor um, uh, the fiscal rules. Um, 
And, you know, I, I frankly speaking, I have doubts. I mean, I have doubts for two reasons. I mean, the one reason is, of course, um, that I, and I don't want to offend here, um, uh, Pierre Moscovici and the, uh, the French Fiscal Council. So let's talk about the German Fiscal Council. I just can't believe uh, that the German Fiscal Council would be either explicitly or implicitly, uh, wouldn't be implicitly or explicitly captured uh, by, the, by the domestic political system. So, so, so to think that um, an independent national fiscal council can do a good job in a sort of neutrally um, evaluating what's going on, it seems to me that that is an illusion. So that's, that's one criticism of the decentralization. And I have to say the other uh, criticism of the decentralization is, to my mind, that there, there, it, it is also an illusion. I mean, we live in a monetary union and in a monetary union, uh, we are bound to be uh, debating um, our fiscal policies among each other. And yes, that will be toxic. And yes, that will be difficult. But I would argue it's an unavoidable part of being in a monetary union. And to think you can get rid of it, I think, is, um, is, is really fooling yourself because we are bound by monetary policy. And that monetary policy uh, brings our fiscal policies um, through bond purchases and many, many other channels very much together. So I, I don't think you can really think uh, you can really detoxify um, the uh, sort of um, controversial debates that that happen between countries, because they are just the essence of being in a monetary union. And I, arguably, they are a step towards uh, going into, um, I would say, uh, what I would call um, a fiscal union, meaning ultimately um, a, a joint sharing and joint discussion um, of our fiscal policies with increasing joint fiscal elements, which we are um, actually implementing. So I was, I, I'm, I don't believe really in this decentralization argument um, to push the debate. Now the third, the third point is on the green investment. Um, I mean, I, I, I really think it's a mistake to leave that out of the reform. I, I really think you, you have to discuss it um, in the reform and it has to be a significant part of the reform package. Uh, why is that? Well, basically because um, the current rules um, uh, and also the interpretation of the current rules um, disincentivize um, public investments. It's politically economy, impo political economy wise impossible uh, to do an investment um, if um, you have to cut as a counterpart a social security expenditure or a pension expenditure um, uh, given if so if, if you want to maintain the same deficit so inherently the the rules bias you um, against investments and by biasing you against investments you miss out on the important green investments and if you if you think you want, we want to decarbonize our economies there will have to be investments at some stage in the next 10 years so i think this needs to be to my mind one of the center pieces of, of the reform and i, I really uh, was disappointed not to see it and that's why i'm frankly saying it um, because i do think this will be um, the uh, generational issue that that we are facing and uh, martin i don't know how much time i have but i do want to give sort of um one last, um, one last observation, um, which is, uh, is about um, next generation EU, um, which is um, the, EU, uh, uh, the EU's recovery fund, um, which I thought could also somehow be, uh, be reflected in this framework. And I think we, we only, we have to work more on, on that also. I mean, the next generation EU is actually, um, uh, quite a big deal. Um, it's quite a big deal for some countries, also money-wise. Um, and what we learn interestingly is that um, in the period 22, 23, and 24, um, it contributes to national budgets of countries like Italy between 0 0.5 and 1% of GDP. Um, and interestingly, um, in grants, and then in addition, there's loans. So for Italy, it's actually quite substantial. And interestingly, um, the grants will not count towards the, uh, the fiscal rules um, and not count towards the national deficits. At least that's the way it looks like. I mean, I, I'm sure this is controversially debated. Now, um, if you look at what that means in terms of um, the fiscal adjustments, it actually means fiscal adjustments are delayed. Uh, so, so even if you have a thought experiment that the old fiscal rules were to be strictly applied as of 22 or as of 23, 
um, you know, the next generation EU uh, would actually delay the fiscal adjustment in, in Italy and other countries by at least a year or two. Uh, now, then you have a cliff edge after that, right? When, when next generation EU stops um, paying out the money. That cliff edge actually is, is really, really big and then important. But in the year 22 or 23, whenever the rules will apply and will supposedly strictly be applied, um, there is quite a big, a big buffer for the net recipients of, uh, of next generation EU. And, and somehow that has to be I think reflected or at least factored in um, in the in the whole reform uh, reform debate. Um, so I think Martin, I don't want to take too much time, but um, thank you. You will, you will have an opportunity time. to add further thoughts afterwards. But uh, thank th th thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Guntram. Anna Maria, you're next. Anna Maria, are you there? With uh, thanking yes, for the opportunity perfect. to discuss this interesting paper, which puts forward uh, a reform of the European fiscal framework. The premise is that fiscal rules are necessary, but are inadequate in the current situation. And the author suggests to replace uniform uh, numerical criteria with an assessment of that sustainability. A second point, which I think is uh, very important, is uh, their argument that monetary unions entail two externalities. The first is the possibility of crisis of insolvency, and the other is the, let's call it deflationary bias or the demand externalities. And uh, they stress that only the former was taken into account in the Stability Pact. So I have a, a general comment and three specific points. The general comment is that this, the, the, this proposal is uh, uh, meant uh, to uh, correct uh, or leave behind the rigidity of the Maastricht criteria. Although they still remain within uh, the uh, general framework of rules, as uh, Goldfrand uh, observed, the problem is not to be within the rules or discretion. The problem is uh, which theory inspires the rules. And uh, although there have been changes in the rules, these I think have been uh, occurring far behind the necessity and were imposed by the changing conditions. I mean, they res were responding to, a to the situation coming more and more uh, dramatic. Hmm? As far as the, uh, the proposal uh, itself, I think that it is surely a progress on the current rules, but the question is, will it be enough in order to take the reality, the problems that we are, are confronting? And here I will uh, pick up three points. The first, which has been already uh, stressed by Sebastian Dolien, the, his analysis of uh, what are the trends in GDP growth if the current situation remains has to do with the fact that the COVID-19 crisis has not just increased public debts, but uh, has further polar polarized the, the distribution. We have now seven member states that have debts over 110% of GDP. And these countries will be constrained in pursuing growth. Consolidation, as far as the experience of Italy can tell, will not reverse the debt accumulation following the pandemic. It is true that we had several decades of primary surpluses, but we also had several decades of very, very low growth. The debt sustainability may depend uh, to a large extent on the continuation of an extremely lax monetary policy. So the European Central Bank currently holds a large share of these debts, but it will need to unwind them when monetary policy consideration warranted. Whenever that process begins, it may cause turbulence in Eurozone financial markets, and that in turn would increase the cost of rolling over public debt. 
raising the specter of its systemic instability in the banking sector. Thus, low interest payments, though likely to remain low for a while, may provide a misguiding reassurance. Long-term risks may actually have increased, and if unaddressed, any future reform of review or review of the EU fiscal rules aimed at making the pace of fiscal consolidation politically more feasible will buy time, but not solve the underlying problem of sustainability. Quite a few member states will remain vulnerable to future shocks. So I think that finding a way to manage the mountain of Eurozone debt, which has been accumulated during the pandemic, is necessary to stabilize growth expectations and create a favorable environment for private sector investment. The second point relates to the uh, issue of debt sustainability itself. The authors correctly note that the main variables entering in the determination of fiscal sustainability, the share of interest payments in GDP, the rate of growth of income, and the share of the primary balance are not independent from one another. Moreover, the estimates are also highly uncertain. But there is a, a third point, which is, according to me, even more serious. These variables may be out of the control of the government. In fact, it is not possible to assess the, the debt sustainability of a country in isolation, neglecting the spillover effects deriving from the interdependencies that bind the various countries to one another. While pointing out the existence of these externalities and specifically the demand externalities, the authors, however, neglect or underrate their role when estimating that sustainability. For instance, as it has been already mentioned, if Germany is serious on its plan to return to compliance with the debt break by 2023-2024, this will have serious consequences across the European Union. If the rate of growth of GDP and uh, the interest rate are to a greater or lesser extent beyond the control of a country, a heavy burden will be shifted upon the primary balance with the severe consequences already experienced in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, as well as during the whole history of the European Union. The authors are aware of this problem. In fact, they observe that, and I quote, it is difficult to design a system of rules that simultaneously responds to the two, to the two potentially contradictory imperatives of ensuring sustainability and supporting demand. In the absence of, the, of an additional instrument, such as central budget, the only possibility is to define a exactly how to respond to trade-offs between them. A possible option is to focus on the insolvency imperative and to disregard the demand externality. As in Blanchard and, and uh, other authors, 2021. Well, this is the same option that has been chosen in the Stability Pact with effects, as the authors point out, that are likely to be counterproductive, an understatement, according to me. Huh? So, and uh, also to entrust the Commission with the responsibility for the management of the demand externalities, as the authors suggest, doesn't sound very reassuring. The German excessive surpluses have continued undisturbed over the years, despite the recommendation of the Commission. So, as for the third and, and last point, which relates to risk sharing. Uh, solidarity, as Robertson mentioned in a paper in 1953, is a scarce and very perishable good. 
Fiscal sustainability can only be achieved if countries are put in the condition of being self-sufficient. But uh, vices and virtues are not all on, this, on one side. Creditor countries have gained significantly benef significant benefits from the European Monetary Union, and debtor countries have also suffered costs, but all lose from the system imploding. In the past, this prospect succeeded in mobilizing counteractive forces strong enough to stall disintegration, but not to set the union on a longer term sustainability path. Uh, I think that the, the discussion on the stability path is actually distracting the uh, attention from, from the most challenging uh, threats that are facing the European Union. The world economy is undergoing a structural change of proportion comparable to that experienced in the 70s. Forecasts show the European Union under, underperforming economically relative to the United States and China. And Southern European countries have been particularly strongly affected. The accelerated pace of technical change poses a serious threat to the entire European Union, and in particular to its weaker members. To fill the gap with the US and China, the EU must grow, but, but must grow economically, meaning in size, and technologically. And this would call for massive investments and a new, more cohesive industrial policy which is necessary to prevent the digital transformation from becoming an additional factor of polarization. And this requires the concerted action of all its members, which will come about only within a different theoretical and political approach. So welcome the rules, but uh, welcome also a different approach, a theoretical approach. And as Kofra was uh, mentioning we need to, to pay more attention to the size of the investment and less on the problem of stability. So what this crisis has shown, and I finished, is the existence of a, a sort of a fallacy of composition. The sustainability of a common debt is higher than the sum of the member countries' debts, as shown by the EU uh, recovery Resilience uh, Fund, which could represent the first step in this direction. How policymakers spend resources and the quality of public finances are, of course, of central importance to close the gap between core and periphery. But they must be placed in a context that pursues solvency through growth rather than through market discipline or fiscal rules. Without growth, a sustainability rule may not solve and even worsen the divergence between creditor and debtor countries. That's, thank you. Anna Maria, thank you so much. Some, some great questions there that we'll look forward to hearing Philippe uh, address. But first, uh, Thomas, we'd like to hear your comments, reactions and questions. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin, and thank you uh, for uh, the presentations and the discussion so far. I think this is a very timely uh, raising of the issue, and therefore I also thank the, the forum for raising the whole issue uh, uh, today. Um, hope, I, I very much hope that in the near future we will all meet around one table and look each other physically in the eye. I think that that's definitely what we're all missing. Now, let me give some reactions to, to what we've heard. Uh, one one point um, to what uh, Sebastian Dulin uh, has has said, uh, and the couple of figures he showed. I mean, only picking up one thing, you you showed the the development of the the debt to GDP ratio uh, over just uh, a couple of countries. Uh, one could also speak of some other countries, but be it. Uh, the one thing, and this has always loomed, uh, I think, also in the other interventions, is 
And, and let's name the one country. I mean, Italy, after the, the great financial crisis, has had a decade of uh, no growth. They've entered, the country has entered the pandemic crisis with a GDP, uh, so with a, a wealth level, which was below what the country had uh, before the financial crisis. So um, I'm saying this because from my analysis, this points not to a, a, uh, a quantitative question of fiscal support. This points to structural issues. And I think this is uh, uh, next to the or very close to the fiscal rule discussion, the, the one discussion we need to have. And Guntram pointed to the relevance of the next generation EU and the uh, resilience and recovery facility effort, uh, which has been uh, brought together last year. And this is, of course, not only to give fiscal space, I agree fully with what Guntram said, it is basically there to allow uh, the member states after the pandemic to come out of this crisis with a better growth perspective, with a better growth potential. And if we do not realize this, uh, we will have to be, we will have to discuss fiscal policy in a, in a very different way. If we achieve it, we can also uh, probably discuss fiscal policy in a different way. Now, uh, on these rules, I, I think there is an agreement. I mean, really, there is a, an agreement that the rules are too complex that they are too difficult to enforce. And I think there's also agreement that they've only been partially applied in the past. So something needs to be done about these rules. There's absolute agreement in the ECOFIN, in the academic world, in the Eurogroup, wherever. Um, we had a couple of rounds in the ECOFIN and in the Eurogroup uh, under a couple of presidencies in, in the last years. And I can tell you there's absolutely no consensus emerging. Now, this shouldn't stop us from discussing this uh, uh, intellectually and, uh, and even politically, but we need to keep that in mind. So I have, uh, I want to make five points because I've studied with great interest the proposal, but um, the, uh, now having heard the presentation, I'm down to four points because one point hasn't been mentioned from the paper. So I, that makes my intervention even in, in shorter. So the first one talks about politi political economy. I have, I have the question, would we have the same discussion on these rules if we all were at, let's say, more or less a debt to GDP level of 60% today? We, we could still discuss whether we wanted these very complicated rules, et cetera. I think the discussion would be different. I think the discussion would even be different if we were all around or very close to the today's average of the debt to GDP level, which is 100%. Even in that situation, I think the discussion would be different. Now, we're having the discussion in a political situation where we have an average GDP, debt to GDP ratio of 100%, but then we have significant outliers, right? And in both directions, by the way. Uh, and, and this is what makes um, the discussion extremely difficult because, you know, you hear people proposing alternatives or changes to the rules. If you close your eyes, at least in the ECOFIN, I'm pretty sure you can say from which country this person is coming from. Because every minister is arguing uh, against his, his own or her own uh, debt to GDP uh, situation. So this is, of course, not really helpful for an open uh, intellectual discussion, but this is the context we're in. So we have to take that into account. Uh, I, I, yeah, okay, that's my first point. My second point is on credibility. Now, replacing horizontal rules for fiscal policy in a monetary union, and I think I'm pretty close to what Guntram uh, said, even uh, when he said this is maybe and a necessary discussion on our way to something deeper, uh, which some people call the fiscal union. But replacing these horizontal rules by nationally defined rules, by nationally defined limits to debt sustainability, and by shifting the burden of measuring whether the policy targets have been achieved or not to basically to national uh, uh, institutions where I also would share the, the doubts whether this, this, is, this is possible. I mean, I just read the, uh, what, what, what the French fiscal board 
uh, uh, rights on, on the fiscal policy of the government, but I see no connection or reflection in what the government does. I mean, so they both exist and well. Um, so I, I have my doubt here. Um, then these nationally defined limits to debt sustainability and the nationally set targets for a five year deficit and therefore expenditure uh, limit uh, policy with a five year uh, uh, you know, um, account possibility to over or underperform and always be able to say, we we'll wake up to this next year or in two years or in three years, I think would make it extremely difficult to measure the success of the policy. So is the policy which will be announced by such a, a national government, is that one fulfilled or, or not? I, I don't think we have, we have a, a, a sufficient elements to, to measure this. Then my third point is on the role of the ECB. What I, I understand, but maybe I'm wrong here, is that, that, uh, that you, uh, Philippe, said um, uh, that you permanently will charge the ECB uh, of taking out the spreads. And this means, in my reading, that the ECB will be there forever, which uh, with a large uh, a portion of buying government bonds just to take out these spreads. And um, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure that this is, I mean, once we're at changing the rules, why not changing the mandate of the ECB also? But I, I'm not sure that, that all this is, is, is feasible for the time being. Uh, then I, I jump to my fifth point, which is, um, uh, it, will this be a simple rule, what you propose? And I, I have my doubts because if, if the moment you look into how to establish a five-year deficit and expenditure rule path uh, with consequences on the debt sustainability and all of that, you are obviously back to the old ingredients called output gap, uh, estimate for tax receipts in the future under certain conditions, estimates which you would have to put in for changes of tax policies, how much does this cost? How much does this bring in outer years? All these uh, are exactly the ingredients which over the years with this current pact led to the incredibly complex, incredible high complexity of the rules because we tried to adapt the rules every time we came across uh, something uh, which was making it more, more difficult. Um, so by, by, by summing up, I, and I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm coming from this ministerial point of view. Uh, I, I'm not an academic. I think um, I, would, I would caution uh, to be careful with uh, shifting the rules uh, because what you, what you propose actually would mean treaty changes. I mean, you know, the 60% and the 3%, if we like it, if we know, if we would write them in again today or not, uh, uh, this is quite a hurdle for a change, right? Um, we have the intergovernmental agreement, the fiscal compact, uh, which is also can also only be changed by unanimity. Um, so that there are a number of, of, of very high legal hurdles which uh, might make it difficult to, to install these changes. And then I, I only can join uh, Guntram when he says, in the past, these rules have been, have shown flexibility which you would not find once you just read the all these you know rules and regulations, and it's quite a pile. And I, I won't claim uh, to to be able to 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 cite them all uh, instantaneously. Um, much flexibility has been found. Much flexibility has been found in 2010. I mean, you know, we we just declared that everybody breaks the three percent rule because this was was found to be appropriate. And then we, we try to define a path out of this uh, high, high deficit situation, but not for the reason that we wanted to fulfill with the rules, but we wanted to comply with the rules. We did this because we wanted to give the markets some credibility. We want to, wanted to be credible. We said, this is a Keynesian situation. I'm not talking about 2010, of course, uh, a, a complete Keynesian situation. So we will go big into deficits but then, of course, we will have to explain to our citizens how, how we will uh, roll out of this uh, high debt and high deficit situation 
uh, in the past to avoid that they would expect from the outset uh, tax, uh, tax rises. Um, so th there has been a lot of flexibility uh, in there. And of course, we are seeing uh, even more flexibility today. Um, and I, I think, uh, after all, the issues of, of a debt sustainability to be judged, after all, maybe by the markets at one point in time. A second, um, the, the room for maneuver in bad times. So having for fiscal policy a room for maneuver, if time gets worse, becomes worse, uh, another crisis appears, etc. And thirdly, something like a good rating also, at least for a couple of, let's say, larger member states, the more the better, of course. Uh, all this, I would expect, will also in the future be a condition for forceful acting. And this is what's something which I would also call resilience of the European Union or the monetary union. Do we have, out of a more or less stable situation for a decade or for a couple of years, do we have the power, do we have the possibility, do we have the credibility to act forceful if just another crisis comes around? And a crisis, by definition, of course, is not something which you can see on the horizon because it's, it's, that wouldn't be a real crisis. I mean, a real crisis is something which hits you by surprise, right? So um, I, I, I think we have to discuss the rules. I'm absolutely uh, ready and willing to do that. I, I have a little bit of hesitance to say, look, here is the, the, the large sketch and this will need uh, treaty changes and, and it would need a new consensus. And, and both things will be very difficult um, to, to achieve, I'm, I'm afraid. And I, I would also uh, um, not want to have us uh, leading a discussion which is only on quantitative economics alone. I think we need to talk substance. Uh, we need to talk about the quality of public finances. We need to talk what Guntram also alluded to, uh, the investments into, uh, into climate change policies. Uh, and we need, therefore, to talk about the growth potential. And this, the, this is a big chance that we have today with the next generation EU. So I think um, uh, these are some elements which I wanted to throw into the, into the debate. And thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, very much, uh, Thomas. Uh, Philippe, uh, the burden of proof is quite rightly on you since it's your proposal. But, but I think we've, we've had a flavor of why it's so difficult to get to political consensus uh, on this because there are so many worries out there, some of them uh, having been expressed by, by the three panelists. But, but in, in a sense, they strike me as all being a variant of the theme of your proposal doesn't really change things enough in the sense that you know, it, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't seem to secure proper fiscal behavior. It's liable to capture it doesn't encourage investment enough. Uh, and th there are sort of various things in which it doesn't seem to actually improve enough. And that's what I'm hearing on, on what we already have. Well, that, that's my sort of reading of the common theme here, but there were a lot of different uh, challenges put to you. You'll have to pick the ones you think you can answer now, uh, but go ahead. Why don't you, why don't you give, give them a stab? Okay, great. But actually, Xavier and, and Jean are here, so maybe I should give them a chance to, 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 to respond. But it's true, just not to, uh, to, to make as uh, if, uh, you know, I let my co-authors answer the hard questions. Uh, just a point on, on because uh, debt sustainability and, and, and indeed the potential growth has been mentioned by several of you. And I think this is an important point. We do not refrain from saying that indeed, that sustainability is, is very much based on, on potential growth and that, uh, you know, this is very important. Indeed, this is the economic discussion. This is the economic analysis, which is completely lacking in, in, in the fiscal rules that we have now. So indeed, this is this discussion that we need to have uh, at the national level. And here, I think it's super important to have uh, national uh, fiscal institutions uh, which indeed put uh, uh, the difference between this type of spending and this type of spending that will have very different impact 
on, on, on growth and, and, and therefore on debt sustainability. This discussion is completely lacking. So I hear a lot of criticism on, on, on some of our proposals. I think some are based on, I, I think, a bit incomplete reading on, on, on what we propose. Uh, but but um, uh, I think we all agree that the, the, the present rules do not go into the, the, the fundamentals of for example, investment, green investment, but also in terms of uh, uh, even debt sustainability. So I think that that's part of what we want to do. But anyway, let me maybe uh, Jean, I think, wanted to say something on, on green investment in particular to respond to Guntram. So I'd, I'd like both Jean and, and Xavier to, to come in. But can I just ask one follow up question to you, Philippe, on what you just said? Because because I, I was thinking about the same thing. It, it sounds like you're saying that you want a lot more of the substantive discussion of both quantity and quality to happen in between the national government, the national fiscal fiscal board or fiscal control institution and the EU. Um, I mean, let me just put an example on the table, right? So suppose a government thinks we're going to do a lot of deficit spending to scale up early childcare provision because we think, we agree with Philippa from the previous, uh, from the previous presentation, that that will increase female labor participation, that in increases potential output, and that will take care, that will keep debt sustainable. How does that sort of argument, an attempt at you know, a widening of the deficit, even with debt high, because you think that's going to happen, how does that work in your proposal? Well, the government has to- By, by dynamics in a Southern European country, right? Yeah, yeah. So the government has to convince, uh, has, has to have a convincing point that indeed this type of uh, financing will have uh, uh, an impact on potential growth. We'll have to try to quantify it because obviously, and, and this will be super difficult, uh, we fully agree on that. We'll have to have a discussion. So there will have to be a national discussion also, but also at the European level. And here I would, uh, I would part with uh, Guntram. I think you were bit going too far in saying we completely nationalize uh, this debate. We don't do that. We, we partly uh, give more weight to the national discussion, but we really, uh, in the institutional framework, we need to have these types of discussion exactly on this, but also on, 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 on expenditure, on, on taxes, etc. We still have a lot of discussion between uh, the governments at the ECOFIN, at the Commission level, at the, uh, for the European Fiscal Board. So please don't, don't caricature uh, our, our proposals. Huh? We are not saying that the whole discussion is at the national level. The externality is clearly European. And therefore, we have to have this discussion also at the European level. We have to have surveillance at the European level. Can I ask uh, Jean and then Xavier if he wants yeah. to uh, to come in and address, well, wh yeah. whichever of the panoply of challenges they want to pick yeah. up. Thank uh, you, Jean. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can Hi. you hear me? Yeah, we can hear and see you. Okay, good. Uh, no, there are many challenges, and that that's good. Thank you for that. Let me um, first address some political economy point, then some technical point, and then I want to focus on the green dimension. On the political economy, I mean, we're we sort of having a Lampedusa type discussion, right? I mean, there are one camp that says uh, everything must change uh, for nothing to change. So that's basically our position. Uh, we focus, as uh, Philippe just said, on the externality. We say the externality is a core of the issue that's being addressed by the fiscal rules. We want to uh, focus on that, but we, for that, we need to change the rules. And basically what Thomas is, is telling us that we can be extremely fl flexible without changing uh, anything. So everything can change in practice without changing the, 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 the rules. Um, this is a discussion about, you know, this is a political economy discussion. And frankly, I'm doubtful that uh, the system of rules as it is, without some fundamental reform, will have much legitimacy uh, in uh, imposing uh, some adjustments uh, or some discipline uh, to the member states in a situation in which public opinion has been told during two years, we spend whatever we have to spend. And, uh, you know, quoi qu'il en coûte, as we said in France, uh, as the president said. And, and that means, uh, you know, uh, having the rules coming back without knowing without public opinion, without members of parliament, without political forces knowing why uh, 
um, these rules are put in place and what exactly is externality, what, what the problems that these rules are supposed to, to solve is in my view, in my view, dangerous. Second, on, um, on decentralization, as Philippe said, uh, we, I mean, it's, it's very controlled decentralization. So it's within a certain framework and uh, it's with, uh, uh, at the, in, the, in the end, a decision by the, uh, the council on the basis of a commission recommendation. But we want sort of to base it on a much more granular assessment done, done at national level. It's an issue of ownership, if you wish. We think that there would be more ownership if the, assess if the government starts by saying, this is my target. And this target is first assessed by a national uh, uh, fiscal institution um, that, that gives an, a, a view on, on the validity of this target and the appropriateness of this target. And then it goes through you know, the, the machinery of, uh, of approval as, as it is in the treaty, because we're not, super, we're not saying we, we should change the, the treaty. Third point is on the veil of ignorance. Obviously the veil of ignorance, you know, it's always easier when there is a veil of ignorance. Uh, as regards to debt, there is no veil of ignorance. So countries are perfectly right, uh, Thomas, uh, each, each member state has a view on what the change in the rule may imply, uh, uh, knowing that what the starting, uh, what the initial situation. Um, yes, but that's, that's part of the, of the game. And I don't think we can ignore the fact that this dispersion of situation is enormous. So uniform rules precisely in a situation where you have this uh, huge dispersion of, uh, of debt situations means you have to finance the way you're implementing the rules. So you're creating a lot of you know, uh, ad hoc treatment in the, in the implementation of the rules which adds to the, the opacity of the whole system and the politicization of the whole system. Uh, quick points on, on, on some technicalities. You said this needs a treaty change. It does not require uh, technically a treaty change with ratification by uh, national parliaments or referenda, because there is an, a, a clause in Article 126 that says that the, the reference values can be changed by unanimity. So without uh, a treaty amendment uh, procedure. And I think that's quite important in view of the hurdle it may represent. Second, your point, Thomas, on the, on, the, on the ECB. We're not saying the ECB should sort of continue limit the spreads. We're saying uh, the ECB should not be in the business of limiting the spread if, if a country is in a, in a situation that uh, objectively um, uh, raises concern about uh, its, its sustainability. We're saying the, the job of the ECB is to avoid multiple equilibria, so to avoid self-fulfilling crisis. And that's what the ECB basically has been uh, doing. It has gone further in recent times. We don't think that should be permanently done. I mean, this is an exceptional situation. In normal times, the ECB should not uh, try to control the sp spreads or sort of across the board but it should uh, sort out what are the fundamental crises and what are the crises that are triggered by self-fulfilling expectations. Um, finally, on the, on the climate issue, Guntram is right. I mean, this, this, is, this is a very difficult issue. And I don't think we have the right way of thinking about it. Let me, let me say personally how I would sort of see it. Uh, assume we would know uh, how much investment needs to be done to achieve net zero. Okay, um, and assume that this investment would sort of leave potential output constant, but change the composition of the capital stock. So substitute brown investment with uh, brown capital with green capital. So basically this would be an equivalent to an international transfer because it means there would be no domestic cost, no domestic benefit but it would sort of be the contribution of the country to the uh, overall goal of reducing emission. So it's, it's an international transfer, right? So it's, it has the character of a debt. You have to pay the, this debt as part of your climate duty, right? So you have two debts to start with. You have, and, 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 and also the climate uh, debt, there's a finite, uh, a finite horizon because we want to achieve that by 2030 or 2050, whatever date you want to take, okay? So basically you have two debts. You have a debt that you have to pay by a certain date, that's the climate debt. 
and that the debt that you can roll over because it's financial debt is if your solvency is not a concern. And the question is how to you manage the, the two. So it's fairly simple in the case of a solvent, of a financially solvent country. And that's what we say, you know, you, you don't gain anything in terms of uh, financial sustainability by postponing your climate investment, because you have to do the climate investment by the, the certain day. So the fact that you're not doing it now is just an illusion. And so this should be factored in. And that's what we say. The difficult question to which we're not providing an answer is sort of why, what, what happens for a sort of borderline insolvent country. And here the question is on which debt will you be taking the risk of default and how you manage the two risks of default. And that's the question we, we're not solving in our proposal. But that's a hard question to solve. Thank you. Jean, on the last point, can you just explain how this works operationally? So the, uh, the domestic uh, financial, the, the, the fiscal board, sorry, it will say, look, you can't cut this investment spending, this green investment spending, and think that that improves your numbers because we'll adjust for it because we know then you just have to do it 10 years down just, the line it, anyway. It's just a bit like the recent it, German uh, Supreme Court ruling. No, it, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's in the spirit of the German uh, court, um, constitutional court ruling. So if, if country comes and say, okay, I'm perfectly, you know, I'm doing my, 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 my homework as regards the fiscal adjustment, but doesn't do its homework as regards the, the, the climate investment, basically you will, you will tell this country, this is, this is a fake. I mean, this is not, this is not uh, in, in compliant with the climate adjustment, uh, climate commitment, and therefore it's not sustainable because that means you will have to do the investment later on or default on your commitment. Uh, so yeah, that really helps the next, understand the next it. Five years, okay? In the next, if you don't do anything in the next five years, this means you, you will have to do a lot later. And therefore, you're not improving your sustainability. So then, of course, in assessing your proposal, we come back to this question of how independent we believe that these institutions will be. Xavier, do you want to, uh, to add anything, address some of the uh, challenges? Yes. I can't see you, but I think you're here. Oh, there you are. Yes, yes, we can see one, you. Very quickly, I don't, one, one remark. I think there's a, many interesting remarks and criticism. There's always one danger when we discuss fiscal rules, is to think that we can design fiscal rules to implement the good economic policy. And I think it's not a good idea. Fiscal rules are not done for that. They should not you know, promote bad policies, and they should be consistent with good policies. But there are some issues, uh, practical issues we are spe speaking about, such as green investment, education for child care, uh, education for, I don't know, social mobility, geographical mobility, and so on and so on, industrial policy, uh, management of uh, Italian debt, partly with partly some you know, socialization and things like that. All of that, we need political debate at a European level. It's a little bit dangerous to load fiscal rules with all these issues. Fiscal rules should care about fiscal budget, so fiscal sustainability, and the main externality we should focus on. And I think we have other European instruments for good policies. It can be country-specific recommendation, it can be a discussion at the ECOFIN, at the Council, and there's a danger, you know, to want to impose with fiscal rule, with a center, some policies to nations, uh, to uh, member states, uh, that uh, may not agree on, on the, their own uh, national political debate. And this is very dangerous from my side. So uh, from Guntram, I, I, I have the feeling that you do not trust member states into their ability to assess their national uh, fiscal trajectory. I do not buy that. What we, uh, we discuss in the, in the paper is, uh, as Philippe said, is not uh, that full decentralization. It's a hierarchy of institution to allow the concrete analysis of uh, spending, you know, education of uh, tax revenue by national financial institution with a methodology defined by the EFB with the commission validating this uh, analysis. So we are very careful in the circulation and information to let the final word to the commission, but with some decentralization of the analysis at, at the level of member state where they have the information about, you know, some, maybe some kind of hidden fiscal uh, uh, tricks that government can use. So the way I see our decentralization procedure, it's a procedure to be much more efficient 
in, uh, in an, an, a fiscal analysis of the government, uh, not only one year ahead, but five years ahead. Uh, so it's a way I think you, 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 sh you should read our decentralization procedure. It's not that we give full power to a national financial institution. It's that we use local information in assessment of the credibility of the trajectory of public debt. Second, uh, we have fiscal rules. So two ways, either we follow uh, Thomas, we say, don't waste our political time discussing that and use the discretion in the current framework. And uh, there are some flexibility and you are totally right, since you can commission, there are lots of flexibility and there's a document about the flexibility of the pact. So we have ideas about that. Do you think it will survive the debate as Jean has said? Do you think it will survive the citizen that you will explain that 60% public debt of the GDP, it's okay. And we as European, we will leave this, this framework. We do not believe in, it, but it's, we, it's not important. We use discretion. I think it will not survive politically. You, the second way you can read our paper is some institutional design to allow for a form of discretion, which is based on sound economic analysis of key issue, which is the trajectory of public debt with internalization of the cost of uh, short-run adjustment, which is demand side uh, policies to avoid austerity debate. So your second way you can read the proposal is to have a, a concrete institutional design to take seriously the possibility of discretion by member states validated by the commission to allow for discretion to be accepted politically by uh, US citizens. Otherwise, we as Europeans take a big risk of saying, okay, let's leave with this thing, the 60% rule that will apply for some case, Italy from some quarters, others not, and uh, people will understand what we are doing. I think it's, it's a political bet, and I will not fully follow this path with 100% uh, confidence. So I think it's worth using this crisis to go in the good direction, as Anna Maria said. And you are right, Anna Maria, we could go one step further, uh, introducing to the debate some debt relief for, to start on the good path of debt before we apply the rule. And indeed, this, this is a fair uh, debate. We are not putting there in the debate, we are more modest in our, strate our strategy of profiting, using this crisis to go in the good direction. If we agree that it's a good direction, let's go in this direction. If you, you think that we go even further but introducing a, a fiscal uh, tools at the European level, debt relief at the same time, uh, funds for great investment, let's do that. But at least we have something which is a good direction for fiscal coordination at the debt at the European level with this main issue, which is debt sustainability. So if we have something better, uh, we'd be very happy to support it. Thanks very much. Uh, Sebastian Julien would like to uh, to come back in. Um, he's been he's been listening and some of you have reacted to, to his presentation. So I'm going to invite him to talk before he takes the floor. Since we are approaching the end of this session, I'll just encourage anyone in the audience who wants to ask a question or send a comment to let me know in the chat. If they do, they should do that now so that we get time for it. Uh, they can either say they want to ask a question or, or just send the question to me and I can read it out. Uh, Sebastian, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I would like to add an observation on the debate. I'm sometimes baffled because uh, when we talk about reforms, it seems that even if we have a clearly deficient framework or set of rules, the bar for reforms is perfection. Yeah, so, um, and I mean, this, this is not what, what we usually do in economics. Of course, we do optimize, but then if we cannot reach first best solution, we try to get a second best solution and not a worst or second worst solution. Yeah, and uh, if, if we know that we are in a second worst world uh, and we know we, we cannot get to the first best solution, we try to at least to improve. And in a way, uh, the burden of proof here seems incredibly high for reform proposals, not just the one we, we, have, we have heard here, but, but to others. I mean, to be blunt, um, if we define the current set of rules, we would well, I would say we have a rather dysfunctional set of rules without coherent intellectual or academic foundation, uh, which work because uh, in times of need, they have the flexibility to be suspended. Yeah, and now uh, if we look, uh, if that is the status quo, improvement isn't that difficult. And one proposal for improvement we have seen today, and if you go through different dimensions, you can immediately see that what, what the colleagues have, have presented here today is, is, or at least I don't see any dimension where it's worse than the status quo, and I can see a lot of dimension where it's better. 
um, let's see, what, what is the goal of our fiscal rules? We want to guarantee fiscal sustainability. And at the same time, we want to prevent uh, procyclicality. We want to prevent um, uh, um, the threat of excessive austerity. Um, and well, maybe also we, we, we don't want to have underinvestment. And I see, if I look at that, I don't see why it's worse in preventing uh, or, or, or in, in, in keeping uh, government finance on a sustainable path than the status quo, um, even if there are some technical issues, whether there might be a, a capture of, of some institutions or not. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more optimistic here. Um, it's clearly better in preventing uh, excessive austerity. It's better in preventing procyclical uh, cuts because of, of problems with measuring the output gap. So, so it really would be an improvement on all these issues. Um, I'm not sure this is the best reform proposal we, we can have. Uh, my institute has, has put another one forward, which is similar in some parts, is different in other parts. I still see the problem of potential underinvestment here. And I agree with Guntram here that there is an incentive in the current rules, which might also be in the new rules, that there is an underinvestment of public finances. But um, I think that the goalpost to say, well, from, from where we are, we need to go to perfection or we don't change anything. Um, this is a bit odd. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sebastian. You know, I'll, that that's a challenge to, to, to everyone. So we'll see if we have time to do a very quick round at the end. I want to bring it back to, to Philippe, uh, unless he wants to pass it to one of the other authors, with just one question. And it kind of follows up on what Sebastian, some of what Sebastian said, and also something Ana Maria said. Uh, I mean, one, one goal here clearly has to be to avoid pro-cyclical consolidation the way we, we saw that was counterproductive even in terms of debt sustainability in the Eurozone crisis. Um, and you didn't, you, you left to one side your demand externality uh, issue. So, I mean, could you just say a little bit about how you deal with actually sustaining demand when it's most needed in, in your framework, both in terms of the cross-border externality and just in terms of its role in sustainability uh, domestically. I mean, we don't have much time, but if you can at least very quickly sketch uh, that other part of your proposal, because we haven't been able to talk about it. Uh, so at the national level, uh, what, uh, what we, uh, we recommend is through the spending rule, basically, the spending rule is, is, uh, is uh, what takes care of pro-cyclical pro uh, fiscal policy. Because basically, if you have a spending uh, which is set, that means that basically spending is not going to go down into a, into a recession and you'll have a budget deficit during a, during a recession and a budget surplus during a, during a boom. So that's what makes it uh, a fiscal, uh, a spending rule basically is basically very uh, 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 contracyclical more than, uh, than what we have uh, right now. And there, there's been quite a lot of work on this uh, by the IMF. Uh, we had a note, a previous uh, note uh, uh, with uh, Zvold Darvas uh, has, has done some work on that too, showing that indeed uh, at the national level, the fiscal rule is uh, less pro-cyclical than uh, what, we, what we have now. Um, now the second thing is at the at the eurozone level. Indeed, uh, uh, what we say is that if uh, you have a situation where the uh, ECB uh, cannot uh, uh, have uh, lower interest rates because we are the zero lower bond and there is a recession, then indeed uh, we need to have uh, the possibility. To, to have a fiscal stimulus like the one we had during COVID, an exceptional Eurozone-wide uh, fiscal stimulus uh, that, uh, that uh, takes care of the, the, the demand deficit at the Eurozone level. Uh, now, at the national level, uh, there's also the issue of uh, what happens if uh, one country has a, a, a fiscal policy that, uh, that is uh, too strict and generates uh, negative demand spillovers on, on the others. That's where, to be frank, I think this has always been a, 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 an issue and not, not an, a, 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 an easy one to, to deal with. Again, we, uh, we, we give here to the Commission and the Council uh, the role of, of uh, providing uh, uh, guidance on, on the fact that this country should have a more uh, a, a pro-growth uh, type of fiscal policy. 
And Thanks just... very much. Yeah, Xavier, go, go ahead quickly, it's please. Small, small detail uh, that in the proposition for this aggregate demand management, we propose to let uh, the aggregate fiscal stance be proposed not by the, the European Fiscal Board, but to give it to the Commission. It's not a small detail. The Commission will be in charge of assessing the lack of demand at the euro area level. And we'll think as well at the national budget in their uh, assessment of the national budget with the same tools that the Commission will use to, uh, to assess the aggregate fiscal stance at the European level. So this idea to, to, to give this mandate from the ECB to the Commission is a, 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 a small step for the internalization of the aggregate fiscal stance in the policy coordination of uh, national budgets. And, and just a technical question, is there no risk of a conflict between the, the aggregate of the national outcomes with your rules and the commission judgment of the aggregate fiscal stance? That's the interesting part. Is, is there the difference? There must be a second round of coordination for the two numbers, the sum of national proposal and the assessment at the European uh, level to converge. So here the room for coordination will be in the same interaction between the commission and national states. That's a part of the VID to create some friction in this two, some of the two numbers. So, so in a sense, this is again getting back to what I asked Philippe about to, to get some of the substantive discussion back into play, it sounds like. Uh, Ana Maria, I'd like to get back to you. Uh, I can't see you, but I hope you're still with us because some, that last discussion was, was very much about some of the issues you raised. So I thought maybe you want to come back and respond and see if you have been reassured. Well, let's see if you well, are there. Yes, uh, you are there. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. No, I, I think that uh, the experience has shown that uh, you have a very asymmetric uh, working of the rules. It is very much stronger if you are in a deficit of uh, the, the budget or uh, if you are in a surplus. In... So I, I don't think that the recommendation for reflation in Germany have been very, very efficient. So I think that this problem can be a very serious one. And I stress the fact that if you uh, rely on this debt sustainability of a single country without taking into account the fact that there are these spillover effects, then you are simply judging a, a a condition of the country on uh, uh, on uh, variables that it cannot control, and this can be a, a serious problem because, uh, I mean, uh, in a in a uh, economic uh, union or a monetary union, uh, these spillover effects are very very strong. I mean, it's uh, let's say if inflation now uh, takes. Uh, uh, a hit because in some countries uh, the economy is going faster than in others then you might have a restriction of the interest rates which is, we know that uh, very dangerous but also if uh, the German economy which is stronger than the Italian, the French and the southern economies uh, takes uh, a, a, a starts again and uh, it uh, is uh, driven by exports. So, I mean, there is this idea of uh, the um, countries with a fiscal space that should reflate, but they reflate uh, uh, on different comp components of demand and the spillover effects are different. For instance, now the German economy is much more integrated with the Eastern Europe than with the Southern Europe. So once again, uh, relying on uh, uh, expansion of the fisc of the those countries with the fiscal uh, stance uh, space huh, can be very dangerous. I mean, I think we need a more coordinated uh, policy of reflation, and uh, this can be green economy or can be investment in. Uh, in technology, in digitalization. I, I, I think also at last point that there has been quite a sort of uh, self, uh, uh, self uh, 
accommodation or self, no, uh, how do you say in English? Uh, I mean, the German economy has, be, has fallen behind the new technologies and the investment, the lack of investment in all these years has uh, uh, weighed very heavily on the competitiveness of Germany and all the uh, European uh, area. So I wouldn't uh, uh, underestimate the importance of uh, a reflection on the, on the European Union level. And I think that the, the German economy, the German uh, economists or industrialists are actually much more aware of this danger than perhaps the economists and the uh, politicians. But, and, and Amadia, thank you very much. And I, I realize we should have this discussion again after the next German elections, after which things may change. We are out of time, but but Thomas and Guntram, I do want to give you a chance to kind of, if you if you want to share one final thought, but very, very short, please, because we're already keeping Harold James waiting. I can be very short uh, if you want, uh, Martin. And, and thanks again for, for uh, organizing this and, and managing this discussion. I've, I've heard a lot of very interesting things, which would no, in, in a normal world would make me jump on a plane, uh, fly to Paris to discuss this more in depth with the, with the three colleagues. Uh, and I, I, I promise to do that later. Just one element. I, I haven't said that I don't want to change the rules. I have said that everybody agrees that these rules are not really good to say, to say not to say more. I'm just a little bit politically not sure where it leads us to, to quite radically uh, launch a discussion to do it this way or that way, because I just see from what I've heard in the ECOFIN and in the Eurogroup that, that people are very, very, very much apart. And there might be a, a Southern possibility to agree on something. There might also be a Northern and an, and an Eastern possibility to agree on something. But to bring all this together, I, I, I'm not sure we will, we will reach a consensus anytime soon. I don't say we shouldn't try, and I don't say this is not worth the, the issue, and I don't say that it's easy to go back to applying the rules. Well, and uh, just, just to add, Martin, I mean, and to, and to pick up on the point that Anna Maria made, um, point on the greening of the economy. I mean, the point, why, why did I emphasize also so much the importance of green investment and the fact that this needs to be uh, addressed in the reform of the rules? Well, it has to do also with the reflation argument. It will help uh, reflate um, uh, the German economy and the Eurozone economy because it will entail massive investments. And guess what? The countries. Um, uh, that you know need to do a lot of these investments. Some of those countries really have the fiscal space to do so. So the, the concern of Jean that this would create sustainability risks um, um, wouldn't apply in the case of Germany. And um, and if you if you think of of this from a political point of view, and sort of let me just make the political point. It looks as if the Green Party will will play some role in the next German government, and you know um, I think that will be the moment where, uh, you know, if we think about um, uh, what can be done realistically, it seems to me that the greening will be a big, big, big agenda, and it will be a big agenda that will will help also from a eurozone point of view. Um, and so I, th I think if we get get back down in the debate on specific technical aspects of the fiscal rules, we might miss the political momentum behind uh, sort of the reform, which in the end, I think will, will drive, um, uh, drive the investment and the, the reflation. And by the way, also achieve the one, our generational problem, namely uh, decarbonization of our economy. Thanks. Guntram, thank you very much. And thanks to, to everyone, the, uh, the, the authors, uh, the commenters and the audience, uh, I think political momentum is is the key thing to end on that Gunter mentioned, because clearly there's there's change in the air. And despite what Thomas said about the seeming impossibility of finding consensus on, on new fiscal rules, so much else seems to be changing that, you know, let's let, let's watch this space. I think in I think there's language in the treaty saying that uh, national domestic policy, economic policies have to be treated as a matter of common interest. I think we at least have done that today. Uh, but anyway, this conversation keeps going, but not now because I will hand it back uh, so that we can hear from Harold James. But I think 
Thomas, uh, Thomas Fricker, over to you to, to handle the transition here. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, excellent uh, chairing of this session, of this very interesting session, and uh, we're in the midst of a political debate. I would just uh, say that we would be glad to have another session in a couple of months and next year there will be not a German but a French election, maybe in between uh, organize another event and then discuss the German proposition um, of how to reform the fiscal rules. I understand that there is a, a consensus about the need to reform, but I think the German government is still working on it. Um, so we are happy to uh, get a proposal and to discuss that with the same authors and maybe we will finally find a, uh, a common sense on it. So um, thank you um, all for, for your participation and we are at the end of the day and we uh, have the, the honor and the pleasure to, to get some late input um, which is sort of less technical, which I would say, and much more optimistic, maybe. Uh, Harold James will give us a talk um, about uh, a new golden age of globalization that he thinks may come up after the pandemic. And that would be a great thing uh, and something we are happy to think about at the end of this day. And I would uh, perhaps immediately um, ask uh, Harold in a second, um, to start his talk and then we will have a, a small discussion on this uh, to end this day and uh, thanks again to all the participants of the fiscal panel and uh, the former ones we had a brilliant afternoon i think about all these issues thank you and see you soon yes please harold um uh, you are known I, we have been together for for some sessions already you've participated in a lot of our events and i don't need to present you much more um uh, brilliant thinker also about all these uh, paradigm shifting things that we are discussing about uh, and now you have some thoughts to share about um, this perspective of global for globalization please harold go ahead well, th th thank you so much, uh, Thomas. It's really been wonderful being with you uh, all day and uh, listening to this fascinating discussion. Um, uh, and thank you, Martin, for moderating that, that uh, great debate that we've just had. Um, so what I wanted to do was to give you something, you know, maybe a little bit different in terms of a optimistic scenario, uh, but it's also, I think, a challenging one, and it highlights many of the issues that you've been thinking about. Uh, over the course of the afternoon. Um, the, the, the ideas that I'm going to present very, very briefly um, relate to an article that I did in Foreign Affairs in the most recent issue of Foreign Affairs on globalization's uh, coming golden age. And it's thinking very much in terms of the long-term issues that you thought about already uh, this morning when you uh, started and in the early afternoon uh, when you listen to Mark Blythe and Eric Lonergan uh, thinking about the long-term uh, return on capital uh, across the world and this apparently inexorable movement uh, of interest rates downwards. Um, to some extent, uh, what I'm thinking of uh, comes from the same kind of idea of thinking about a long-term trajectory, uh, but it's also thinking about what happens to G, um, what happens to growth. And one of the key themes that you had in the afternoon uh, was thinking about what's necessary uh, to push growth, because unless you push growth, uh, you will really have the difficulties with the sustainability of debt and uh, the, the, the whole of uh, the public financial structure uh, comes into question and it gets attacked by bond markets and so on. Um, this is a... Uh, picture that's, that's taken from a nice recent pa paper by uh, Maury Opsfeld and uh, Katao uh, on globalization, global exports to GDP. And you can see that there are really two big surges of globalization um, and they're not automatic. And that's the thing that I really wanted to point to. Uh, they're not automatic. Uh, they come about 
and you know, it's not a long-term necessary trend. Uh, it comes about because of particular ruptures and particular shocks. Um, and so I wanted to look at those two globalization pushes that I think have been definitive. And I think they have similarities with the age that we're in at the moment. So uh, th there are stories of shortages and um, there are stories, if you like, of supply shocks. Um, uh, and uh, I think you know, one of the best ways of thinking about the COVID crisis is not as a demand shock. It's not a really analogous to the 2008 uh, financial crisis, but it's a supply shock. Um, so the 1840s, um, all over Europe, but also in, uh, in uh, Asia, uh, were a period of food shortages. Um, and as a result of the food shortages, uh, collapse of demand and uh, manufacturing crisis. Um, and uh, the question was how to respond uh, to those food shortages. Um, the Europeans realized quickly in discussing it that they couldn't really grow enough food themselves. They need to get food from somewhere else. Um, they need to expand their links to Eastern Europe, to the Russian empire, to North America, to South America. Uh, they need in short uh, to globalize. Um, the 1970s, um, the other globalization uh, push, and uh, it was interesting, I thought, striking in the last session that Anna Maria uh, Simonazzi um, mentioned the 1970s as a parallel. And I think many people are now looking at the 1970s and thinking what, what is similar. Uh, oil uh, shortages, spikes in other commodities, including food. Uh, what do we have today? Uh, we have a shortage, shortages in areas that are really uh, bottlenecks, uh, Chippergeddon, uh, but Chippergeddon is spreading its impact to other areas. So what briefly uh, were the reactions to this? Um, I think along three dimensions, um, a demand for the increased effectiveness of state action, uh, the, the core functions of the state after a period of profound political turbulence. The 1840s, well, it ended with the revolutions of 1848 and a remaking of government um, across Europe. Uh, the 1970s were a period of the challenge to democracy. Um, uh, the, the famous book by Jean-François Revelle on how democracies perish and um, how to make democracies more effective. They need to be, uh, they need to be uh, more appropriate. Um, new financing techniques in both cases, um, uh, really radical transformation of financing. And then, and related to both the financing and the question of the effectiveness of state action, looking uh, to foreign models for how things are handled better. And so countries are looking at each other and learning from each other. And you see that, I mean, I think particularly the poster childs of this, uh, the, the examples of this are the way in the uh, middle of the 19th century, uh, Germany and Japan learned institutionally uh, from what was going on in uh, Western Europe. And, um, it, you know, as an extension to this, um, uh, Thomas asked me uh, to think about how in particular you could draw lessons for this, for your theme for today uh, on how Germany is supposed to fit into this picture. Um, and uh, I, I have uh, four brief dimensions uh, to, to that. Um, one is, uh, you know, this was already a big theme since 2016, that uh, some people thought that Germany should have a greater responsibility for managing globalization in the wake of the defections from globalization, as it were, in the United States with the Trump election and in the UK. Uh, with the Brexit referendum, um, uh, building uh, global institutions uh, is important. Thinking of global tax rules, um, you know, th these are areas where there's a substantial amount of progress uh, being made. Um, thinking, and this is a theme that echoed right through the afternoon, thinking about the effectiveness of government spending, who can judge where it's most effectively being spent, and not thinking 
anymore in terms of aggregate demand stimulus is of aggregate demand shortfalls, uh, but thinking in particular of targeting expenditure uh, so that it's going to produce higher levels of growth in the future. And two areas I think that came out in the discussions, and I agreed with both of them, uh, were the, the story of trying to do Bidenomics in the, in the European setting, in other words, um, putting more into childcare um, and education in order to release more people into working in the workforce. And you know, this was a critical issue that was highlighted uh, by the pandemic. But I think secondly, and with a longer term consequence as well, uh, is the idea, and uh, you had this very much in the last session, but Guntram uh, Wolf put it very prominently, uh, is to um, manage the transition uh, to an environmental sustainability uh, and to uh, the use of non-carbon energies. Um, the embrace of disruptive technologies I think is much more difficult for Germany, um, maybe for Europe as a whole, but uh, particularly for Germany. And you know, there's a kind of historic path dependency there uh, that uh, Germany is very, very good uh, historically in making small incremental changes uh, to existing technologies. But there's also a need for radical new technologies. Um, and uh, in a sense, you know, a century or more of work on the internal combustion engine just needs to be thrown out of the window. Um, and you need to think of something, something completely different. Um, there's obviously a capacity uh, for doing that. There's a capacity in terms of intellectual research, uh, but what's lacking in Europe, uh, and I, 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 you know, this is obviously very much an outsider's uh, point, is uh, that you need the structures of the capital market, venture capital. You know, you've had dramatic successes. You think of the story of BioNTech, it's really wonderful, uh, but you need much more like this um, in order to really make this transition. And uh, BioNTech, I think, is a fascinating mixture of government action. Uh, there's, there's the initial investment from the Bundesforschungsministerium program, um, and then uh, capital from the existing pharmaceutical industry, um, but you need to think of ways in which that can be done. And, you know, I think some of the ventures, obviously, uh, you know, there's no need to, to, to hark on the disasters that you've had when you had uh, the, the belief that fintech was going to uh, be transformative, but then this dramatic bet that Wirecard is the right way of doing it. Uh, you, you need to think in general. Uh, of ways of getting outside the framework of the traditional financial structures in terms of producing economic growth. And then the, uh, the final point that I would make, like to make when I put this to the comparison uh, and to, to also in a way to building the bridge from today's discussion to tomorrow's discussion uh, on the central uh, uh, bank and uh, on central banking problems, um, you know, I think uh, if you look at these globalization surges from the middle of the 19th century or from the 1970s, uh, they were accompanied by a substantial measure of inflation, much more in the 1970s uh, than in the 1850s, but substantial inflation in the 1850s as well. And inflation um, is actually, in some ways, I think, uh, something that we should think more in depth about, um, because inflation is, is used as a term that masks a whole series of market signals. Um, and some of the market signals that we're seeing at the moment in terms of rising prices are things that we shouldn't actually worry about. So the rising prices for com computer chips, um, well, that's going to push for more investment. It's a signal to which the markets should respond. Um, and you will find more investment. And then in the long term, uh, you would expect the prices to come down again. So, uh, you know, price rises highlight bottlenecks. Uh, but the other one is really more serious. Um, uh, what about energy prices? Uh, shouldn't market signals really be a crucial part of signaling the transition uh, to a different energy future? And if that's the case, um, we should expect energy prices to be higher because we want them 
to affect consumers' behavior. Uh, we want to get less energy intensive consumption. Uh, in order to do that, uh, you need to, uh, you, you really need to, uh, to, to make people pay more. And uh, this, this isn't something that's undesirable. And if this is put into a CPI index and you see energy prices rising uh, very dramatically um, and you get worried about it as a result and you think that you need to break uh, economic activity and limit the uh, revival, uh, the recovery from the COVID crisis, um, th that I think is a way of making a, a big, big uh, policy mistake. Uh, so, you know, the final and I think most controversial bit of this, most difficult to respond to, um, is uh, that we really need to rethink the way in which we approach the issue of inflation and the, the measurement of CPI. And we might want to take those goods, those items of consumption, that we think of as destructive and unsustainable uh, out of a CPI, um, out of a recast CPI, in order to make uh, for a, a, an approach to the balance of monetary and fiscal policy uh, that is actually compatible and sustainable uh, with the long-term uh, goals that we're setting ourselves in this, in this moment. Well, I, I promise not to talk for all the time because we wanted to have some kind of uh, discussion. And uh, Thomas, I think uh, you're you're going to uh, manage the discussion as wonderfully and as effectively as you always do. Um, oh, th <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, the, the easy task is now that we wanted to have a discussion between the two of us, so it's uh, easy to manage. For, uh, I mean, not so complex. But if any uh, question arises uh, and there's uh, questions in, in the audience chat, uh, please feel free to uh, give us a signal to, to, to do this. Um, uh, excellent idea. The, the one you finished, I will keep in mind and we will ask, uh, ask tomorrow Isabel Schnabel uh, if that's a good idea. I think it's, it sounds like a real good idea to, um, to not count uh, the bad prices, uh, the, the price that we want to be higher. Right. Uh, because that's exactly what we have already now in Germany. I mean, the higher inflation that we have in the last couple of months uh, is partly due to the introduction of the CO2 pricing. So, and that's that would be crazy if the central bank reacts to that. And um, so in that way, uh, already something uh, very good to, and we will uh, hope to, to remember tomorrow to, talk, to ask that uh, to Isabel or, or maybe Laurence Tubiana. Um, I would really like to um, to check what uh, historical examples and you're the expert on, on that are telling us uh, all these crises. Um, I mean, there may be counter examples on the one hand and the other question that I would have is compared to the crisis that you describe in history, is the pandemic even if it sounds cynical, but is that serious enough to have such a big impact in, in, on such a thing like globalization? Yes, I mean, I, I, I think it is, it is very serious. And um, it, 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 it's fascinating actually that the first response to the uh, pandemic uh, was to think uh, that globalization is at fault and it was clear that you know at first uh, the first places that were affected by the pandemic were very very globalized places uh, so it was uh, Lombardy in, in, in Europe uh, the, the, the kind of dynamic industrial hub around uh, Milan um, uh, the west coast of the United States um, in New York um, and uh, some people in the Trump administration went around saying this, this just shows that we were right all along that globalism and globalization are, are, are dangerous. Uh, Peter Navarro uh, talked about uh, globalization as the original sin. And the thought was that you can protect yourself by cutting off all the links to, uh, to globalization um, and uh, re obviously reduce travel and do that as a long-term uh, effort, uh, but also 
reduce your dependence on foreign supplies. And uh, so th there was a lot of, and there is a lot of uh, vaccine nationalism and people think that they need to be self-sufficient. And you know, to some extent, you, know, you might just be able to do that in the United States, though I think it's actually almost impossible even there. Uh, but in European countries, even in large European countries like Germany, uh, but not to speak, you know, if you think of uh, vaccine nationalism and you know, producing all the pharmaceuticals that you need in Slovenia or Estonia, it's, it's clearly a non-starter. Um, and, uh, you know, I think when, when uh, people look at uh, how Moderna or uh, Pfizer BioNTech actually produce their vaccines, they see that they're dependent on very, very extensive supply chains and you need the planes to keep on flying all the bits and pieces uh, to, to, uh, to link up. So, you know, in that sense, uh, the, 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 the crisis uh, shows uh, you know, the necessity of global connections, but it also shows, I think, the necessity of effective government responses. And you've seen very, very divergent responses on this. So, uh, you know, I think if you, if you take uh, two examples outside um, uh, the, the, the North Atlantic framework, if you take uh, Brazil or India, um, the, the pandemic really shows a very, very harsh light on the competence of the uh, Modi government or of the Bolsonaro government, but it also uh, was, uh, I, I think, you know, very, very poorly handled in the United States last year, and uh, that played a role in the in the in the election. Uh, it, it was poorly handled in the in the UK last year. Uh, Dominic Cummings was testifying today about that in the in the House of Commons. Um, and uh, you know, you're 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 going to see a demand as a result for smart governments and governments that can respond smartly and efficiently uh, will be rewarded. Um, in, in the political aftermath of this pandemic. And being smart in this uh, does really uh, involve coordinating supply chains across countries. Uh, that's, that's an essential element of the smartness. Mm. You've been talking about building global institutions. Um, I try to imagine, I mean, I'm, if you have look at the Second World War or what happened afterwards, there was the, you know, the big uh, Bretton Woods conference, which established as one part, certainly, but as a main part, the post-war institutions on a global level. And that sort of was the start of some decades of uh, global institutions or institutionalized globalization in a way or regulated. Um, what could be something like this? I mean, imagining that there will be a, a Bretton Woods conference some at some point after the pandemic seems quite difficult to imagine. What, what would you think? I, I, I mean, w w what I would think you would uh, want to think about is exactly the combination of health measures uh, with um, sustainability measures um, with also the security issues. Um, and, you know, I think what, what was interesting in those conferences in 1944 and 1945 was that indeed there was a, a bundling of all those issues and people recognized that um, peace and political stability were impossible without economic security throughout the world. And that was impossible without political rights. And you couldn't be just peaceful or economically secure in one part of the world. And, uh, you know, that, that was one of the inspirational addresses at the, at the Bretton Woods conference when the Treasury Secretary Morgenthau uh, said that uh, peace and security are indivisible. Uh, you, you know, we can't be peaceful on our own. And you know, that clearly applies, I think, to the story of uh, the vaccines um, and uh, the health measures at the moment that we can do well in the United States or in uh, the UK or in, in, in Europe. I think you're, you're making really good progress on the vaccines, but it, it, it's not enough. It needs to be everywhere. And uh, you know, that, 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 that challenge is, is, is really a critical one and it, it, it requires uh, coordination. Mm. Um, just to, to get to, to Germany and the, the you know, outlook for, for Germany, we have had this discussion in September. Um, given that Germany has been 
probably one of certainly one of the most um, um, positively affected uh, countries um, from the last push of globalization in 1990s uh, 2000s what would you expect if that comes true and if there's a global age of globalization will germany be among the first ones again to profit from from this development well, I, I, I mean, that, that was the, 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 the issue that I was trying to think about briefly, um, because many of the industries that are going to be at the center are really quite different to the industries of the past. And so, um, you, you know, I, th I think it's, it's still a kind of open question. Um, uh, you know, can the German automobile industry, which was an enormously important part of the German economic success. Can you adjust to a, a world in which mobility is considered in very, very different ways? Um, you, you know, at the moment you see stock market valuations that put Tesla as uh, worth much more than General Motors or Volkswagen. Um, you know, obviously there are techniques uh, that are important from the old in, in industrial uh, era, but uh, you, you really need to to have an adaptation, and um, you know, I think the, the the issue of getting getting new ventures, uh, startup capital, um, uh, pioneers, um, and you, you know, I think you know, part of the story is motivating people. And uh, you know, fortunately, you you have in 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 the story of BioNTech. A kind of wonderful motivation story, and uh, you really want to ask yourself, uh, you know, shouldn't there be more versions of this? And uh, is isn't this what we need, uh, rather than um, you know just allowing the the big enterprises of the past uh, to to go on? Uh, it, it, it's it's really a very disruptive age that we're in, and uh, you know some of that disruption is 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 is, is very uncomfortable for people. Um, uh, and you know, I, I think there's a, there's a preference for many people, and you know, certainly in Germany for stability. Uh, but uh, you know, what what uh, the pandemic has done, in a way, I don't think the global financial crisis did, is to give you a kind of wake up call and say technology is more important. We need to think of new ways of communicating, and uh, we need to think of more ways of responding to that. How to manage data, and um, you know, in 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 in, in that regard. Um, you know, thinking about how data is handled, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I thought one of the crucial things is to think, you know, how other countries manage this. And, uh, you know, clearly you have a different set of priorities about the handling of data in Europe than you do in the United States or in, in Asia. And uh, you know, that's, that's one of the issues that will be up, up for grabs, I think, in the, in the future. Thanks a lot, um, Harold. Uh, that was uh, very exciting, very inspiring at the end of this uh, day to have um, you and these thoughts with us. And I think that's something we probably should pick up um, latest at our next workshop. Maybe some things will get clearer with our next election on one side, but also uh, when we see probably a little clearer what this pandemic will leave behind. Hopefully we will then uh, be over and this will be over. Uh, so we uh, will be able also again to meet in person uh, like we uh, usually did in the past. So. Thanks a lot, uh, Harold. I hope you can arrange to, to join tomorrow and maybe you can yes, I will even um, uh, join the discussion and bring in the question on uh, how to uh, pull out maybe uh, some of the prices um, that uh, aren't, should be in, in, the, in, the, in the basket uh, that the ECB is following. Um, I would like to thank everyone in, uh, was, who was uh, there today. We had excellent discussions. I'm very happy that we did and also very happy that we started to redo something with some persons in, in uh, Rio, in here and uh, others in, in, in the space. So um, very happy. I don't want to go through all the sessions. I just want to say that I think that we have done a lot of progress in understanding, better understanding the main issues around the German model. Um, and I would 
also like to to uh, raise the attention quickly also on what we already said on this last day tomorrow where we have just um once uh, two or three sessions but two quick sessions and one main session which will be the special uh, special on central banking not directly related to the german model but the germans are very important in that and the debate will be very important so we will have isabel schnabel from the ecb with a keynote on the question how far um, ecb the central banks should go in taking into account societal issues like climate but also like inequality and others um, with an excellent discussion, uh, certainly uh, with another input by Adam Tooze and another one by Moritz Schularik and chaired by Laurence Tubiala, who has already joined us today. And then there will be a quick talk uh, in the context of the Global Solutions Summit uh, between Isabel Schnabel and Laurence Tubiana around climate change and uh, central bank policies. And we have a, a quick uh, update on the eternal question if at some point Karlsruhe, the German court, will stop the ECB. I mean, there uh, uh, have been so many attempts and now we want to have a, a latest on, on that before we talk about the new, potentially new mandate for the ECB and other central banks. Thanks a lot. And I want to thank uh, also all the people who helped us here in, in the room, the ESMT, who allowed us to, to be here. Uh, under very special conditions. And I want to thank my team, Anna, Julia, David, and Sonia, who are in the room and you find uh, their names in emails and everywhere. So thanks a lot for, for this. This was a very ambitious project to do this hybrid uh, in a hybrid form. We did that for, in that way for the second time. Um, and we will probably continue in some point. I will take up, uh, pick up then tomorrow, you see the program uh, quickly, we start at uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and then what we what I just uh, mentioned, hope to see you again tomorrow and enjoy the, uh, the evening um, and see you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Hi, Harold. Thanks.